Section 1 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August 1768 to 12 July 1771. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. The Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August 1768 to 12 July 1771, by Joseph Banks. Section 1. August 1768. 1768, August 25, departed Plymouth. After having waited in this place ten days, the ship, and everything belonging to me, being all that time in perfect readiness to sail at a moment's warning, we at last got a fair wind, and this day at three o'clock in the even, weighed anchor and set sail, all in excellent health and spirits, perfectly prepared, in mind at least, to undergo with cheerfulness any fatigues or dangers that may occur in our intended voyage. 1768, August 26. Wind still fair, but very light breezes. Saw this even a shoal of those fish, which are particularly called porpoises, by the seamen. Probably the Delphinus Focina of Linnaeus, as their noses are very blunt. 1768, August 27. Wind fair and a fine breeze. Found the ship to be but a heavy sailor. Indeed, we could not expect her to be any other from her built, so are obliged to set down with this inconvenience as a necessary consequence of her form, which is much more calculated for stowage than for sailing. 1768, August 28. Little wind today, and in some water, which was taken on board to season a cask, observed a very minute sea insect which Dr. Solander described by the name of Podura marina. In the evening, very calm, with the small casting net, took several specimens of Medusa pelagica, whose different motions in swimming amused us very much. Among the appendages to this animal, we found also a new species of Oniscus. We took also another animal, quite different from any we had ever seen, as it was of an angular figure, about three inches long and one thick, with a hollow passing quite through it. On one end was a brown spot, which might be the stomach of the animal. Four of these, the whole number that we took, adhered together when taken by their sides, so that at first we imagined them to be one animal. But upon being put into a glass of water, they very soon separated and swam briskly about the water. 1768, August 29. Wind Fowl. Morning employed in finishing the drawings of the animals taken yesterday, till the ship got so much motion that Mr. Parkinson could not set to his pencil. In the evening, wind still fresher, so much as to make the night very uncomfortable. 1768, August 30. Wind still foul, ship in violent motion, but towards evening much more quiet. Now for the first time my seasickness left me, and I was sufficiently well to write. 1768, August 31. Wind freshened again this morn. Observed about the ship, several of the birds called by the seamen Mother Carey's chickens, Procellaria pelagica, Lynn, which were thought by them to be a sure presage of a storm, as indeed it proved, for before night it blew so hard as to bring us under our courses and make me very seasick again. End of section 1, August 1768of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks, journal from 25 August 1768 to 12 July 1771, by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 2. September 1768. 1768, September 1. Coast of Spain. Still blue. Mother Carey's chickens had not yet left us, but towards night wind slackened so that we were again tolerably easy. By our reckoning, we must make some part of the coast of Spain before morning. 1768, September 2. This morning, about seven, saw the coast of Galicia, between Cape Ortegal and Finisterre. Weather tolerably fine, so that we could use the casting net, which brought up two kinds of animals, different from any taken before. They came up in clusters, both sorts indifferently in each cluster though much fewer of the horned ones than of the others. They seem to be two species of one genus, but are not at all reducible to any genus hitherto described. 1768, September 3. Blue fresh this morn, 
we were employed all day in describing the animals taken yesterday, found them to be of a new genus, and of the same with that taken on 28 August, called the genus Dagasa, from the likeness of one species to a gem. Towards even, wind fair settled, tolerably fine. 1768, September 4. Calm today. We were employed in fishing with a casting net, and were fortunate in taking several specimens of Dagasa sacata, adhering together, sometimes to the length of a yard or more, and shining in the water with very beautiful colors. But another insect which we took today was possessed of more beautiful coloring than anything in nature I have ever seen, hardly excepting gems. He is of a new genus and called blank, of which we took another species who had no beauty to boast, but this which we called opalinum shone in the water with all the splendor and variety of colors that we observe in a real opal. He lived in the glass of salt water in which he was put for examination several hours, darting about with great agility and at every motion showing an almost infinite variety of changeable colors. Towards the evening of this day a new phenomenon appeared. The sea was almost covered with a small species of crabs, Cancer depurator of Linnaeus, floating upon the surface of the water, and moving themselves with tolerable agility, as if the surface of the water and not the bottom was their proper station. Here again, as usual, our casting net was of great service. We took with it as many as were wanted, and went to bed well contented with the produce of the day. 1768, September 5. I forgot to mention yesterday the two birds were caught in the rigging, who probably had come from Spain, as we were not then distant above five or six leagues. This morning another was caught and brought to me, but so weak that it died in my hand almost immediately. They were all three of the same species, and not described by Linnaeus. We called them Motasia felificans, as they must be sailors who would venture themselves aboard a ship which is going round the world. But to make some balance to our good fortune, now become too prevalent, a misfortune happened this morn, equaling almost the worst which our enemies could have wished. The morning was calm, and Richmond employed in searching for what should appear on the surface of the water. A shoal of dagasses were observed, and he, eager to take some of them, threw the cast net, fastened to nothing but his wrist. The strip slipped from him, and the net at once sunk into the profound, never more to torment its inhabitants, but leaving us for some time entirely without a resource. Plenty of animals coming past the ship, and no nets, but in the hold, stowed under so many things, that it was impossible even to hope for their being got out to-day at least. However, an old hoop net was fastened to a fishing rod, and with it one new species of dagasa was caught and called lobata. 1768, September 6. Fine and calm this morn, immense numbers of dagasa lobata floated by, and were taken by our new contrivance, some of them in clusters, as many as fourteen together, united by a lobe on the underside. Towards the middle of the day, the sea was almost covered with dagasas of different kinds, among which two entirely new ones were taken, rostrata and strumosa. But neither of these were observed hanging in clusters, as most of the other species had been. Indeed, whether from the badness of the new machine or their scarcity, I cannot say. Only one of Rostrata and two of Strumosa were taken. It is now time to give some account of the genus Dagasa, of which there are already six species taken, all agreeing in many particulars, vastly well, but chiefly in this very singular one, that they have a hole at each end, which holes communicate by a tube, often as large as the body of the animal, by the help of which they swim with some degree of activity when separated from each other, for several sorts, are seen most generally joined together. Gemma, more particularly, which adhere in clusters of some hundreds irregularly shaped. In the midst of these were generally found a few specimens of cornuta, from which circumstance we may judge that they are very nearly allied. It seems singular that no naturalist before this time should have taken notice of these animals, as they abound so much where the ship now is, not twenty leagues from the coast of Spain. From hence, however, great hopes may be formed that the inhabitants of the deep have been but little examined, and, as Dr. Solander and myself shall have probably greater opportunity in the course of this voyage than any one has had before us, it is a very encouraging circumstance to hope that so large a field of natural history has remained almost untrod. 
even till this time, and that we may be able from this circumstance alone, almost unthought of, when we embarked in the undertaking, to add considerable light to the science which we so eagerly pursue. This evening, a large quantity of the Carcinium opalinum, which may be called opal insect, came under the ship's stern, making the very sea appear with uncommon beauty, their colors appearing with vast brightness, even at the depth of two or three fathoms, though they are not more than three lines long, and one broad. 1768, September 7. On examining the degisas, which were taken yesterday, several small animals were found lodged in the hollow parts of their bodies, and some in the very substance of the flesh, which seems to be their food, as many of the degisas were full of scars, which had undoubtedly been the lodgment of these animals some time before. Upon a minute inspection, they proved to be animals not to be classed under any of Linnaeus's genera, though nearly related to Oniscus, from which circumstance the name Onidium was given to the new genus, and to them was added an animal taken the 28th of August, and mentioned in the second page by the name of Oniscus macrothalmus. In one circumstance these insects differ from any hitherto described, and in that they all three agree, viz. the having two eyes joined together under one common membrane, without the least distinction or division between them, which circumstance alone seems a sufficient reason for constituting a new genus. The wind was now fair, and we went very pleasantly on towards our destined port, though rather too fast for any natural inquiries. For my own part, I could well dispense with a much slower pace, but I fancy few in the ship, Dr. Solander excepted, are of the same opinion, though I believe everybody envied our easy contented circumstances during the last calm, which brought so much food to our pursuits. 1768, September 8. Blew fresh today, but the wind was very fair, so nobody complained. Nor would they, was the wind much stronger, so impatient has the calms and foul wind made everybody. By the reckoning, we were off Cape St. Vincent, so shall soon bid adieu to Europe for some time. 1768, September 10. Since the northerly wind began to blow, it has not varied a point. The sea is now down, and we go pleasantly on, at the rate of about six knots. Could any contrivance be found by the help of which new subjects of natural history could be taken, Dr. Solander and myself would be quite happy. We are forced to be content. Three days are now past since anything has been taken or indeed seen, except a stray turtle who swam by the ship about noon, but was left far behind before any instrument by which he might have been taken could possibly have been got to hand. Today for the first time we dined in Africa, and took our leave of Europe for heaven alone knows how long, perhaps forever. That thought demands a sigh as a tribute due to the memory of friends left behind, and they have it. But two cannot be spared. Twofold give more pain to the sire than pleasure to those sighed for. Tis enough that they are remembered. They would not wish to be too much thought of by one so long to be separated from them, and left alone to the mercy of winds and waves." 1768, September 11. Wind fair, but rather slackened upon us. Nothing, however, was observed. We expected to make Porto Santo tonight, but did not. 1768, September 12. Arrived Madeira. This morning, Porto Santo and Madeira were in full view. They were seen at daybreak. Indeed, we had a little overshot them. As the wind was rather scanty, we had, however, no doubt of fetching in at night. Accordingly, at ten to night, came to an anchor in Fonchiali Bay. This morn about eleven, the product boat, as it is called by English sailors, which is the boat from the officers of health, who must give leave before any ship's crew can land, came on board, and we immediately went on shore in the town of Fonchiali, the capital of the island, situate in latitude 3240 north, called so from the fennel, which grows in plenty upon the rocks in its neighborhood, in which is called Funco, in the Portuguese language. Here we immediately went to the house of the English consul, Mr. Cheap, one of the first merchants in the place, where we were received with uncommon marks of civility. He insisted upon our taking possession of his house, and living entirely with him during our stay, which we did, and were by him furnished with every accommodation that we could wish. Leave was procured by him for us to search the island for whatever natural productions we might find worth taking notice of. P. 
people were also employed to procure for us fish and shells, which we could not have spared time to have collected ourselves. Horses and guides were also got for Dr. Solander and myself, to carry us to any part of the island which we might choose to visit. But our very short stay, which was only five days inclusive, made it impossible to go any distance, so we contented ourselves with collecting as much as we could in the neighborhood of the town, never going above three miles from it during our whole stay. The season of the year was undoubtedly the worst for both plants and insects, being the height of the vintage, when nothing is green in the country but just on the verge of small brooks, by which these vines are watered. We made shift, however, to collect specimens of several plants, etc., of which a catalogue follows, as it is not worth while to mix them in the journal, where they would take up much room. The five days which we remained upon the island were spent so exactly in the same manner that it is by no means necessary to divide them. I shall therefore only say that in general we got up in the morn, went out on our researches, returned to dine, and went out again in the evening. One day, however, we had a visit from the governor, of which we had noticed before, and were obliged to stay at home, so that unsought honour lost us very near the whole day, a very material part of the short time we were allowed to stay upon the island. We, however, contrived to revenge ourselves upon His Excellency by an electrical machine which we had on board. Upon his expressing a desire to see it, we sent for it ashore, and shocked him full as much as he chose. While at this place, we were much indebted to Dr. Heberden, the chief physician of the island, and brother to the physician of that name in London. He had for many years been an inhabitant of the Canaries and this island, and had made several observations chiefly philosophical. Some, however, were botanical, describing the trees of the island. Of these he immediately gave us a copy, together with such specimens as he had in his possession, and indeed spared no pains to get for us such living specimens of such as could be procured in flower. We tried here to learn what species of wood it is, which has been imported into England, and is now known to cabinet makers by the name of Madeira Mahogany, but without much success, as we could not learn that any wood had been exported out of the island by that name. The wood, however, of the tree called here Vigniatico, Loris Indicus, Lynn, bids fair to be the thing, it being of a fine grain and brown like mahogany, from which it is difficult to distinguish it, which is well shown at Dr. Heberdeen's house where in a bookcase Vigniatico and Mahogany were placed close by each other, and were only to be known asunder by the first being not quite so dark-coloured as the other. As much of the island as we saw showed evidently the signs of a volcano, having some time or other possibly produced the whole, as we saw no one piece of stone which did not evidently show signs of having been burnt, some very much, especially the sand, which was absolutely cinders. Indeed, we did not see much of the country, but we were told that the whole was like the specimen we saw of it. When you first approach it from seaward, it has a very beautiful appearance, the sides of the hills being entirely covered with vineyards, almost as high as the eye can distinguish, which make a constant appearance of verdure, though at this time nothing but the vines remained green, the grass and herbs being entirely burned up, except near the sides of the rills of water by which the vines are watered, and under the shade of the vines themselves though these very few species of plant were in perfection, the greater part being burnt up. The people here in general seem to be as idle, or rather uninformed a set, as I ever yet saw. All their instruments, even those with which their wine, the only article of trade in the island, is made, are perfectly simple and unimproved. Their method is this. The grapes are put into a square wooden vessel, of dimensions according to the size of the vineyard to which it belongs, into which the servants get, having taken off their stockings and jackets, and with their feet and elbows squeeze out as much of the juice as they can. The stalks, etc., are then collected, tied together with a rope, and put under a square piece of wood, which is pressed down by a lever, to the other end of which is fastened a stone that may be raised up at pleasure by a screw. By this way, and this only, they make their wine, and by this way probably Noah made his, when he had newly planted the first vineyard, after the general destruction of mankind and their arts, though it is not impossible that he might have used a better, if he remembered the ways he had seen used before the flood. It was with great difficulty that some, and not as yet all, of them were persuaded not long ago, 
to graft their vines and by this mean bring all the fruit of a vineyard to be of one sort though before the vine which it produced had been spoiled by different sorts of bad ones which were nevertheless suffered to grow and taken as much care of as the best because they added to the quantity of the wine yet were they perfectly acquainted with the use of grafting and constantly practised it on their chestnut trees by which means they were brought to bear sooner much than they would have done had they been allowed to remain unimproved wheel carriages i saw none of in the island of any sort or kind indeed their roads are so intolerably bad that if they had them they could scarcely make use of them they have however some horses and mules wonderfully clever in travelling upon them notwithstanding which they bring to town every drop of wine they make upon men's heads in vessels made of goat skins the only imitation of a carriage they have is a board a little hollowed out in the middle to one end of which a pole is tied by a strap of with leather the whole machine coming about as near the perfection of a european cart as an indian canoe does to a boat with this they move the pipes of wine about the town indeed i suppose they would never have made use even of this had not the english introduced vessels to put their wine in which were rather too large to be carried by hand as they used to do everything else a speech of their late governor is recorded here which shows in what light they are looked upon even by the portuguese themselves i believe far behind all the rest of europe except possibly the spaniards it was very fortunate said he that this island was not eden in which adam and eve dwelt before the fall for had it been so the inhabitants here would never have been induced to put on cloths so much are they resolved in every particular to follow exactly the paths of their forefathers indeed were the people here only tolerably industrious there is scarcely any luxury which might not be produced that either europe or the indies afford owing to the great difference of climate observable in ascending the hills this we experienced in a visit to dr heberton who lives about two miles from the town we left the thermometer when we set out at seventy four and found it there at sixty six indeed the hills produce almost spontaneously vast plenty of walnuts chestnuts and apples but in the town you find some few plants native of both the indies whose flourishing state put it out of all doubt that were they taken any care of they might have a quantity of them of these i mentioned some the banana tree musa sapientum lin in great abundance the guava cidium pyriferum lin not uncommon the pine apple bromelia ananas lin of this i saw some very healthy plants in the provador's garden mango mangifera indica lin one plant also of this in the same garden bearing fruit every year cinnamon laurus cinnamomum lin very healthy plants of this i saw on the top of dr heberden's house at Fonchiale, which had stood there through the winter without any kind of care having been taken of them these without mentioning any more seem very sufficient to show that the tenderest plants might be cultivated here without any trouble yet the indolence of the inhabitants is so great that even that is too much for them indeed the policy of the english here is to hinder them as much as possible from growing anything themselves except what they find their account in taking in exchange for corn though the people might with much less trouble and expense grow the corn themselves what corn grows here which indeed is not much is of a most excellent quality large grained and very fine their meat is also very good mutton pork and beef more especially of which what we had on board the ship was agreed by all of us to be very little inferior to our own though we englishmen value ourselves not a little on our peculiar experience in that production the fat of this was white like the fat of mutton yet the meat brown and coarse grained as ours though much smaller the town of Fonchiali is situated at the bottom of the bay very ill built though larger than the size of the island seems to deserve the houses of the bettermost people are in general large but those of the poorer sort very small and the streets very narrow and uncommonly ill-paved the churches here have abundance of ornaments chiefly bad pictures and figures of their favorite saints in laced clothes the convent of the franciscans indeed which we went to see had very little ornament but the neatness with which those fathers kept everything was well worthy of commendation especially their infirmary the contrivance of which deserves to be taken particular notice of it was a long room on one side of which were windows 
and an altar for the convenience of administering the sacrament to the sick. On the other were the wards, each just capable of containing a bed, and lined with white Dutch tiles. To every one of these was a door communicating with a gallery, which ran parallel to the great room, so that any of the sick might be supplied with whatever they wanted, without disturbing their neighbors. In this convent was a curiosity of a very singular nature, a small chapel whose whole lining, wainscot, and ceiling was entirely composed of human bones, two large thigh bones across, and a skull at each of the openings. Among these was a very singular anatomical curiosity, a skull in which one side of the lower jaw was perfectly and very firmly fastened to the upper by an ossification, so that the man, whoever he was, must have lived some time without being able to open his mouth. Indeed, it was plain on the other side that a hole had been made by beating out his teeth, and in some measure damaging his jawbone, by which alone he must have received his nourishment. I must not leave these good fathers without mentioning a thing which does great credit to their civility, and at the same time shows that they are not bigots to their religion. We visited them on Thursday even, just before their supper time. They made many apologies that they could not ask us to sup, not being prepared. But, said they, if you will come to-morrow, notwithstanding it is fast with us, we will have a turkey roasted for you. There are here, besides friaries, three or four houses of nuns. To one of these, Santa Clara, we went, and indeed the ladies did us the honor to express great pleasure in seeing us there. They had heard that we were great philosophers, and expected much from us. One of the first questions that they asked was, when it would thunder. They then desired to know if we could put them in a way of finding water in their convent, which it seems they were in want of. But notwithstanding, our answers to these questions were not quite so much to the purpose as they expected. They did not at all cease their civilities, for while we stayed, which was about a half an hour, I am sure there was not a fraction of a second in which their tongues did not go at an uncommonly nimble rate. It remains now that I should say something of the island in general, and then take my leave of Madeira, till some other opportunity offers visiting again, for the climate is so fine that any man might wish it was in his power to live here, under the benefits of English laws and liberty. The hills here are very high, much higher than any one would imagine. Pico Ruevo, is the highest at 5,068 feet, which is much higher than any land that has been measured in Great Britain. Indeed, as I hinted before, the whole island has probably been the production of a volcano, notwithstanding which its fertility is amazing. All the sides of the hills are covered with vines to a certain height, above which are woods of chestnut and pine of immense extent, and above them forests of wild timber of kinds not known in Europe, which amply supply the inhabitants with whatever they may want. Among these, some there were whose flowers we were not able to procure, and consequently could not settle their genera, particularly those called by the Portuguese Mirmulano and Pau Branco, both which, and especially the first, from the beauty of their leaves, promised to be a great ornament to our European gardens. The inhabitants here are supposed to be about 80,000, and from the town of Fonciale, its custom house I mean, the king of Portugal receives 20,000 pounds a year, after having paid the governor and all expenses of every kind, which may serve to show in some degree the consequence which this little island is of to the crown of Portugal. Was it in the hands of any other people in the world, its value might easily be doubled, from the excellence of its climate, capable of bearing any kind of crop, a circumstance which the Portuguese do not make the least advantage of. The coin current here is entirely Spanish, for the balance of trade with Lisbon being in disfavor of this island, all the Portuguese money naturally goes there, to prevent which Spanish money is allowed to pass. It is of three denominations, pisterines, bits, and half-bits. The first worth about one shilling, the second sixpence, and the third threepence. They have also Portuguese money of copper, but so scarce that I did not in my stay see a single piece. 1768, September 18, departed Madeira. This evening, everything being ready for sea, we went on board, and at eight o'clock got under way, with a very light breeze. 1768, September 19. Light breezes all day, without any event worth writing about. 1768, September 20. Still almost calm, which gave us an opportunity of taking with the casting net a most beautiful species of medusa, of a color equaling, if not exceeding, the finest ultramarine. It was described and called medusa azurea. 1768, September 21. 
This morn wind foul, saw, however, some rocks, called in the old charts salvages, which lay to the northward of the Canaries. 1768, September 22. No land in sight this morn. Towards noon almost calm. Many fish were about the ship, but our fishermen could not contrive to catch any of them. 1768, September 23. This morn we were called up very early to see the pike of Tenerife, which now for the first time appeared at a vast distance, much above the clouds. I mean those which form a bank near the horizon. The hill itself was so faint that no man who was not used to the appearance of land at a great distance could tell it from a cloud. It soon, however, appeared something clearer, and a sketch was made of it. While we were engaged in looking at the hill, the fish was taken, which was described and called scomber serpents. The seamen said they had never seen such a one before, except the first lieutenant, who remembered to have taken one before, just about these islands. Signor Hans Sloan, in his passage out to Jamaica, also took one of these fish, which he gives a figure of, Vol. 1, T1, F2. The pike continued in sight almost all day, though sometimes obscured by the clouds. At sunset, however, its appearance was most truly elegant, the rays of the sun remaining upon it some time after it was set, and the other land quite black, and giving it a warmth of color not to be expressed by painting. 1768, September 24. This morn the pike appeared very plain and immensely above the clouds, as may well be imagined by its height, which Dr. Heberden of Madeira, who has been himself upon it, communicated to us, 15,396 feet. The doctor also says that though there is no eruption of visible fire from it, yet heat issues from the chinks near the top so strongly that a person who puts his hand upon these is scalded. From him we received, among many other favors, some salt, which he supposes to be the true natron, or nitrum, of the ancients, and some native sulphur exceedingly pure, both of which he collected himself on top of the mountain, where large quantities, especially of the salt, are found on the surface of the earth. 1768, September 25. Wind continued to blow much as it had done, so we were sure we were well in the trade. Now for the first time we saw plenty of flying fish, whose beauty especially, when seen from the cabin windows, is beyond imagination their sides shining like burnished silver. When seen from the deck, they do not appear to such advantage as their backs are then presented to the view, which are dark colored. 1768, September 26. Went as usual, and as we expected to go, these next two months, flying fish are in great plenty about the ship. About one today we crossed the tropic. The night was most intolerably hot, the thermometer standing all night at 78 in the cabin, though every window was open. 1768, September 27. About one this morn a flying fish was brought into the cabin, the first that had been taken. It flew aboard, I suppose chased by some other fish, or maybe merely because it did not see the ship. At breakfast another was brought, which had flown into Mr. Green the astronomer's cabin. This whole day we sailed at the rate of seven knots, sometimes a fathom or two more, the wind being rather stronger than it usually is in the trade. 1768, September 28. Wind rather slackened. Three birds were today about the ship, a swallow, to all appearance the same as our European one, and two motasias. About nightfall one of the latter was taken. About eleven a shoal of porpoises came about the ship, and the fizz gig was soon thrown into one of them, but would not hold. 1768, September 29. This morn calm, employed in drawing and describing the bird taken yesterday, called it motasia avida. While the drawing was in hand it became very familiar so much so that we had a brace made for it, in hope to keep it alive. As flies were in amazing abundance on board the ship, we had no fear of plentiful supply of provision. About noon, a young shark was seen from the cabin windows following the ship, who immediately took a bait and was caught on board. He proved to be the squalus charcharius of Linnaeus, and assisted us in clearing up much confusion which almost all authors had made about that species. With him came on board four sucking fish, Echinius remora, Lynn, who were preserved in spirit. Notwithstanding it was twelve o'clock before the shark was taken, we made shift to have a part of him stewed for dinner, and very good meat he was, at least in the opinion of Dr. Solander and myself, though some of the seamen did not seem to be fond of him, probably from some prejudice founded on the species, sometimes feeding on human flesh. 1768, September 30. This morn at daybreak made the island of Bonavista one of the Cape Verde Islands. 
Mr. Buchan employed in taking views of the land. Mr. Parkinson busy in finishing the sketches made of the shark yesterday. This evening, the other Motasia avida was brought to us. It differed scarce at all from the first taken, except that it was something larger. His head, however, gave us some good by supplying us with near twenty specimens of ticks, which differed little from the acarus vicinus lin. It was, however, described and called Motasia. End of section two, seventeen sixty eight, September. Section three of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from twenty five August, seventeen sixty eight to 12 July, 1777, by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 3. October, 1768. 1768, October 1. This morn, bonitos were in great plenty about the ship. We were called up early to see one that had been struck, found it to be the scomber Palamus Lynn, had a drawing made of it. I confess, however, that I was a good deal disappointed, expecting to find the animal much more beautiful than it proved, though its colors were extremely lively, especially the blue lines on the back, which equaled at least any ultramarine. Yet the name and accounts I had heard from all who had seen them made me expect an animal of a much greater variety of color. This consisted of no more than blue lines on the back crossing each other, a gold and purple changeable on the sides, and white with black lines on the bottom of the sides and belly. After having examined and drawn the animal, we proceeded to dissect him, and in the course of the operation were much pleased by the infinite strength we observed in every part of him, especially the stomach, the coats of which were uncommonly strong, especially about the sphincter, or extremity by which the digested meat is discharged. This, I suppose, is intended to crush and render useful the scales and bones of fishes, which this animal must continually swallow, without separating them from the flesh. From the inside of its scales we took a small animal, who seemed to be a louse, if I may so call it, as it certainly stuck to him and preyed upon the juices which it extracted by suction, probably much to his disquiet. It proved to be Monoculus Piscinus Lynn, which Baster has given a figure of in his opera Subsessive, but has by some unlucky accident mistaken the head to be the tail, and the tail the head, in the ovaria for antennae. In the inside of the fish were also found two animals which preyed upon him, one in his very flesh, though near the membrane which covers the intestines, Fasciola pelomenes, MSS, the other in the stomach, Sepunculus piscium, MSS. 1768, October 2. This morn two swallows were about the ship, though we must now be sixty leagues at least from the land. At night one of them is taken, and proved to be Herundo Domestica, Lynn. 1768, October 3. This morn the other swallow was found dead upon the deck. Now for the first time we have lost the trade, and expected calm and squally weather till we shall cross the line. The trade had now lasted us, pretty free from squalls or calms, these many days. It has been in general between blank, but ever since we have been in it, the air has been uncommonly damp, everything more than usual liable to mould, and all the ironwork to rust. The air is seldom and clear, but a haze in it, which was even perceivable to the human frame. 1768, October 4. Today quite calm. I went out in a boat and took Dagasa strumosa, Medusa porporita, the same which we before called Azuria, Mimus volutator, and Simex, who runs upon the water here in the same manner as C. lacustris does in our ponds in England. Towards even, two small fish were taken under the stern. They were following a shirt, which was towing, and showed not the least signs of fear, so that they were taken with a landing net without the least difficulty. Ballistes monoceros, Lynn. 1768, October 5. Weather pretty good. At night a squall with lightning and rain. Another swallow came to the ship today and was taken with the snippers as soon as he went to roost. 1768, October 6. Blew fresh this morn with heavy rain. Towards noon, five swallows came on board, and were taken at roosting time, and proved, like all we had taken before, to be H. Domestica Lynn. This morning calm. We went out in the boat, and took what is called by the seamen a Portuguese man-of-war, Holotheria Physalis Lynn. Also, Medusa Valella L., Anidium Spinosum, MSS., Diadon Arenaceus, MSS., 
Dagus of Istria, MSS, Helix Janthina, Lynn, Helix Violacea, MSS, and Procellaria Oceanica, MSS. The Holotheria proved to be one of the most beautiful sights I had ever seen. It consisted of a small bladder in shape, much like the air bladder of fishes, from the bottom of which descended a number of strings of bright blue and red, some three or four feet in length, which, if touched, stung the person who touched them in the same manner as nettles, only much stronger. On the top of this bladder was a membrane which he turned either one way or the other, as the wind blew to receive it. This was veined with pink in an uncommonly beautiful manner. In short, the whole together was one of the most beautiful sights I have seen among the mollusca, though many of them are beautiful. The floating shells H. janthina and violacea, from their particularity, deserve also to be mentioned. They are found floating on the top of the water by means of a small cluster of bubbles filled with air, which are composed of a tenacious slimy substance, not easily parting with its contents. These keep him suspended on the surface of the water and serve as a hiding for his eggs, and it is probable that he never goes down to the bottom or willingly comes near any shore, as his shell is of so brittle a construction that few freshwater snails are so thin. Every shell contains within it a teaspoonful of liquid, which it easily discharges on being touched. This is of a most beautiful red-purple color, and easily dyes linen clothes. It may be well worth inquiry whether or not this is the purpura of the ancients, as the shell is certainly found in the Mediterranean. We have not yet taken a sufficient quantity of the shells to try the experiment. Probably we shall do soon. Procellaria oceanica differs very little from P. pelagica lin, but from its place of abode so far south, and some small difference in plumage, it is more than likely that he is different in species. 1768, October 8. A fine breeze today. Employed in figuring etc. what was taken yesterday. 1768, October 9. This morn a shark called us out of our beds, and was soon hooked, but as soon broke his hold and went off. At noon went out in the boat, but found nothing on the surface of the water. On returning home, however, found on the stern of the ship two species of Lepus vitata and Midas. They were both sticking to the bottom in company with the Anatifera, of which there was a great abundance. After dinner, called upon deck by another shark, who had been lately wounded by a harpoon, but he was too cunning after his misfortune to bite at our baits, which we much lamented, as he had sucking fish upon him that were quite white, probably a species not yet described. 1768, October 10. Went out in the boat today, took plenty of helix janthina, and some few of violacea. Shot the black-toed gull of pen, Zool. It had not yet been described according to Linnaeus's system, so called it Laris crepidatus. Its food here seems to be chiefly helixes, which appeared probable at least, on account of its dung having been of a lively red color, much like that which was procured from the shells. I was drove home from this excursion by a very heavy squall of rain, which entirely wetted me through long before it was possible to return to the ship. However, I received no other harm from the ducking than the present inconvenience of being so thoroughly wet. The remainder of today was very squally with much rain. Indeed, it has been so ever since we lost the trade, and the people who have been here before say that it is generally so in these latitudes. I can liken it to nothing so much as April in England, when it is very showery. The weather is never certain for two hours, or indeed half the time, though the calms spend much of the greatest part of our time in idleness. 1768, October 11. Today, much like yesterday, very squally saw a dolphin and admired the infinite beauty of his color as he swam in the water, but in vain he would not give us even a chance of taking him. 1768, October 12. A shark, Squalus carcharius, Lynn, taken this morning, and with him two pilot fish. At noon, calm. I went out in the boat and took several blubbers. The pilot fish, Gastrosteus ductor, Lynn, is certainly as beautiful a fish as can be imagined. It is of a light blue with cross streaks of darker color. It is wonderful to see them about a shark swimming round him without expressing the least signs of fear. What their motive for doing so is, I cannot guess, as I cannot find that they get any provision by it, or any other emolument except possibly the company of the shark keeps them free from the attacks of dolphins or other large fish of prey who would otherwise devour them. The blubbers taken today were Barrow labiata and marsupialis MSS, the first of which 
made a pretty appearance in the water by reason of its swimmers, which line its sides like fringes, and are of a changeable fire color. Calirobivia MSS, the most lifeless lump of jelly I have seen, it scarcely seems to be possessed of life, but for one or two motions we saw it make. 1768, October 13. Calm this morn, a shark was taken, but not one pilot fish attended him, which is rather uncommon, as they seldom are without a shoal of from ten to twenty. At noon I went in the boat and took the Sally man, Philodosi Valella Lynn, who was a sailor, though inferior in size to the Portuguese man of war, yet not without its beauty, chiefly from the charming blue of its bottom. Its sail is transparent, but not movable, so it trusts itself to the mercy of the winds, without being able to turn to windward, as the Portuguese man-of-war maybe can. We saw several of the latter today, and observed many small fish under their tentacula, who seemed to shelter there, as if with its stings it could defend them from large enemies. 1768, October 14. Calm today, but so squally and rainy that I dared not venture out with the boat. 1768, October 15. Ventured out today, but found the surface of the water so ruffled that nothing at all floated upon it. I had the good fortune, however, to see a bird of the sheer water kind, which I shot, and it proved to be not described. It was about as large as the common, but differed from it in being whiter, especially about the face. Called it Procellaria crepidata, as its feet were like the gulls shot last week, black without, but white near the legs. A large shoal of fish were all this day under the ship's stern, playing about but refusing to take bait. We, however, contrived to take one of them with a fish gig, which proved not described. It was in make and appearance like a carp, weighing nearly two pounds. Its sides were ornamented with narrow yellow lines, and its fins almost entirely covered with scales. Called it Catodon cyprinaceus. 1768, October 16. A fine breeze of wind started up last night which held us all day, so I found it impossible to go out in the boat. Tonight, however, to make these twenty-four hours not entirely unprofitable, I have the opportunity of seeing a phenomenon I had never met before with. A lunar rainbow, which appeared about ten o'clock very faint, and almost or quite without color, so that it could be traced by little more than an appearance which looked like shade on a cloud. 1768, October 17. This morn went out in the boat, but caught no one thing. I have never been before so unfortunate. In the evening, a breeze of wind sprung up from the southeast by south, which makes us hope we had got the southeast trade. 1768, October 18. Wind continued to blow fresh, so we had little doubt of the reality of yesterday's hopes. This evening, trying, as I have often, foolishly no doubt, done to exercise myself by playing tricks with two ropes in the cabin, I got a fall which hurt me a good deal and alarmed me more as the blow was on my head, and two hours after it I was taken with sickness at my stomach, which made me fear some ill consequence. 1768, October 19. Today, thank God, I was much better in east of all apprehensions, the wind continuing fair, and I had given over all thoughts of boat expeditions, for some time at least. 1768, October 20. Quite well today, employed in describing and attending the draftsman. 1768, October 21. Trade continues. Today the cat killed our bird, M. Evida, who had lived with us ever since the 29th September, entirely on the flies which he caught for himself. He was hearty and in high health, so that probably he might have lived a great while longer had fate been more kind. 1768, October 22. Trade had got more to the southward than it usually had been, which was unlucky for me, as I proposed to the captain to touch for part of a day, at least at the island of Fernanda Norona which he had no objection to if we could fetch it. That, however, seemed very uncertain. This evening we saw six or seven large fish of the whale kind, which the seamen call grampuses, though I think they were very different from the fish commonly so called. They were, however, certainly of the whale kind and blew through two pipes on the top of their heads. They had heads smaller and rounder than those fish in general have, and very low back fins and very small tails. Thus much was all that I could see, as they never came within two cable lengths of the ship. 1768, October 23. Trade today was still more to the southward, almost due south, so that we tacked and stood to the eastward, lest we should fall in with the coast of Brazil to the northward of Cape Frio. 1768, October 24. 
when today as fair as we could wish ship laid up so well that it renewed our hopes of touching at the island about noon today we experienced what the seamen call a white squall that is a gust of wind which came upon us quite unawares unattended with a cloud as squalls in general are and therefore took us quite unprepared it was however very slight so no ill consequence ensued except mr parkinson and his pots going leeward which diverted us more than it hurt him seventeen sixty eight october twenty five crossed equator this morn about eight o'clock crossed the equinoctial line in about thirty three degrees west latitude from greenwich at the rate of four knots which our seamen said was an uncommonly good breeze the thermometer standing at twenty nine the thermometer used in the voyage are two of mr bird's making after fahrenheit's scale which seldom differ above a degree from each other and that not till they are as high as eighty degrees in which case the medium between the two instruments is set down this evening the ceremony of ducking the ship's company was performed as always customary on crossing the line when those who have crossed it before claim a right of ducking all that have not the whole of the ceremony i shall describe about dinner time a list was brought into the cabin containing the names of every body and thing aboard the ship in which the dogs and cats were not forgot to this was affixed a petition signed the ship's company desiring leave to examine every body in that list that it might be known whether or not they had crossed the line before this was immediately granted every body was then called upon the quarter-deck and examined by one of the lieutenants who had crossed he marked every name either to be ducked or let off according as their qualifications directed captain cook and dr sullender were on the blacklist as were myself my servants and dogs which i was obliged to compound for by giving the duckers a certain quantity of brandy for which they willingly excused us the ceremony many of the men however chose to be ducked rather than give up four days allowance of wine which was the price fixed upon and as for the boys they are always ducked of course so that about twenty-one underwent the ceremony which was performed thus a block was made fast to the end of the main yard and a long line revved through it to which three cross pieces of wood were fastened one of which was put between the legs of the man who was to be ducked and to this he was tied very fast another was for him to hold in his hands and the third was over his head lest the rope should be hoisted too near the block and by that means the man hurt when he was fastened upon this machine the boatswain gave the command by his whistle and the man was hoisted up as high as the cross piece over his head would allow when another signal was made and immediately the rope was let go and his own weight carried him down he was then immediately hoisted up again and three times served in this manner which was every man's allowance thus ended the diversion of the day for the ducking lasted till almost night and sufficiently diverting it certainly was to see the different faces that were made on this occasion some grinning and exulting in their hardiness whilst others were almost suffocated and came up ready enough to have compounded after the first or second duck had such proceeding been allowable it is now time that i should say something of the climate and degree of heat since crossing the tropic as we have been for some time within the bounds which were supposed by the ancients to be uninhabitable on account of their heat almost immediately on crossing the tropic the air became sensibly much damper than usual though not materially hotter the thermometer then in general stood from eighty to eighty-two the nearer we approached to the comb still damper everything grew this was perceivable even to the human body and very much so but more remarkably upon all kinds of furniture everything made of iron rusted so fast that the knives in people's pockets became almost useless and the razors in cases not free all kinds of leather became mouldy portfolios and trunks covered with black leather were almost white soon after this mould adhered to almost everything all the books in my library became so mouldy that they were obliged to be wiped to preserve them about this time we came into the calms which we met with earlier than usual the thermometer was then at eighty-three and we suffered from the heat and damp together bathing however kept me in perfect health though many of the ship's company were ill of bilious complaints which however were but of short duration this continued till we got the southeast trade when or a little before the glass fell to eighty-eight and soon to seventy-nine and seventy-eight but the dampness continued yet to that i chiefly attribute the ill success of the electrical experiments of which i have wrote an account on separate papers that the different experiments may appear at one view the air during the whole time since we crossed the tropic and indeed some time before 
has been nearly the same temperature throughout the 24 hours, the thermometer seldom rising above a degree during the time the sun is above the horizon. The windows of the cabin have been open without once being shut ever since we left Madeira. 1768, October 26. Last night and today the weather has been squally, wind rather fresh but keeping very much to the southward. Great plenty of flying fish have been about the ship, few or none of which have been seen since we left the northeast trade. 1768, October 27. Fine weather but wind rather too much to the southward. We are today nearing the latitude of the island of Fernand de Norjona, so that I am not without hopes of making it if rightly laid down. Night, however, put an end to our hopes for the present at least, and left us in no very agreeable situation, as shoals and foul ground is laid down all round the islands. 1768, October 28. Fine breeze today. Our hopes of seeing the island were again renewed, but without success. So at night we judge ourselves to be past it, and that the longitude is wrong laid down. 1768, October 29. Wind east, very pleasant. We now gave up all thoughts of the island. This evening the sea appeared uncommonly beautiful, flashes of light coming from it, perfectly resembling small flashes of lightning, and these so frequent that sometimes eight or ten were visible at the same moment. The seamen were divided in their accounts, some assuring us that it proceeded from fish, who made the light by agitating the salt water, as they called it, in their darting at their prey, while others said that they had often seen them and knew them to be nothing but blubbers, medusas. This made us very eager to procure some of them, which at last we did, one by the help of a landing net. They proved to be a species of medusa, which when brought on board appeared like metal, violently heated, emitting a white light. On the surface of this animal, a small lepus was fixed, exactly the color of it, which was almost transparent, not unlike thin starch, in which a small quantity of blue was dissolved. In taking these animals, three or four species of crabs were taken, but also very small, one of which gave light full as much as a glowworm in England, though the creature was not so large by nine-tenths. Indeed, the sea this night seemed to abound with light in an uncommon manner, as if every inhabitant of it furnished its share, which might have been the case, though none kept that property after being brought out of the water, except these two. 1768, October 30. This morn employed in examining the things caught last night which being taken by the light of our lamps, for the wind, which blows in at the windows, always open, will not suffer us to burn candles. We could hardly then distinguish into genera, much less into species. Had the good fortune to find that they were all quite new. Called them Medusa pollucens, Lepus pollucens, Cleo, Cancer fulgens, and Cancer amplectens. But we have the misfortune to lose two more species of crabs overboard by the tumbling of a glass overboard in which they were contained. In the evening the sea was lighted in the same manner as it was last night, only more nearly so strong. We renewed, however, our endeavors to take some of the light carriers, not without success, as two new species of crabs were taken, one of which was very singular. 1768, October 31. Nothing to be done today. Found, however, that the crabs taken yesterday were both new, called them vitreous and crassicornus. End of section 3, October 1768. Section 4 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August 1768 to 12 July 1771 by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 4. November, 1768. 1768, November 1. A shoal of small fish were today under our stern, who attended the ship for some time. She had, however, too much way through the water for our instruments, so we could not take any of them. 1768, November 2. This day was quite void of events. The wind, however, was very fair and we now approached the place where we were next to refresh ourselves apace. 1768, November 3. This morn, the sun was immediately over our heads, notwithstanding which the thermometer was no higher than 77. Since we left the calms under the line, the weather has grown cooler by gradual degrees. Now we reckon it quite moderate, after having felt the heat of 83 so lately. This even I, for the first time, for other people had seen them much before, observed two light spots in the heavens, appearing much like the Milky Way. 
one the largest and brightest bore south by east the other about south seventeen sixty eight november four still as we got more to the westward the wind became more favourable Today it was almost aft and has been all along creeping to the northward seventeen sixty eight november five the thermometer kept still gradually falling as the wind got more to the northward which appears odd as the north wind should now be the warm wind we were not yet however enough to the southward to find much alteration wind this morn was northeast at noon north by west between this place and mid channel it has changed from south by east the trade being to the northward upon this coast has been observed long ago though i question whether our navigators are sufficiently apprised of it piso in his natural history of the brazils says that the winds along shore are constantly to the northward from october to march and to the southward from march to october dampier also who certainly had as much experience as most men says the same thing advising ships outward bound to keep to the westward where they are most certain to find the trade more eastward than in mid-channel where it sometimes is due south or within one half a point of it as we ourselves experienced seventeen sixty eight november six to-day light winds and very pleasant weather the thermometer was never above seventy six towards evening the colour of the water was observed to change upon which we sounded and found ground at thirty two fathom the lead was cast three times between six and ten without finding a foot difference in the depth or quality of the bottom which was encrusted with coral we supposed this to be the tail of a great shoal laid down in all our charts by the name of albrojos on which lord anson struck soundings in his outward bound passage seventeen sixty eight november seven this morn at four no ground with one hundred fathoms of line about noon long ranges of a yellowish colour appeared upon the sea many of them very large one the largest might be a mile in length and three or four hundred yards wide the seamen in general affirmed roundly that they were the spawn of fishes and that they had often seen the same appearance before upon taking up some of the water so coloured we found it to be caused by innumerable small atoms each pointed at the end and of a yellowish colour none of them above a quarter of a line in length in the microscope they appeared to be fasciculi of small fibres interwove one within another not unlike the nitty of some pharagnias which we call caddises what they were or for what purposes designed we could not even guess nor so much as distinguish whether their substance was animal or vegetable seventeen sixty eight november eight continent of south america at daybreak to-day we made the land which proved to be the continent of south america in latitude twenty one point sixteen about ten we saw a fishing boat who told us that the country we saw belonged to the captainship of espirito santo dr solander and myself went on board this boat in which were eleven men nine of whom were blacks who all fished with lines we bought of them the chief part of their cargo consisting of dolphins two kinds of pelagic scombers sea bream and the fish called in the west indies welshmen for which they made us pay nineteen shillings and sixpence we had taken spanish silver with us which we imagined was the currency of the continent we were therefore not a little surprised that they asked us for english shillings and preferred two which we by accident had to the pistarines though they after some words took them also the business of these people seemed to be going a good distance from land and catching large fish which they salted in bulk in a place in the middle of their boat made for that purpose in this place was about two quintals of fish laid in salt which they offered to sale for sixteen shillings and would doubtless have taken half the money had we been inclined to buy them but fresh provisions was all we wanted and the fresh fish they had which we bought served the whole ship's company their provision for the sea consisted of a cask of water and a bag of the flour of cassada which they called farinha de pau or wooden flour a very proper name for it which indeed tastes more like powdered chips than anything else their method of drinking out of their cask of water was truly primitive and pleased me much the cask was large as broad as the boat and exactly fitted a place in the ballast made for it they consequently could not get at the bottom of it to put in a tap by which the water might be drawn out to remedy this difficulty they made use of a cane about three feet long hollow and open at each end this the man who wanted to drink desired his neighbor to fill for him which he did by putting it into the cask and laying the palm of his hand over the uppermost hole 
hindered the water from running out of the other, to which the drinker applied his mouth, and the other, taking off his hand, let the liquor run into the drinker's mouth, till he was satisfied. Soon after we came on board, a sphinx was taken, which proved to be quite a new one, and a small bird, also, who was the Tanagra Jacarini of Lynn. It seemed, however, from Linnaeus's description, as well as Edward's and Brisson's, that neither of them had seen the bird, which was in reality a Loxia nitens. The fish brought on board proved to be Scomber anxia and Falcatus, Corophina hipparis, Asparus pagris, and Cyanea rubens. The second and last not being before described, we called them by these names. Afternoon, the wind came about south and south by east, and it soon came on to blow fresh, which we were not at all accustomed to, so we boarded it along shore without gaining much. 1768, November 9. This morn, wind continued south and south by west, but is more moderate, but still more sea than we should choose were we directors of the winds and waves. We, however, stood in with the land till we found ourselves in a large bay, the shores of which were very flat. In the middle of this bay were some large hills, which lay far inland, and made the prospect very remarkable, as expressed in the view. At this time we were by guess within five miles of the shore, and our water had decreased gradually till we had less than five fathom. It was about four in the evening, so our captain thought proper to put about, and stand off to sea. In the evening the wind freshened a little, but was not near so troublesome as last night. 1768, November 10. Wind more moderate this morn. We stood in with the land and made it nearly in the same place as we left it last night, our soundings being from fifteen to ten fathoms. After dinner, the wind came more to the eastward and freshened, and little pieces of seaweed now came floating by the ship, which we took, and it proved to be Sargasso fucus natans, which is generally supposed to increase upon the surface of the sea, in the same manner as duckweed, lemna, does on fresh water, without having any root. This, however, plainly showed that it had been rooted in the coral rock on the bottom, as two specimens, particularly, had large lumps of the coral still adhering to their bottoms. Among the weed we got were some animals, but scarcely worth mentioning. One ballistes, but quite a fry, so young that it was impossible to refer it to its species. A worm also was in it, which proved to be Nireus pelagica. In the course of this night we ran over a small bank, on which the water suddenly shoaled to seven fathom, and kept thereabouts for some time. It, however, deepened gradually. 1768, November 11. Light breezes today the wind much more fair than it has been, so that we began to get to the southward. The thermometer today was no more than 72, so that we felt cold, or cool at least, though we could not prevail on ourselves to shut the cabin windows, as we are soon to come into much warmer weather. Just before dark the land was seen ahead, which we supposed to be the island off Cape Frio, so we hoped to be the length of Cape Frio by tomorrow morn. 1768, November 12. This morn we were abreast of the land, which proved, as we thought last night, to be the island just without Cape Frio, which is called in some maps the Isle of Frio. The wind was fair, and we passed it with a pleasant breeze, hoping tomorrow to get into the harbor. About noon we saw the hill called Sugarloaf, which is just by the harbor's mouth, but it was a long way off yet, so there were no hopes of reaching it this night. The shore from Cape Frio to this place has been one uninterrupted beach of the whitest color I ever saw, which they tell me is a white sand. This evening wind still continued fair, but very little. We now saw the sugar loaf very plain, but could not tonight reach it, so shortened sail. We had seen for some time a small vessel under the land, which seemed to steer into the harbor, as well as we. The land all along this coast has been exceedingly high inland, except in the bay mentioned on the 7th. The mountains seen now about Rio Janeiro were immensely high, so that some of our people compared them with the pike of Tenerife, though I do not myself think they deserve a comparison. So much higher is the pike. Notwithstanding, the hills are high, and begin to rise near the shore. The beach is sandy, and appears to be of a very firm sand. In the course of this evening we approached very near the land, and found it very cold, to our feelings at least. The thermometer at ten o'clock stood at sixty-eight and one quarter, which gave us hopes that the country would be cooler than we should expect from the accounts of travellers, especially Mr. Byron, who says that no business is done here from ten till two, on account of the immense heat. 
1768, November 13. This morn, the harbour of Rio Janeiro was right ahead, about two leagues off, but it being quite calm, we made our approaches very slowly. The sea was inconceivably full of small vermes, which we took without the least difficulty. They were almost all new except Baroi labiata, Medusa radiata, Fimbriata, and Crystallina, Dagasa blank. Soon after that a fishing boat came aboard and sold us three scombers, which proved to be new, and were called a Salmonius. His baits were Culpia chinensis, of which we also procured specimens. As soon as we came well into the river, the captain sent Mr. Hicks, his first lieutenant, with a midshipman to get a pilot, and stood up the river, expecting him down very soon. He did not, nor did the boat, till we were on the point of dropping an anchor just under the town. The boat then came without either of our officers, in exchange for whom came a subaltern Portuguese, who seemed to have no kind of business with us. The coxswain brought word from the lieutenant that he was detained on shore till the captain should go off. Soon after we came to an anchor, a ten-oared boat came alongside the ship with twelve or fourteen soldiers in it, who rowed round us without taking any notice of us or saying a word. A quarter of an hour after came a boat in which was a disembargator and a colonel of a Portuguese regiment who asked us many questions which at first seemed to discourage our stay as telling us that the governor would furnish us with any quantity of water in two days. In the conclusion, however, he was immensely civil, telling us that the governor would give us every assistance in his power, that the lieutenant had not been confined, but on account of the practica, had not been allowed to go on shore. He should now, however, be sent on board immediately, that the captain was welcome to go on shore now, but he wished the rest of the crew might remain on board till the paper they drew up had been delivered. 1768, November 14. This morn, Captain Cook went ashore, Dr. Solander and myself impatiently waiting for his return, which he promised should be the moment he had spoken with the Viceroy, who would no doubt tell him that the practica paper had been delivered, and we were all at liberty to come ashore when we pleased. About twelve he came on board with a Portuguese officer in his boat, who had been put there by order of the Viceroy, out of a compliment, as he termed it and an English gentleman, Mr. Forster, by name a lieutenant in the Portuguese service. The captain told us that we could not be allowed to have a house or sleep ashore, so the viceroy had told him, but Mr. Forster told us that he had given orders that no person but the captain and such common sailors as were required to be upon duty should be permitted to go ashore, and that we the passengers were probably particularly objected to. We, however, in the evening, dressed ourselves and attempted to go ashore under the pretense of a visit to the Viceroy, but were stopped by the guard boat, whose officers told us that he had particular orders, which he could not transgress, to let no officer or passenger except the captain pass the boat. After much conversation to no purpose, we were obliged to return on board, and the captain went ashore to remonstrate to the Viceroy about it, but could get no answer but that it was the king of portugal's orders and consequently must be seventeen sixty eight november fifteen this morn the captain went again ashore and told the viceroy that it was necessary to give the ship a heel in which case it would be almost impossible for the gentlemen who were passengers to stay on board her the viceroy as i suppose misunderstood him and supposing that he wanted to have the ship hove down said that if the ship was reported by one of his carpenters who should be sent on board to want such repairs he would give her all necessaries for so doing. In that case, the gentleman should have a house ashore, but gave him to understand that a sentinel would be put at the door with orders not to let us stir out or any one come in on any pretense whatsoever. 1768, November 16. The captain went ashore again and remonstrated particularly against the sentinel that was put in his boat whenever he landed or came aboard which he was told was a compliment, but now found to be a guard. He received no satisfactory answers, or rather none at all, but that it is the King of Portugal's orders. 1768, November 17. Tired with waiting and remonstrating only in words, both the captain and myself sent ashore written memorials, of which mine is subjoined, as well as another with the answers, which complain of His Excellency the Viceroy's behavior to us as a king's ship, as almost a breach of treaty. 1768, November 18. Answers to our memorials came on board, in which the captain is told that he has no reason to complain, as such usage as he has received 
has been constantly the custom of the ports of Brazil, and that the viceroy himself served an English ship, just in the same manner, at Bahia. As for me, I am told that as I have not brought proper credentials from the court of Lisbon, it is impossible that I can be permitted to land. 1768, November 19. Both the captain and myself sent answers to His Excellency's memorials this morn by the lieutenant, who had orders not to suffer a guard to be put into his boat, but if the guard boat insisted upon it to return on board. The boat let him pass, but the viceroy, as soon as he heard that he had come ashore without a guard, ordered sentinels to be put into the boat, and on the lieutenant refusing to go on board unless the sentinels were taken out, ordered the boat's crew to be taken into custody, the boat detained, and the lieutenant to be sent on board in a guard boat under care of an officer. When he came on board, he reported what he had seen, that the men in our pinnace made not the least resistance notwithstanding which the soldiers who took them into custody behaved with a great indecency, striking them many times and thrusting them out of the boat. The same guard boat also brought back the letters unopened. This evening it blew very hard at about south, puffs coming off about three minutes distant from each other, which seldom lasted above half a minute, but in that time were as violent as I ever saw. At this time our long boat came on board with four casks of rum in her. She with difficulty fetched the ship, and soon after, by some mismanagement, which I cannot account for, broke adrift, carrying with her my small boat, which was made fast to her. We had now no boat on board, but a small four-oared yawl, which was immediately sent after her and took her in tow. But notwithstanding all that could be done by the people who rowed in the long boat, and those who towed in the yawl, she was very soon out of sight, and we were under the greatest uneasiness, well knowing that she drove directly upon the reef of rocks, which runs out from the point of Iljoa das Ferreras, just to the leeward of where we lay. After remaining in this situation until two in the morning, our people came on board, and told us that the longboat was sunk, but that they had left her riding to her grappling, though full of water. As for my boat, they had in returning to the ship fallen in with a reef of rocks, in which dangerous situation they had been obliged to cut her adrift. This was poor comfort, though we were glad to find the people safe. Yet the loss of our longboat, which we much feared, was perhaps the greatest misfortune that could happen to people who were going, as we were, upon discovery. I should have mentioned that on the detainder of our boat's crew, a petty officer was sent ashore with the memorials, and a letter from the captain, demanding the boat and men, who were suffered quietly to go ashore on taking a soldier out of the guard boat. The only answer he got was verbal, that the affair could not be settled as yet. 1768, November 20. This morn the yawl, now the only boat we had, was sent ashore to ask assistance. They returned about nine and brought with her our boat and crew that had been detained, as well as another of the viceroys, which had orders to assist us in searching for our boats. The people who came in the pinnace declared that they never made the least resistance, but said that the soldiers struck them often, that they were confined in a loathsome dungeon, where their companions were chiefly blacks, who were chained. But the coxswain purchased a better apartment for seven pitaks, about as many shilling English. Our situation this whole day was better imagined than described. The shore boat came on board at noon, that the people might have their victuals, but brought no news of the long boat. Tired with expectation, I confess I had almost given over all hopes of ever seeing her again. But just at dark night, the pinnace came, bringing with her both the boats and all their contents. We now immediately passed from our disagreeable thoughts to a situation as truly happy, and concluded with defying the Viceroy, and all that he could do to us. 1768, November 21. Letters came from the Viceroy to both the Captain and myself, in which he told me very politely that it is not in his power to permit to go ashore. In the Captain's he raised some doubts of our ship being a king's ship, so I, who could grant my pretensions to going ashore to no other foundation, thought it best to drop them, hoping that by and by, when things were more quiet, I might have an opportunity of smuggling myself ashore. 1768, November 22. This morn I sent my servants ashore at daybreak, who stayed till dark night, and brought off many plants and insects. 1768, November 23. The Viceroy's answer to the captain's last memorial came on board, in which the captain is accused of smuggling, which made us all angry, but our venting our spleen against the Viceroy will be of very little service to us. 
1768, November 24. My servants went ashore again and brought off many plants, etc. 1768, November 25. This morn, Dr. Salander went into the town as surgeon of the ship to visit a friar who had desired that the surgeon might be sent to him. He received civilities from the people rather more than he could expect. 1768, November 26. I myself went ashore this morn before daybreak and stayed till dark night. While I was ashore, I met several of the inhabitants, who were very civil to me, taking me to their houses, where I bought of them stock for the ship, tolerably cheap, a porker middling fat for eleven shill, a muscovy duck, something under two shills, etc. The country where I saw it abounded with vast variety of plants and animals, mostly such as have not been described by our naturalists, as so few have had the opportunity of coming here. Indeed, no one that I know of even tolerably curious has been here since Margrave and Piso, about the year 1640, so it is easy to guess the state in which the natural history of such a country must be. To give a catalogue of what I found would be a trouble very little to the purpose, as every particular is mentioned in the general catalogues of this place. I cannot, however, help mentioning some which struck me the most, and consequently gave me particular pleasure. These were chiefly the parasitic plants, especially Renialmias, for I was not fortunate enough to see one epidendron and the different species of bromelia, many not before described, had I been fortunate enough to see fructifications, which I did of very few. B. Caritas I saw here, growing on the decayed trunk of a tree, fifty feet high at least, which it had so entirely covered that the whole seemed to be a tree of Caritas. The growth of the blank also pleased me much, though I had before got a very good idea of it from Rumphius who has a very good figure of the tree in his herb, Amboin Tab. Add to these the whole country covered with the beautiful blossom of Malpigias, Menisterias, Passiflorus, not to forget Poinciana and Mimosa Sensitiva, and a beautiful species of Cluthia, of which I saw great plenty. In short, the wildest spots here were varied with a greater quantity of flowers, as well as more beautiful ones than our best devised gardens, a sight infinitely pleasing to the eye for a short time though no doubt it would soon tire with the continuance of it. The birds of many species, especially the smaller ones, sat in great abundance on the boughs, many of them covered with the most elegant plumage. I shot Loxia brasiliensis and saw several specimens of them. Insects, also, were here in great abundance, many species very fine, but much more nimble than our Europeans, especially the butterflies which almost all flew near the tops of the trees, and were very difficult to come at, except when the sea breeze blew fresh, which kept them low down among the trees, where they might be taken. Hummingbirds I also saw of one species, but could not shoot them. The banks of the sea, and more remarkably all the edges of small brooks, were covered with innumerable quantities of small crabs, Cancer vocans lin, one hand of which is very large. Among these were many, both whose hands were remarkably small and of equal size. These my black servant told me were females of the others, and indeed, all I examined, which were many, proved to be females, though whether really of the same species with vocans, I cannot determine on so short an acquaintance. I saw but little cultivation, and that seemed to be taken with little pains with. Grassland was the chief, on which were many lean cattle feeding, and lean they might well be, for almost all the species of grass which I observed here were creepers, and consequently so close to the ground that though there might be upon them a sufficient bite for horses or sheep, yet how horned cattle could live at all was all that appeared extraordinary to me. I also saw their gardens or small patches, in which they cultivate many sorts of European garden stuff, as cabbage, peas, beans, kidney beans, turnips, white radishes, pumpkins, etc., but all much inferior to ours, except perhaps the last. Here also they grew watermelons and pineapples, the only fruits which I have seen them cultivate. The watermelons are very good, but the pines much inferior to those I have tasted in Europe. Hardly one I have yet had could have been reckoned among the middling sort. Many were worse than I have seen sent from table in England, where nobody would eat them. Though in general they are very sweet, they have not the least flavor. But more of their fruits by and by. In these gardens also grow yams and manihoka or cassada, which supplies the place of bread here, for as our European bread corn will not grow here at all, the flour they have is brought from Portugal, at a large expense, too great for even the middling people to purchase, much more the inferior ones. 1768, November 27. This morn, when the boats returned from watering, 
they brought word that they heard it said in the town that people were sent out in search of some of our people, who were ashore without leave. This we concluded meant either Dr. Solander or myself, which made it necessary for us to go no more ashore while we stayed. 1768, November 28 to 30. These three days nothing material happened. Everything went on as usual, only we if possible increased our haste to be gone from this place. End of section 4, 1768, November. Section 5 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August 1768 to 12 July 1771 by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 5. December 1768. 1768, December 1. This morn, our boat returning from shore, brought us the very disagreeable news that Mr. Forster, who I before mentioned, was taken into custody, charged with having smuggled things ashore from our ship. This charge, though totally without foundation, was looked upon as a sufficient reason for his being put into prison. But we believe the real cause to be his having shown some countenance to his countrymen, as we heard at the same time that five or six Englishmen resided in the town, and a poor Portuguese, who used to assist our people in buying things, were all put into prison, also without any reason being given. 1768, December 2. This morn, thank God, we have got all we want from these illiterate, impolite gentry. So we got up our anchor, and sailed to the point of Ilhoa dos Cobras, where we were to lay in wait for a fair wind, which should come every night from the land. We were fortunate in the arrival of a Spanish brig, coming from Buenos Aires, with letters for Spain, which arrived about a week ago. Her officers were received ashore with all possible politeness, and allowed to take a house, without the least hesitation. The captain, Don Antonio de Montenegro y Velasco, with all possible politeness, offered to take our letters to Europe, which we accepted, of as a very fortunate circumstance, and sent them on board this morn. 1768, December 3 to 4. We remained without any sea breeze. 1768, December 5. This morn early a dead calm. We attempted to tow down with our boats, and came near abreast of Santa Cruz, their chief fortification, when to our great surprise the fort fired two shot at us, one of which just went over our mast. We immediately brought two and sent ashore to inquire the reason. We're told that no order had come down to allow us to pass, without which no ship was ever suffered to go below that fort. We were now obliged to send to the town to know the reason of such extraordinary behavior. The answer came back about eleven that it was a mistake, for the brigadier had forgot to send the letter, which had been written some days. It was, however, sent by the boat, and we had leave to proceed. We now began to weigh our anchor, which had been dropped in foul ground, when we were fired at, but it was hung so fast in a rock that it could not be got out while the land breeze blew, which today continued almost till four in the even. As soon as the sea breeze came, we filled our sails, and carrying the ship over the anchor, tripped it, but were obliged to sail back almost as far as we had towed this ship in the morn. This day and yesterday, the air was crowded in an uncommon manner with butterflies, chiefly of one sort, of which we took as many as we pleased on board the ship. Their quantity was so large that at some times, I may say many thousands, were in view at once, in almost any direction you could look, the greatest part of them much above our mastheads. 1768, December 6. No land breeze today, so we are confined in our disagreeable situation without a possibility of moving. Many curses were this day expended on his excellence. 1768, December 7. Rio de Janeiro described. This morn weighed and stood out to sea. As soon as we came to Santa Cruz, the pilot desired to be discharged, and with him our enemy the guard boat went off. So we were left our own masters, and immediately resolved to go ashore on one of the islands in the mouth of the harbor. There ran a great swell, but we made shift to land on one called Raza, on which we gathered many species of plants and some insects. Ostromeria salsilla was here in tolerable plenty, and Amaryllis mexicana. They were the most specious plants. We stayed till about four o'clock, and then came aboard the ship heartily tired, for the desire of doing as much as we could in a short time had made us all exert ourselves in a particular manner, though exposed to the hottest rays of the sun just at noonday. Now we are got fairly to sea, and have entirely got rid of these troublesome people. I cannot help spending some time in describing them, though I was not myself once in their town. 
yet my intelligence coming from Dr. Salander, who was, and our surgeon, Mr. Monkhouse, a very sensible man, who was ashore every day to buy our provisions, I think cannot err much from the truth. The town of Rio de Janeiro, the capital of the Portuguese dominions in America, situate on the banks of the river of that same name. Both are called, I apprehend, from the Roman Saint Januarius, according to the Spanish and Portuguese custom of naming their discoveries from the saint, on whose feast they are made. It is regular and well built, after the fashion of Portugal, every house having before its windows a lattice of wood, behind which is a little balcony. For size it is much larger, and I could have thought probably a little inferior, to any of our country towns in England, Bristol or Liverpool not excepted. The streets are all straight, intersecting each other at right angles, and have this peculiar convenience, that much of the greater number lay in one direction, and are commanded by the guns of their citadel, called St. Sebastian, which is situate on the top of a hill, overlooking the town. It is supplied with water by an aqueduct, which brings it from the neighboring hills, upon two stories of arches, and in some places to be very high. The water that this brings is conveyed into a fountain in the great square immediately opposite the governor's palace, which is guarded by a sentry who has sufficient work in keeping regularity and order among so many as are always waiting at this place. There is also water laid into some other part of the town, but how it is brought there I could not hear, only that it was better than the fountain, which is exceedingly indifferent, so much so as to not be liked by us, though we had been two months at sea, in which time our water was almost continually bad. The churches here are very fine dressed out, with more ornaments even than those in Europe, and all parts of their religion is carried on with more show. Their processions in particular are very extraordinary. Every day, one or other of the parishes go in solemn order, with all the insignia of their church, altar, host, etc., through their parish, begging for what they can get, and praying in all forms, at every corner of a street. While we were there, one of the largest churches in the town was rebuilding, and for that reason the parish belonging to it had leave to walk through the whole city, which they did once a week, and collected much money for the carrying on of their edifice. At this ceremony all boys, under a certain age, were obliged to attend, nor were the gentlemen's sons ever excused. Each of these were dressed in a black cassock with a short red cloak, reaching halfway down their shoulders, and carried in his hand a lanthorn hung on the end of a pole about six or seven feet long, the light caused by this, for there were always at least two hundred lights, is greater than can be imagined. I myself, who saw it out of the cabin windows, called together my messmates, and showed it to them imagining that the town was on fire. Besides this traveling religion, a man who walks the streets has opportunity enough to show his attachment to any saint in the calendar. For every corner, and almost every house, has before it a little cupboard in which some saint or other keeps his residence and lest he should not see his votaries in the night, he is furnished with a small lamp, which hangs before his little glass window. To these it is very customary to pray and sing hymns, with all the vociferation imaginable, as might be imagined when I say that I and everyone else in the ship heard it very distinctly every night, though we lay at least half a mile from the town. The government of this place seems to me to be much more despotic even than that of Portugal, though many precautions have been taken to render it otherwise. The chief magistrates are the viceroy, the governor of the town, and a council, whose number I could not learn, but only the viceroy had in this the casting vote. Without the consent of this council nothing material should be done, yet every day shows that the viceroy and governor at least, if not all the rest, do the most unjust things, without consulting any one. Putting a man into prison without giving him a hearing, and keeping him there, till he is glad at any rate to get out, without asking why he was put in, or at best sending him to Lisbon to be tried there, without letting his family know where he has gone to, is very common. This we experienced while here, for every one who had interpreted for our people, and some who had only assisted in buying provisions for them, were put into jail merely, I suppose, to show us their power. I should, however, accept from this one John Burrish, an officer in their customs, a man who has been here thirteen years, and is so completely become a Portuguese that he is known by no other name than Don John. He was of service to our people, though what he did was so clogged with a suspicious fear of offending the Portuguese, as rendered it disgustful. It is necessary that any one who should come here should know his character, which is mercenary, though contented with a little, as the present given to him demonstrated, which consisted of one dozen of beer, ten galls of brandy, ten pieces of ship's beef, and as many of pork. 
this was what he himself asked for, and sent on warn the keg for the spirit, and with this he was more than satisfied. They have a very extraordinary method of keeping people from travelling, to hinder them, I suppose, from going into any district where gold or diamonds may be found, as there are more of such than they can possibly guard, which is this. There are certain bounds beyond which no man must go. These vary every month at the description of the viceroy. Sometimes there are few, sometimes many leagues round the city. Every man must, in consequence of this, come to town to know where the bounds are, for if he is taken by the guards who constantly patrol on their edges, he is infallibly put in prison, even if he is within them, unless he can tell where they are. The inhabitants here are very numerous. They consist of Portuguese, Negroes, and Indians, Aborigines of the country. The township of Rio, whose extent I could not learn, but was only told that it was but a small part of the Capitania, or province, is said to contain 37,000 whites, and about 17 Negroes to each white, which makes their numbers 629,000, and the number of inhabitants in all, 666,000. As for the Indians, they do not live in this neighborhood, though many of them are always here, doing the king's work, which they are obliged to do by turns for small pay, for which purpose they come from their habitations at a distance. I saw many of them as the guard boat was constantly rowed by them. They are of a light copper color with long lank black hair. As to their policy or manner of living, when at home, I could not learn anything about it. The military here consists of twelve regiments of regulars, six Portuguese, and six Creolians, and as many of provincial militia who may be assembled upon occasion. To the regulars the inhabitants show great deference, for, as Mr. Forster, an English gentleman in their service, told me, if any of the people were not to pull off their hats when they met an officer, he would immediately knock them down, which custom renders the people remarkably civil to strangers, who have at all a gentlemanlike appearance. All the officers of these regiments are expected three times a day to attend at the Sala, or Viceroy's Levy, where they formally ask for commands, where their constant answer is, there is nothing new. This policy is intended, as I have been told, to prevent them from going into the country, which it most effectually does. This town, as well as all others in South America belonging either to Spaniards or Portuguese, has long been infamous for the unchastity of its women. The people who we talked with here confirmed the accounts declaring, especially Mr. Forster, that he did not believe there was one modest woman in the township, which I must own appeared to me a most wonderful assertion, but I must take it for granted, as I have not even the least opportunity to go among them. Dr. Solander, who was ashore, declares, however, that as soon as it was night, the windows were every one furnished with one or more women, who, as he walked along, with two more gentlemen gave nosegays, to whichever of them each preferred, which compliment the gentlemen returned in kind, notwithstanding which each of them threw away whole hatsfuls of flowers in their walk, though it was not a long one. Assassinations are, I fancy, more frequent here than in Lisbon as the church is still to take upon them to give protection to criminals. One accident of the kind happened in the sight of S. Evans, our coxswain, a man who I can depend upon, who told me he saw two people talking together to all appearance in a friendly manner, when one on a sudden drew a knife and stabbed the other twice, and ran away, pursued by some negroes, who saw the fact likewise. But what the farther event of this was, I could not learn. Thus much for the town and its inhabitants. I shall now speak of the country, which I know rather more of than of the other, as I was ashore one whole day. In that time I saw much cleared ground, but chiefly of an indifferent quality, though doubtless there is such as is very good, as the sugar and tobacco which is sent to Europe from hence plainly testifies. But all that I saw was employed in breeding cattle, of which they have great plenty, though their pastures are the worst I ever saw on account of the shortness of the grass, and consequently the beef sold in the market though it is tolerably cheap, is so lean that an Englishman can hardly eat it. I likewise saw great plantations of Eotropha manihot, which is called in the West Indies cassada, and here farina de pau, i.e. wooden meal, a very proper name for the cakes they make with a taste as if they were made of sawdust. And yet it is the only bread which is ate here, for European bread is sold at nearly the rate of a shilling a pound, and is also exceedingly bad on account of the flour which is generally heated in its passage from Europe. The country produces many more articles, but, as I did not see them or hear them mentioned, I shall not set them down, though doubtless it is capable of bringing anything that our West India Islands do. Notwithstanding this, they have neither coffee nor chocolate, 
but import both from Lisbon. Their fruits, however, I must not pass over in silence. They have several. I shall particularly mention those that were in season while we were there, which were pineapples, melons, watermelons, oranges, limes, lemons, sweet lemons, citrons, plantains, bananas, mangoes, mama apples, akaju apples, and nuts, jamburia, another sort which bears a small black fruit, coconuts, palm nuts of two kinds, palm berries. Of these I must separately give my opinion, as no doubt it will seem strange to some that I should assert that I have eaten many of them, and especially pineapples, better in England than any I have met with here. Begin then with the pines as the fruit from which I expected the most, they being, I believe, natives of this country, though I cannot say I have seen or even heard of their being at this time wild anywhere in this neighborhood. They are cultivated much as we do cabbages in Europe, or rather with less care, the plants being set between beds of any kind of garden stuff, and suffered to take their chance. The price of them in the market is seldom above, and generally under, a vintain, which is three halfpence. All that Dr. Solander and myself tasted, we agreed, were much inferior to those we had eat in England, though in general they are more juicy and sweet. Yet they had no flavor, but they were like sugar melted in water. Their melons are still worse from the specimen we had, for we got but one, which was perfectly mealy and insipid. Their watermelons, however, are very good, for they have some little flavor, or at least a degree of acid, which ours have not. Oranges are large and very juicy. We thought them good, doubtless better than any we had tasted at home. But probably Italy and Portugal produce as good had we been there in the time of their being in perfection. Lemons and limes are like ours. Sweet lemons are Swedish and without flavor. Citrons have a sickly faint taste, otherwise are like them. Mangoes were not in perfection, but promised to be a very fine fruit. They are about the size of a peach, full of a melting yellow pulp, not unlike that of a summer peach, which has a very grateful flavor, but in all we had, it was spoiled by a taste of turpentine, which I am told is not found in the ripe ones. Bananas are in shape and size, like a small, thick sausage, covered with a thick yellow rind, which is peeled off, and the fruit within is of a consistence which might be expected from a mixture of butter and flour, but a little slimy. Its taste is sweet, with a little perfume. Plantains differ from these in being longer and thinner, and having less lusciousness in their taste. Both these fruits were disagreeable to most of our people, but after some use I became tolerably fond of them. Akaju, or kasu, is shaped like an apple but larger. He tastes very agreeable, sourish, and bitter. The nut grows at the top of them. Mama apples are bigger than a codlin in England covered with a deep yellow skin. The pulp on the inside is very insipid, or rather disagreeable to the taste, and full of small round seeds covered with a thick mucilage, which continually cloy your mouth. Jamboira is the same as I saw in Madeira, a fruit calculated more to please the smell than the taste. The other sort are small and black and resemble much the taste of our English bulberries. Coconuts are so well known in England that I need only say I have tasted as good there as any I met with here palm nuts of two sorts, one long and shaped like dates, the other round. Both of these are roasted before their kernels are eatable, and even then they are not so good as coconuts. Palm berries appear much like black grapes. They are the fruit of Bactris minor, but for eating have scarcely any pulp covering a very large stone, and what there is has nothing but a light acid to recommend it. Here are also the fruits of several species of prickle pears, which are very insipid. Of European fruits I saw apples, but very mealy and insipid, and one peach, which was also a very bad one. Though this country should produce many and very valuable drugs, we could not find any in the apothecary shops but Parira Brava and Balsam Copivi, of both which we bought at excessive cheap prices, and had very good of the sort. I fancy the drug trade is chiefly carried on to the northward, as is that of the dying woods. At least we could hear nothing of them here. For manufactures, I know of none carried on here, except that of cotton hammocks, which are used for people to be carried about in, as we do sedan chairs. These are made chiefly by the Indians. But the chief riches of the country comes from the mines, which are situated far up in the country. Indeed, no one could tell me how far, for even the situation of them is as carefully as possible concealed, and troops are continually employed in guarding the roads that lead to them, so that it is next to impossible for any man to get a sight of them, except those who are employed there. At least, no man would attempt it from mere curiosity, 
for everybody who is found on the road without being able to give a good account of himself is hanged immediately. From these mines a great quantity of gold certainly comes, but it is purchased at a vast expense of lives. Forty thousand negroes are annually imported on the king's account for this purpose, and notwithstanding that the year before last they died so fast that twenty thousand more were obliged to be drafted from the town of Rio. Precious stones are also found here in very large quantities, so large that they do not allow more than a certain quantity to be collected in a year, which is done thus. A troop of people are sent into the country where they are found and ordered to return when they have collected a certain quantity, which they sometimes do in a month, more or less. Then they return, and after that it is death for anyone to be found in the country on any pretense, whatever, till the next year. Diamonds, topazes of several different qualities, and amethysts are the stones that are chiefly found. Of the first, I did not see any, but was told that the viceroy had, by him, large quantities, and would sell them on the king of Portugal's account, but in that case they would not be at all cheaper than those in Europe. Topazes and amethysts I bought a few of for specimens. The former were divided into three sorts of very different value, called here pingua dogua, qualidad, primero, and segundo, and cristalos o marias. They were sold, large and small, good and bad together by octavos, or the eighth part of an ounce. The first sort, four shillings, nine d. Second sort, four, zero. Third sort, blank. Amethysts, blank, blank, blank. But it was smuggling in the highest degree to have anything to do with them. Formerly, there were jewelers here who worked stones. But about fourteen months ago, orders came from the court of Portugal that no more stones should be wrought here except on his account. The jewelers were immediately ordered to bring all their tools to the viceroy, which they were obliged to do, and from that time to this have not been suffered to do anything for their support. Here are, however, a number of slaves who work stones for the king of Portugal. The coin current here is either that of Portugal, especially thirty-six shell pieces, or coin made here, which is much debased, especially the silver, which are called pitex, of which there are two sorts, one of less value than the other, easily distinguishable by the number of rees marked on the outside, but they are little used. They also have copper coin, like that in Portugal, five and ten ray pieces. Two of the latter are worth three halfpence. Forty pitex are worth thirty-six shillings. The harbour of Rio de Janeiro is certainly a good one. The entrance is not wide, but the sea breeze which blows every morning makes it easy for any ship to go in before the wind, and when you get abreast the town it increases in breadth prodigiously, so that almost any number of ships might lay in five or six fathom water, oozy bottom. It is defended by many works, especially the entrance where it is narrow. There is their strongest fortification called Santa Cruz, and another opposite. There is also a platform mounting about twenty-two guns, without that, just under the sugar loaf on the seaside, but that seems entirely calculated to hinder the landing of an enemy in a sandy bay from whence there is a passage to the back part of the town, which is entirely devoid of defense, except that the whole town is open to the guns of the citadel, San Sebastian, as I said before. Between Santa Cruz and the town are several small batteries of five to ten guns, and one pretty large one called Perca Leon. Immediately before the town is Iljoa dos Cobras, an island fortified all around, which seems incapable of doing much mischief from its immense size. At least it would take more men to defend it even tolerably, in case of an attack, than could possibly be spared from a town totally without lines, or any defense around itself. As for Santa Cruz, their chief fortification, on which they most rely, seems very incapable of being any great resistance, if smartly attacked by shipping. It is a stone fort which mounts many guns indeed, but they lie tier above tier, and are consequently very open to the attack of a ship, which may come within two cable lengths or less of them. Besides, they have no supply of water there, but what they have from a cistern in which they catch rain, or in times of drought, are supplied from the adjacent country. This they have been obliged to build above ground, lest the water should taint by the heat of the climate, which a free access of air prevents. A shot consequently, which fortunately should break that cistern, would reduce the defenders to utmost necessity. I was told by a person who certainly knew, and I believe meant to inform me right, that a little to the southward, just without the south head of the harbour, was a bay in which boats might land with all facility, without an obstruction, as there was no kind of work there and from this bay it is not above three hours' march to the town, 
which you approach on the back part, where it is as defenseless as the landing place. But this seems incredible, yet I am inclined to believe it of these people, whose chief policy consists in hindering people from looking about them as much as possible. It may therefore be as my informer said, that the existence of such a bay is but lately found out. Indeed, was it not for that policy, I could believe anything of their stupidity and ignorance when the governor of the town, Brigadier General Don Pedro de Mendoza y Furtado, asked the captain of our ship whether the transit of Venus, which we were going to observe, was not the passing of the North Star to the South Pole, which he said he always understood it to be. The river, and indeed the whole coast, abounds with a greater variety of fish than I have ever seen. Seldom a day passed in which we had not one or more new species brought to us. Indeed, the bay is the most convenient place for fishing I have ever seen, for it abounds with islands between which there is shallow water and proper beaches for drawing the seine. The sea also, without the bay, is full of dolphins and large mackerel of several sorts, who very readily bite at hooks which the inhabitants tow after their boats for that purpose. In short, the country is capable with a very little industry of producing infinite plenty both of necessaries and luxuries. Was it in the hands of Englishmen, we should soon see its consequence, as things are tolerably plentiful, even under the direction of the Portuguese, who I take to be without exception the laziest, as well as the most ignorant race in the whole world. The climate here is, I fancy, very good. The country certainly is very wholesome. During our stay the thermometer was never above eighty-three. We had, however, a good deal of rain, and once it blew very hard. I'm rather inclined to think that this country has rather more rain than those in the same northern latitude are observed to have, not only from what happened during our short stay, but from Margrave, who gives us meteorological observations on this climate for three years. You may observe that it rained here in those years, almost every other day throughout the year, but more especially in May and June, in which months it rained along without ceasing. 1768, December 8. This morn at daybreak a dolphin was taken, and soon after a shark appeared who took the bait very readily. And during the time that we were playing him under the cabin window, it cast something out of his mouth that either was or appeared very like its stomach. This it threw out and drew in again many times. I've often heard from seamen that they can do it, but never before saw anything like it. This circumstance, which by mistake is attributed to this shark, belongs to one taken the 11th. 1768, December 9. A very heavy swell last night and this morn. We judge that it has blown very hard to the southward, and in this particular think ourselves obliged to the Viceroy of Brazil, who by his dilatoriness in supplying us kept us out of it. The swell, however, carried away our foretop gallant mast. The sea is to take colored with infinite small particles, the same as those seen on November 7th, and laying like them in broad streaks. 1768, December 10. Today also we see large quantities of the same small particles. 1768, December 11. This morn took a shark, who cast up his stomach, when hooked, or at least appeared so to do. It proves to be a female, and on being opened six young ones were taken out of her, five of which were alive, and swam briskly in a tub of water. The sixth was dead, and seemed to have been so for some time. 1768, December 12. Wind fair today, no events. 1768, December 13. Fair wind today likewise, at night a squall, with thunder and lightning, which made us hoist the lightning chain. 1768, December 14. Wind foul, blew fresh all day. In the evening saw a sail standing to the northward. 1768, December 15. Less wind, but a great swell. 1768, December 16. Wind fair. 1768, December 17. Wind foul blew rather fresh, so the ship healed much which made our affairs go rather uncomfortably. 1768, December 18. Calm at night, wind to the northward. We began to feel ourselves rather cool, though the thermometer was at 76, and shut two of the cabin windows, all which had been open ever since we left Madeira. 1768, December 19. Charming fair wind and fine weather. The people were employed in preparing a new suit of sails for the bad weather, we are to expect. Therm, 70. 1768, December 20. Fair wind today and rather warmer than it has been. During the course of last night, we had a very heavy squall, 
which though it did not last above ten minutes, yet in that time blew as hard as it has done since we have been on board the ship. 1768, December 21. Foul wind, and little of it. 1768, December 22. This morn quite calm. A very large shoal of porpoises came close to the ship. They were of a different kind from any I have seen, but so large, that I dared not throw the jig into any of them. Some were four yards long, their heads quite round, but their hinder parts compressed. They had one fin upon their backs, like a porpoise, and white lines over their eyes, also a spot of white behind the fin. They stayed above one half an hour about the ship. When they were gone, Dr. Solander and myself went out in the boat and shot one species of Mother Carey's chickens, and two shearwaters, both proved new, Procellaria gigantea and Sandaliata. The carry was one but ill described by Linnaeus, Procellaria forgata. While we were out, the people were employed in bending the new sails for Cape Horn. 1768, December 23. This morn calm again, went out shooting, killed another new Procellaria, Aquaria, and many of the sorts we had seen yesterday, caught Holotheria angustata, a species of floating helix much smaller than those under the line. Philo doci valella, very small, sometimes not so large as a silver penny. I believe the common species. In the evening went out again, killed an albatross, Diomedea exulans, who measured nine feet one inch between the tips of his wings, and struck one turtle, Testudo caretta. 1768, December 24. Fair wind and steady, though but little of it. 1768, December 25. Christmas Day, all good Christians, that is to say, all hands, get abominably drunk, so that at night there was scarce a sober man in the ship. Wind, thank God, very moderate or load knows what would have become of us. 1768, December 26. Blows fresh today. A vast many birds are about the ship, chiefly procellarias. All that we shot last week, and one or more who is quite black without spot or speck, that can be seen as he flies. Towards even many beds of seaweed came past the ship, which the seamen called rockweed, but none near enough to the ship for us to catch them, though we were constantly prepared. 1768, December 27. Blows strong this evening. At night came two under a balanced mizzen, till daylight, when it grows more moderate. The water has been discolored all day, fifty fathom. All this day I have smelled a singular smell from windward, though the people in the ship did not take notice of it. It was like rotten seaweed, and sometimes very strong. During the whole of the scale we had many procellarias about the ship, at sometimes immense numbers, who seemed perfectly unconcerned at the badness of the weather or the height of the sea, but continued often flapping near the surface of the water as if fishing. 1768, December 28. Less wind. The sea soon falls. The water both yesterday and today has been a good deal discolored, sound, and find forty-eight fathom. 1768, December 29. Fair wind, water very white, sounded forty-six fathom, about four in the even forty-four. We observed now some feathers and pieces of reed to float by the ship, which made us get up the hove net to see what they were. Soon after, some drowned caribbee and phalany came past, which we took and employed the hove till dark night, taking many specimens. Lat forty one forty eight. This morn a large sphinx came off, probably from the land, and was taken. 1768, December 30. This morn fine weather, water whiter than ever, almost a clay color, sounded 47 fathom. Plenty of insects passed by this morn, many especially of the caribbee, alive, some grilli, and one phalena. I stayed in the main chains from eight till twelve, dipping for them with the hove, and took vast numbers. In the evening many felinae and two papilios came flying about the ship. Of the first took about twenty, but the last would not come near enough to be taken, and at last flew away. They appeared large. We have also, both yesterday and today, taken several ichnemons flying about the ridge. All the seamen say that we cannot be less than twenty leagues from the land, but I doubt grilli, especially, coming so far alive, as they must float all the way upon the water. They ground their opinion chiefly on the soundings, which have been all along sand of different colors, which, had we been nearer the land, would have been intermixed with shells. Their experience on this coast must, however, be but slight. This whole day, the evening especially, has been a series of calms and squalls, 
towards night a thunderstorm, in which the lightning was remarkably bright, and ranged in long streaks, sometimes horizontal, and sometimes perpendicular. The thunder was not loud, but continued an imminence, while with a noise in some claps, so like the flapping of sails, that had I not been upon deck, I should not have believed it to be thunder. Just before the storm, we had the appearance of land to the westward, which all who had not been in these latitudes before imagined to be real. It made, like a long extent of lowish land, with two islands to the northward of it. The south end was buried in the clouds. This lasted about half an hour, and then rose gradually up and disappeared. Lat 4231. A sea lion was entered in the logbook of today, as being seen, but I did not see him. I saw, however, a whale covered with barnacles, as the seaman told me. He appeared of a reddish color, except his tail, which was black, like those to the northward. 1768, December 31. No insects seen today. The water changed to a little better color. On looking over those taken yesterday, find 31 species of land insects, all so like in size and shape, to those of England, etc., that they are scarcely distinguishable. Probably some will turn out identically the same. We ran among them 160 miles by the log, without reckoning any part of last night, though they were still seen till dark, and most of this southing. Our latitude made us nearly opposite Bay saint Font, near which place Mr. Dalrymple supposes there to be a passage quite through the continent of America. It should seem by what we have seen that there should be at least a very large river, and that probably at this time much flooded. If even that could have been so great an effect as, supposing us to be twenty leagues from the land, discoloring the water to almost a clay color, and bringing of insects who never fly twenty yards, such as grilli and one Aranea. I lament much not having tasted the water at the time, which never occurred to me, but probably the difference of saltiness would have been hardly perceptible to the taste, and my hydrostatic balance being broke, I had no other method of trying it. End of section 5. December. 1768. Part 1 of Section 6 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August 1768 to 12 July 1771 by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 6. January 1769. 1 January to 17 January. 1769, January 1. New Year's Day today made us pass many comptes and talk much of our hopes for success in the year 69. Many whales were about the ship today and much seaweed in large lumps, but none near enough to be caught. In the evening, rather squally. The true sea green color upon the surface of the water was often to be seen now between the squalls, or rather, under the black clouds when they were about half a mile from the ship. I had often heard of it before, but never seen it in any such perfection. Indeed, most of the seamen said the same. It was very bright, and perfectly like the stone called aquamarine. 1769, January 2. Fresh breezes today. In the evening, lat, about 45.30, met with some small shoals of the red lobsters, which have been seen by almost everyone who has passed these seas. They were, however, so far from coloring the Red Sea, as Dampier and Cowley say, that I may affirm that we never saw more than a few hundreds of them at a time. We took, however, several in the casting and hove nets, and described them by the name of Cancer Gregorus. 1769, January 3. Lat 47, 17. All hands looking out for Pepe's Island. About observing time, an appearance was seen to the westward, so like an island, that we bear away after it, almost assured that it is land as the midshipman at the mast had declared. For half an hour, which time he had steadily looked at it, it did not alter its appearance at all. However, about four, we were convinced that we were in chase of Cape Flyaway, as the seamen call it. No sign of island or anything else appearing where it ought to have been. This evening, many large bunches of seaweed came by the ship. We caught some of it with hooks. It was of an immense size, every leaf four feet long, and the stalk about twelve. The footstalk of each leaf was swelled into a long air vessel. Mr. Gore tells me that he has seen this weed grow quite onto the top of the water in twelve fathom. If so, the swelled footstalks are probably the trumpet grass or weed of the Cape of Good Hope. We described it, however, as it appeared, and called it Fucus giganteus. 
Here were also this evening large quantities of a small bird, somewhat like Mother Carey's chickens, but rather larger and grey on the back, and plenty of albatrosses. Indeed, we have seen more or less of them every day for some time. 1769, January 4. Blew fresh today and night. The officer of the watch told me that in the night the sea was very much illuminated in patches of many yards wide, which appeared of a pale light color. 1769, January 5. Fair wind. The sea very light at night, more so than ever I had seen it, so that the ship's course and every curl of a wave was of a light color. But none of the light patches seen last night were now observed, which were chiefly remarkable as the animals there must have shown without being agitated. In some of the water taken up, observed a small insect of a conical figure, very nimble, who moved himself with a kind of whorl of legs, or tentacula, round the base of the cone. We could not find any Neurides, or indeed any other insect, than this in the water, but were not able to prove that he causes the light, so deferred our observations on him till the morning. 1769, January 6. Blue fresh, foul wind. Forced to throw away the insects taken last night, from the ship having so much motion. The southeast wind now became very cold, to us at least so lately come from the torrid zone. Therm at noon, 48. All hands bend their Magellan jackets, made of a thick woolen stuff allowed them by the government, called Fear Not, and myself put on a flannel jacket and waistcoat, and thick trousers. In the evening blew strong. At night a hard gale. Ship brought two under a mainsail. During the course of this my bureau was overset, and most of the books were about the cabin floor, so that with the noise of the ship working, the books, etc., running about, and the strokes our cots or swinging beds gave against the top and sides of the cabin, we spent a very disagreeable night. We this morn expected to have made Falkland Islands, where we intended to put in for some time, so the missing of them, which we much fear, was a great disappointment to me, as I fear I shall now not have a single opportunity of observing the produce of this part of the world. 1769 January 7. Blew strong, yet the ship still laying too, now for the first time saw some of the birds, called penguins, by the southern navigators. They seem much of the size, and not unlike Alcapica, but they are easily known by the streaks upon their faces, and their remarkably shrill cry, different from any seabird I am acquainted with. We saw also several seals, but much smaller than those which I have seen in Newfoundland, and black. They generally appeared in lively action, leaping out of the water like porpoises, so much so, that some of our people were deceived by them, mistaking them for fish. About noon, weather much more moderate, set the lower sails. Before night, sea quite down, though the wind still stood at southeast. The sea rises and falls quicker in these latitudes than it does about England, which we have observed ever since we came into variable winds, way to the south of the tropics. During this whole gale we observed a vast plenty of birds about us, procellaries of all kinds we have before mentioned, the grey ones of the third of this month, and a kind all black, perhaps Procellaria aquinoctialis, Lynn, but could not discern whether or not their beaks were yellow, and plenty of albatrosses. Indeed, I have generally observed a much greater quantity of birds upon wing, in gales of wind, than in moderate weather, owing perhaps to the tossing of the waves, which must render swimming very uneasy. In this situation they must be oftener seen than when they set on the water." The ship during this gale has shown her excellence in laying to remarkably well, shipping scarce any water, though it blew at times vastly strong. The seamen in general say that they never knew a ship lay to so well as this does, so lively, and at the same time so easy. 1769, January 8. Smooth water and fair wind. Many seals and penguins about the ship. The latter, leaping out of the water and diving instantly, so that a person unused to them might easily be deceived, and take them for fish. Plenty also of albatrosses and whales blowing very near the ship. We were now too sure that we had missed the Falkland Islands, and probably were to the westward of them. The ship has been observed to go much better since her shaking in the last gale of wind. The seamen say that it is a general observation that ships go better for being what they call loosened in their joints. So much so, that in chase, it is often customary to knock down stanchions, etc., and make the ship as loose as possible. 1769, January 9. Clouds to the westward appear so like land this morn that even our first lieutenant, who prided himself on his judgment in this particular, 
was deceived. Wind variable and calmer, many seals and some albatrosses, but none of those whitish birds which we saw in the gale of wind. 1769, January 10. Fine weather. Seals plentiful today, and a kind of birds different from any we have before seen. They were black, and a little larger than pigeons, plump like them, and easily known by their flapping their wings quick as they fly, contrary to the custom of sea birds in general. This evening a shoal of porpoises swam by the ship, different from any I have seen, spotted with large dabs of white and white under the belly, in other respects as swimming etc. like common porpoises, only they leap rather more nimbly, sometimes lifting their whole bodies out of the water. 1769, January 11, Tierra del Fuego sighted. This morning at daybreak saw the land of Tierra del Fuego. By eight o'clock we were well in with it, the weather exceedingly moderate. Its appearance was not near so barren as the writer of Lord Anson's voyage has represented it. The weather exceedingly moderate, so we stood along shore about two leagues off. We could see trees distinctly through our glasses, and observe several smokes, made probably by the natives, as a signal to us. The captain now resolved to put in here, if he can find a convenient harbour, and give us an opportunity of searching a country so entirely new. The hills within land seemed to be high, and on them were many patches of snow, but the sea coast appeared fertile, especially the trees of a bright verdure, except in places exposed to southwest wind, which were distinguishable by their brown appearance. The shore itself sometimes beach and sometimes rock. At four in the evening wind came on shore, so stood off. 1769, January 12. This morn make the land again, soon after it had dropped calm, in which time we took Broi and Crisata, Medusa limpidissima, and Placata and Obligata, Alcyonium angulari, probably the thing that Shevlock mentions in his Voyage Round the World, page 60, Alcyonium frustrum. After dinner a small breeze sprung up, and to our great joy we discovered an opening into the land, and stood in for it, in great hopes of finding a harbour. However, after having ran within a mile of the shore, we were obliged to stand off again, as there was no appearance of shelter, and the wind was on shore. When we were nearest in, we could plainly discover with our glasses spots in which the colour of white and yellow were predominant, which we judged to be flowers. The white were in large clusters, almost everywhere, the yellow in small spots or patches, on the side of a hill covered with a beautiful verdure. The trees could now be distinguished very plainly, and seemed to be thirty or forty feet high, with flat, bushy tops. The trunks in many places were bare, and resembled rocks a good deal, till the glasses cleared up the deception. Among the things taken today, observed Ulva intestinalis and Coralina officinalis. The wind very variable all day. At nine this even the three brothers and Sugarloaf were in sight, and we stood gently along shore in hopes to be at the strait's mouth by the morning. About six this even the gentleman upon deck observed the sugar loaf covered with a cloud for a short time, which left it entirely white. They judged it to have been a fall of snow upon the hill, but as I did not myself see it, I cannot give an opinion. 1769, January 13. This morn at daybreak we were at the strait's mouth, and stood in a little way, but the tide turning against us soon set us out again. At one half past eight again turned in our favour, but soon after wind came foul, so were forced to turn to windward. The wind soon freshening made us pitch most violently, so much that our jib netting was quite under water. At twelve today, lad, fifty-four forty-two. Staten land is much more craggy than Terra del Fuego, though the view of it in Lord Anson's voyage is exaggerated. About four it blew very hard, and the tide turning against us quickly drove us out of the straits the second time. At night less wind, though still southwest stood into the straits the third time, and had another violent pitching bout. The tide turned against us before we were half through so in the morning. 1769, January 14. We found ourselves the third time drove out, wind south-southwest, short sea, and ship pitching most violently. The captain stood into a bay just without Cape St. Vincent, and while the ship plied off and on, Dr. Solander and myself went ashore in the boat and found many plants, about one hundred, though we were not ashore above four hours. Of these, I may say, every one was new, and entirely different from what either of us had before seen. The country about this bay was in general flat. Here is, however, good wood and water, and vast plenty of fowl, and in the cod of the bay a flat covered with grass, where much hay might be made. The bay itself is bad, 
affording but little shelter for shipping, and in many parts of it the bottom rocky and foul. This, however, may be always known in these countries by the beds of Fucus giganteus, which is constantly grown upon the rock, and are not seen on sand or ouse. They are of an immense length. We sounded upon them, and had fourteen fathom water. As they seem to make a very acute angle with the bottom in their situation on the water, it is difficult to guess how long they may be, but probably they are not less than one half longer than the depth of the water, which gives their length to be one hundred and twenty-six feet, a wonderful length for a stalk, not thicker than a man's thumb. Among other things the bay affords, there is plenty of winter spark, easy to be known by its broad leaf, like a laurel, of a light green color and bluish underneath. The bark is easily stripped off with a bone or stick, as ours are barked in England. Its virtues are so well known that I shall say little, except that it may be used as a spice, even in culinary matters, and is found to be very wholesome. Here is also plenty of wild celery, apium antiscorbuticum, scurvy grass, cardamine antiscorbutica, both which are pleasant to the taste, as any herbs of the kind found in Europe, and I believe possess as much virtue in curing the scurvy. The trees here are chiefly of one sort, a kind of birch, Betula antarctica, with very small leaves. It is a light white wood and cleaves very straight. Sometimes the trees are three or four feet in diameter and run thirty or forty feet in the bowl. Possibly they might in cases of necessity supply top masts. Here are also great plenty of cranberries, both red and white, Arbutus rigida. Inhabitants I saw none, but found their huts in two places, once in a thick wood and again close by the beach. They are most unartifically made conical, but open on one side where was the marks of fire, so that probably the fire served them instead of a door. 1769, January 15. Stopped tied this morning in a bay on the Terra del Fuego side of the water, probably Prince Morris's Bay, which served our purpose very well. At ten, tide turned, and we stood out, and by dinner came to an anchor in the Bay of Good Success. Several Indians were in sight near the shore. After dinner went ashore on the starboard side of the bay, near some rocks, which make smooth water and good landing. Before we had walked one hundred yards, many Indians made their appearance, on the other side of the bay, at the end of a sandy beach which makes the bottom of the bay. But on seeing our numbers to be ten or twelve, they retreated. Dr. Solander and myself then walked forward one hundred yards before the rest, and two of the Indians advanced also, and set themselves down about fifty yards from their companions. As soon as we came up, they rose, and each of them threw a stick he had in his hand, away from him and us, a token no doubt of peace. They then walked briskly toward the other party, and waved to us to follow, which we did, and were received with many uncouth signs of friendship. We distributed among them a number of beads and ribbons, which we had brought ashore for that purpose, at which they seemed mightily pleased. So much so, that when we embarked again aboard our boat, three of them came with us, and went aboard the ship. Of these, one seemed to be a priest or conjurer, or at least we thought him to be one by the noises he made, possibly exercising every part of the ship he came into, for when anything new caught his attention, he shouted as loud as he could for some minutes, without directing his speech either to us or to any one of his countrymen. They eat bread and beef, which we gave them, though not heartily, but carried the largest part away with them. They would not drink either wine or spirits, but returned the glass, though not before they had put it to their mouths, and tasted a drop. We conducted them through the greatest part of the ship, and they looked at everything without any marks of extraordinary admiration, unless the noise which our conjurer did not fail to repeat at every new thing he saw might be reckoned as such. After having been aboard about two hours, they expressed a desire of going ashore, and a boat was ordered to carry them. I went with them and landed them among their countrymen but I cannot say that I observed either the one party curious to ask questions, or the other to relate what they had seen, or what usage they had met with. So after having stayed ashore about half an hour, I returned to the ship, and the Indians immediately marched off from the shore. 1769, January 16. This morn very early, Dr. Solander and myself with our servants, and two seamen, to assist in carrying baggage, accompanied by Messrs. Monkhouse and Green, set out from the ship to try to penetrate into the country as far as we could, and, if possible, gain the tops of the hills, for alone we saw places not overgrown with trees. We began to enter the woods at a small sandy beach a little to the westward of the watering place, 
and continued pressing through pathless thickets, always going uphill, till three o'clock before we gained even a near view of the places we intended to go to. The weather had all this time been vastly fine, much like a sunshiny day in May, so that neither heat nor cold was troublesome to us, nor were there any insects to molest us, which made me think the travelling much better than what I had before met with in Newfoundland. Soon after we saw the plains we arrived at them, but found to our great disappointment that what we took for a swathe was no better than low bushes of birch about reaching a man's middle. These were so stubborn that they could not be bent out of the way, but at every step the leg must be lifted over them, and on being placed again on the ground was almost sure to sink above the ankles in bog. No travelling could possibly be worse than this, which seemed to last about a mile, beyond which we expected to meet with bare rock, for such we had seen from the tops of the lower hills as we came. This I particularly was infinitely eager to arrive at, expecting there to find the alpine plants of a country so curious. Our people, though rather fatigued, were yet in good spirits, so we pushed on intending to rest ourselves as soon as we could arrive at plain ground. We proceeded two-thirds of the way without the least difficulty, and I confess I thought for my own part that all difficulties were surmounted when Mr. Buchan fell into a fit. A fire was immediately lit for him, and with him all those who were most tired remained behind, while Dr. Solander, Mr. Green, Mr. Monkhouse, and myself advanced for the Alp, which we reached almost immediately, and found, according to expectation, plants, which answered to those we had found before, as alpine ones in Europe, due to those which we find in the plains. The air was here very cold, and we had frequent snow blasts. I had now entirely given over all thoughts of reaching the ship that night, and thought of nothing but getting into the thick of the wood and making a fire, which as our road lay all downhill seemed very easy to accomplish. So Messrs. Green and Monkhouse returned to the people, and appointed a hill for our general rendezvous, from whence we should proceed, and build our wigwam. The cold now increased apace. It might be near eight o'clock, though yet exceedingly good daylight, so we proceeded for the nearest valley, where the short birch, the only thing we now dreaded, could not be a half a mile over. Our people seemed well, though cold, and Mr. Buchan was stronger than we could have expected. I undertook to bring up the rear, and see that no one was left behind. We passed about halfway very well, when the cold seemed to have at once an effect infinitely beyond what I ever experienced. Dr. Solander was the first who felt it. He said he could not go any farther but must lay down, though the ground was covered with snow, and down he laid, notwithstanding all I could say to the contrary. Richmond, a black servant, now began also to lag, and was much in the same way as the doctor. At this juncture I dispatched five forwards, of whom Mr. Buchan was one, to make ready a fire at the very first convenient place they could find, while myself with four more stayed behind to persuade, if possible, the doctor and Richmond to come on. With much persuasion and entreaty, we got through much the largest part of the birch, when they both gave out. Richmond said that he could not go any farther, and when told that if he did not he must be froze to death, only answered that there he would lay and die. The doctor, on the contrary, said that he must sleep a little before he could go on, and actually did a full quarter of an hour, at which time we had the welcome news of a fire being lit, about a quarter of a mile ahead. I then undertook to make the doctor proceed to it, finding it impossible to make Richmond stir, left two hands with him, who seemed the least affected with cold, promising to send two to relieve them as soon as I should reach the fire. With much difficulty I got the doctor to it, and as soon as two people were sufficiently warmed, sent them out in hopes that they would bring Richmond and the rest. After staying about half an hour, they returned bringing word that they had been all round the place shouting and hallowing, but could not get any answer. We now guessed the cause of the mischief, a bottle of rum. The whole of our stock was missing, and we soon concluded that it was in one of their knapsacks, and that the two who were left in health had drank immoderately of it, and had slept like the other. For two hours now it had snowed almost incessantly, so we had little hopes of seeing any of the three alive. About twelve, however, to our great joy, we heard a shouting, on which myself and four more went out immediately, and found it to be the seaman, who had waked almost starved to death, and come a little way from where he lay. Him I sent back to the fire and proceeded by his direction to find the other two. Richmond was upon his legs, but not able to walk. The other lay on the ground as insensible as a stone. We immediately called all hands from the fire, and attempted by all the means we could contrive to bring them down, but finding it absolutely impossible. 
The road was so bad and the night so dark that we could scarcely ourselves get on, nor did we without many falls. We would then have lit a fire upon the spot, but the snow on the ground, as well as that which continually fell, rendered that as impracticable as the other, and to bring fire from the other place was also impossible, from the quantity of snow which fell every moment from the branches of the trees. So we were forced to content ourselves with laying out our unfortunate companions upon a bed of boughs, and covering them over with boughs, also as thick as we were able, and thus we left them hopeless of ever seeing them again alive, which indeed we never did. In these employments we had spent an hour and a half, exposed to the most penetrating cold I ever felt, as well as continual snow. Peter Briscoe, another servant of mine, began now to complain, and before we came to the fire became very ill, but got there at last, almost did with cold. Now might our situation truly be called terrible. Of twelve, our original number two were already past all hopes. One more was so ill, that though he was with us, I had little hopes of his being able to walk in the morning and another very likely to relapse into his fits, either before we set out, or in the course of our journey. We were distant from the ship. We did not know how far. We knew only that we had been the greatest part of a day in walking through pathless woods. Provision we had none but one vulture, which had been shot while we were out, and at the shortest allowance could not furnish half a meal. And to complete our misfortunes, we were caught in a snowstorm, in a climate we were utterly unacquainted with, but which we had reason to believe was as inhospitable as any in the world, not only from all the accounts we have heard or read, but from the quantity of snow which we saw falling, though it was very little after midsummer, a circumstance unheard of in Europe, for even in Norway or Lapland, snow is never known to fall in the summer. 1769, January 17. The morning now dawned and showed us the earth covered with snow, as well as all the tops of the trees. Nor were the snow squalls at all less frequent, for seldom many minutes were fair together. We had no hopes now but of staying here as long as the snow lasted, and how long that would be God alone knew. About six o'clock the sun came out a little, and we immediately thought of sending to see whether the poor wretches we had been so anxious about last night were yet alive. Three of our people went, but soon returned with the melancholy news of their being both dead. The snow continued to fall, though not quite so thick as it had done, about eight a small breeze of wind sprung up, and with the additional power of the sun began, to our great joy, to clear the air, and soon after we saw the snow begin to fall from the tops of the trees, a sure sign of an approaching thaw. Peter continued very ill, but said he thought himself able to walk. Mr. Buchan, thank God, was much better than I could have expected, so we agreed to dress our vulture, and prepare ourselves to set out for the ship, as soon as the snow should be a little more gone off. So he was skinned and cut into ten equal shares, every man cooking his own share, which furnished about three mouthsful of hot meat, all the freshmen we had had since our cold dinner yesterday, and all we were to expect till we should come to the ship. About ten we set out, and after a march of about three hours, arrived at the beach, fortunate in having met with much better roads in our return than we did in going out, as well as in being nearer to the ship than we had any reason to hope. For on reviewing our track, as well as we could from the ship, we found that we had made a half circle round the hills, instead of penetrating, as we thought we had done, into the inner part of the country. With what pleasure, then, did we congratulate each other on our safety? No one can tell who has not been in such circumstances. End of Part 1 of Section 6 January 1 to January 17, 1769「Seven of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August, 1768 to 12 July, 1771. By Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 7. January, 1769, Part 2. 1769, January 18. Peter was very ill today, and Mr. Buchan not at all well. The rest of us thank God in good health, though not yet recovered from our fatigue. It blew fresh without, and made such a heaving swell in the bay, that no one could go ashore, and even the ship was very uncomfortable, rolling so much that one could scarcely stand without holding. 1769, January 19. The swell still continued, and we were again hindered from going ashore, though the loss of two days out of the short time we had to stay here made the doctor and myself ready to venture any risk. 
the officer who was sent to attempt landing returned bringing word that it was absolutely impossible without great danger of staving the boat if even that would do both yesterday and today a good deal of snow fell in squalls seventeen sixty nine january twenty last night the weather began to moderate and this morn was very fine so much so that we landed without any difficulty in the bottom of the bay and spent our time very much to our satisfaction in collecting shells and plants of the former we found some very scarce and very fine limpets of several species of these we observed as well as the shortness of our time would permit that the limpet with a longish hole at the top of his shell is inhabited by an animal very different from those which have no such holes here were also some fine whelks one particularly with a long tooth and infinite variety of lepades circularias onisci etc 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 much greater than i have seen anywhere but the shortness of our time would not allow us to examine them so we were obliged to content ourselves with taking specimens of as many of them as we could in so short a time scraped together we returned on board to dinner and afterwards went into the country about two miles to see an indian town which some of our people had given us intelligence of we arrived at it in about an hour walking through a path which i suppose was their common road though it was sometimes up to our knees in mud the town itself was situate upon a dry knoll among the trees which were not at all cleared away it consisted of not more than twelve or fourteen huts or wigwams of the most unartificial construction imaginable indeed no thing bearing the name of a hut could possibly be built with less trouble they consisted of a few poles set up and meeting together at the top in a conical figure these were covered on the weather side with a few boughs and a little grass on the lee side about one-eighth part of the circle was left open and against this opening was a fire made furniture i may justly say they had none a little very little dried grass laid round the edges of the circle furnished both beds and chairs and for dressing their shellfish the only provision i saw them make use of they had no one contrivance but broiling them upon the coals for drinking indeed i saw in a corner of one of their huts a bladder of some beast full of water in one side of this near the top was a hole through which they drank by elevating a little the bottom which made the water spring up into their mouths in these few huts and with this small share or rather none at all of what we call the necessaries and conveniences of life lived about fifty men women and children to all appearance contented with what they had nor wishing for anything we could give them except beads of these they were very fond preferring ornamental things to those which might be of real use and giving more in exchange for a string of beads than they would for a knife or a hatchet as this is to be the last time of our going ashore on this island i take this opportunity to give an account of such things the shortness of my stay allowed me to observe notwithstanding almost all writers who have mentioned this island have imputed to it a want of wood soon after we first saw it even at the distance of some leagues we plainly distinguished that the largest part of the country particularly near the sea coast was covered with wood which observation was verified in both the bays we put into in either of which firing might have been got close by the beach in any quantity and some trees which to all appearance might be fit for repairing a vessel or even in case of necessity to make masts the hills are high though not to be called mountains the tops of these however are quite bare and on them frequent patches of snow were to be seen though the time of the year when we were there answered to the beginning of july in england in the valleys between these the soil has much the appearance of fruitfulness and is in some places of a considerable depth at the bottom of almost every one of these runs a brook the water of which in general has a reddish cast like that which runs through turf bogs in england but is very well tasted quadrupeds i saw none in the island except the seals and sea lions which we often saw swimming about in the bay might be called such but Dr. Solander and myself, when we were on top of the highest hill we were upon, observed the footsteps of a large beast imprinted on the surface of a bog, but could not with any probability guess of what kind it might be. Land birds there are very few. I saw none larger than an English blackbird except hawks and a vulture, but waterfowl are much more plentiful. In the first bay we were in, I might have shot any quantity of ducks or geese, but would not spare the time from gathering plants. In the other we shot some, but probably the Indians in the neighborhood had made them shy, as well as less plentiful, at least so we found them. Fish we saw few, nor could with our hooks take any fit to eat. Shellfish, however, are in the greatest abundance, limpets, mussels, clams, etc. None of them delicate, yet such as they were, we did not despise them. 
Insects there were very few, and not one species either hurtful or troublesome. All the time we have been here, we have seen neither gnat nor mosquito, a circumstance which few, if any, uncleared country, but this can boast of. Of plants, here are many species, and those truly the most extraordinary I can imagine. In stature and appearance, they agree a good deal with the European ones, only in general are less specious, white flowers being much more common among them than any other colors. But to speak of them botanically, probably no botanist has ever enjoyed more pleasure in the contemplation of his favorite pursuit than Dr. Solander and myself among these plants. We have not yet examined many of them, but what we have have turned out in general so entirely different from any before described, that we were never tired with wondering at the infinite variety of creation, and admiring the infinite care with which Providence has multiplied his productions, suiting them no doubt to the various climates for which they are designed. Trees here are very few. Birch, Betula Antarctica, Beech, Vagus Antarcticus, Winter's Bark, Winterana Aromatica. The first two, for timber, the other for its excellent aromatic bark, so much valued by physicians, are all worth mentioning. And of plants we could not ascertain the virtues not being able to conserve with the Indians, who may have experienced them. But the scurvy grass, cardamine antiscorbutica, and the wild celery, apium antarcticum, may easily be known to contain antiscorbutic virtues, capable of being of great service to ships, who may in futurity touch here. Of these two, therefore, I shall give a short description. Scurvy grass is found plentifully in damp places near springs, in general everywhere near the beach, especially at the watering place in the Bay of Good Success. When young, and in its greatest perfection, it lays flat on the ground, having many bright green leaves standing in pairs opposite each other, with an odd one at the end, which makes, in general, the fifth on a foot stalk. After this it shoots up in stalks, sometimes two feet high, at the top of which are small white blossoms, which are succeeded by long pods. The whole plant much resembles that that is called lady's smock or cuckold flower in England, only that the flowers are much smaller. Wild celery resembles much the celery in our gardens, only that the leaves are of a deeper green. The flowers like it, stand in small tufts at the tops of the branches and are white. It grows plentifully near the beach, generally in the first soil, which is above spring tides, and is not easily mistaken as the taste resembles celery or parsley, or rather is between. Both these herbs we used plentifully, while we stayed here putting them in our soup, etc., and found the benefit from them which semen in general find from vegetable diet, after having been long deprived of it. The inhabitants we saw here seemed to be one small tribe of Indians, consisting of not more than fifty of all ages and sexes. They are of a reddish color, nearly resembling that of rusty iron mixed with oil. The men large built, but very clumsy. Their height from five foot eight to five foot ten, nearly and all very much of the same size. The women much less, seldom exceeding five feet. Their clothes are no more than a kind of cloak of guanaco or sealskin, thrown loose over their shoulders, and reaching down nearly to their knees. Under this they have nothing at all, nor anything to cover their feet, except a few of them had shoes of raw seal hide, drawn loosely around their instep, like a purse. In this dress there is no distinction between men and women, except that the latter have their cloak tied round their middle, with a kind of belt or thong, and a small flap of leather hanging like Eve's fig leaf, over those parts which nature teaches them to hide, which precept, though she has taught to them, she seems entirely to have omitted with the men, for they continually expose those parts to the view of strangers, with a carelessness which thoroughly proves them to have no regard to that kind of decency. Their ornaments, of which they are extremely fond, consist of necklaces, or rather solitaires, of shells and bracelets which the women wear both on their wrists and legs, the men only on their wrists. But to compensate for the want of the other, they have a kind of wreath of brown worsted which they wear over their foreheads, so that in reality they are more ornamented than the women. They paint their faces generally in horizontal lines, just under their eyes, and sometimes make the whole region of their eye white. But these marks are so much varied that no two we saw were alike, whether as marks of distinction or mere ornaments, I could not at all make out. They seem also to paint themselves with something like a mixture of grease and soot for particular occasions, as when we went to their town there came two out to meet us who were daubed with black lines, all manner of ways, so as to form the most diabolical countenance imaginable, and these two seemed to exercise us, or at least made a loud and long harangue 
which did not seem to be addressed either to us or any of their countrymen. Their language is guttural, especially in some particular words which they seem to express, much as an Englishman when he hawks to clear his throat. But they have many words that sound soft enough. During our stay among them I could learn but two of their words, nalaka, which signified beads, at least so they always said when they wanted them instead of ribbons or other trifles, which I offered them, an ouda, which signified water, or so they said when we took them ashore from the ship, and by signs asked where water was. Ouda was their answer, making the sign of drinking and pointing to our casks, as well as to the place where we put them ashore, and found plenty of water. Of civil government I saw no signs. No one seemed to be more respected than another, nor did I ever see the least appearance of quarrelling or words between any two of them. Religion also they seemed to be without, unless those people who made strange noises that I have mentioned before were priests or exorcists, which opinion is merely conjectural. Their food, at least what we saw them make use of, was either seals or shellfish. How they took the former we never saw, but the latter were collected by the women, whose business it seemed to be to attend at low water, with a basket in one hand, a stick with a point and barb on the other, and a satchel on their backs, which they filled with shellfish, loosening the limpets with a stick and putting them into the basket, which when full was emptied into the satchel. Their arms consisted of bows and arrows, the former neatly enough made, the latter neater than I have ever seen, polished to the highest degree, and headed either with glass or flint very neatly. But this was the only thing they had, and the only thing they seemed to take any pains about. Their houses, which I have described before, are the most miserable ones imaginable, and furniture they have none. That these people have before had intercourse with Europeans was very plain, for many instances. First, from the European commodities of which we saw sailcloth, brown woolen cloth, beads, nails, glass, etc. And of them especially the last, which they used for pointing their arrows, a considerable quantity. From the confidence they immediately put in us at our first meeting, though well acquainted with our superiority, and from the knowledge they had of the use of our guns, which they very soon showed, making signs to me to shoot a seal who was following us in the boat which carried them ashore from the ship. They probably travel and stay but a short time at a place, so at least it should seem, from the badness of their houses, which seemed entirely built to stand but for a short time, from their having no kind of household furniture but what has a handle adapted to it, either to be carried in the hand or on the back, from the thinness of their clothing, which seems little calculated even to bear the summers of this country, much less the winters, from their food of shellfish, which must soon be exhausted at any one place, and from the deserted huts we saw in the first bay we came to, where people had plainly been but a short time before, probably this spring. Boats they had none with them, but as they were not seasick or particularly affected when they came on board our ship, possibly they might be left at some bay or inlet, which passes partly, but not all the way, through this island, from the Straits of Magellan, from which place I should be much inclined to believe these people have come as so few ships before us have anchored on any part of Tierra del Fuego. Their dogs, which I forgot to mention, seem also to indicate a commerce had some time or other with Europeans, they being all of the kind that bark, contrary to what has been observed of, I believe, all dogs native to America. The weather here has been very uncertain, though in general extremely bad. Every day since the first, more or less snow has fallen, and yet the glass has never been below thirty-eight. Unseasonable as this weather seems to be in the middle of summer, I am inclined to think it is generally so here, for none of the plants appear at all affected by it, and the insects, who hide themselves during the time a snow blast lasts, are the instant it is fair again as lively and nimble as the finest weather could make them. 1769, January 21. Sailed this morn. The wind foul, but our keeping boxes being full of new plants, we little regarded any wind, provided it was but moderate enough to let the draughtsmen work, who, to do them justice, are now so used to the sea that it must blow a gale of wind before they leave off. 1769, January 22. Weather pleasant, but a little cold wind, came to the northward, and we get a little westing. 1769, January 23. At daybreak this morn, there was land almost around us, which we judged to be Tierra del Fuego, not far from the straits, and attributed the little way we had made to the strength of the current, setting us to the eastward. Our old friend the sugar loaf was now in sight, who seemed to have followed us, for he was certainly much nearer to us now than he was when we saw him last on the other side of these straits. 1769, January 24. 
many islands about us today, weather very moderate. One of the islands was surrounded by small pointed rocks, standing out of the water like the needles. Ever since we left the straits, the albatrosses that have flown about the ship have either been or appeared much larger than those seen before we entered them. But the weather has never been moderate enough to give us an opportunity of getting out a boat to shoot any of them. 1769 January 25. Wind today northwest. Stood in with some islands, which were large. We could not tell for certain whether we saw any part of the main. The little island mentioned yesterday was in view, and beyond that the land made in a bluff head, within which another appeared, though but faintly, which was farther to the southward. Possibly that might be Cape Horn, but a fog which overcast it almost immediately after we saw it hindered our making any material observations upon it. So all we can say is that it was the southernmost land that we saw, and does not ill answer to the description of Cape Horn given by the French, who placed it upon an island and say that it is composed of two bluff headlands, v. Naviga au terre astral, tome 1, page 356. 1769, January 26. Weather vastly moderate today. Wind foul, so we were sorry that we had ran away from the land last night. 1769, January 27. Wind came to the northward, and we got some little westing. Possibly today we were to the westward of the Cape. At least a great swell from the northwest makes it certain that we are to the southward of it. Many large albatrosses, de exulans, were about the ship, whose backs were very white. At noon a shag, Pelicanus antarcticus, came on board the ship and was taken. Soon after dinner saw an island to the northward, possibly Diego Ramirez. 1769 January 28. Pleasant breezes, but a heavy swell from north-northwest continued, and made it very likely we were past the Cape, though we had made but little westing. 1769 January 29. Wind still foul and swell continued. Today at noon, lat 59.00. 1769, January 30. At noon today, lat 60.04. Near calm. Almost all navigators have met with easterly winds in this latitude, so we were in hopes to do the same. Towards even, wind got to the southward. 1769, January 31. Wind southeast. Stood to the westward with very fine weather. End of section 7. Part 2. January 1769. Section 8 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August 1768 to 12 July 1771 by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 8. February 1769. 1769, February 1. Calm this morn. Went out in the boat and killed Diomedia Antarctica, Procellaria Antarctica, and Turter. Diomedia Antarctica, the black-billed albatross, is much like the common but differs from him in being scarce half as large and having a bill entirely black. Procellaria lugans, the southern shearwater, differs from the common one in being less and darker colored on the back, but is easily distinguished by his flight which is heavy and two fascia or streaks of white under his wings, which are very conspicuous when he flies. Procellaria turter, mother carries dove, is of the petrel kind, about the size of a barbary dove, of a light silvery blue upon the back, which shines beautifully as he flies, which he does very swiftly, keeping generally near the surface of the water. More or less of these birds have been seen very often since we left the latitude of Falklands Islands, where in a gale of wind we saw immense quantities of them. 1769, February 2. This morn calm and foggy, much like the weather on the banks of Newfoundland. After dinner went in the boat and shot Procellaria fuliginosa, Turter, Gigantia, and Fergata. I saw also a small bird not larger than a blackbird, who flew quick, flapping his wings like a partridge, but was not able to get a shot at him. Probably he was of the Alca tribe. 1769, February 3. Calm again went out and shoot Diomedea excellens albatross, or Alcatraz, differing from those seen to the northward of Straits of La Mer, in being much larger and quite often white on the back between the wings, though certainly the same species. Diomedea antarctica, lesser black-billed albatross, Diomedea profuga, lesser albatross with a party-colored bill, differing from the last in few things, except the bill 
the upper and under sides of which were yellow, and between them black, and Procellaria vagabunda. Thermometer 41. 1769 February 4. Blue brisk today. Made some northing and westing. We now began to account ourselves certainly past the Cape, and the captain, as in his orders was recommended, resolved to stand as far to the westward as the winds will allow him to do. Two crabs were taken today in the clothes that hang overboard to tow. I had been unwell these three or four days, and today was obliged to keep the cabin with a bilious attack, which, though quite slight, alarmed me a good deal, as Captain Wallace had, in the Straits of Magellan, such an attack which he never got the better of throughout the whole voyage. 1769, February 5. All but calm today. Myself a little better than yesterday. Well enough to eat part of the albatrosses shot on the third, which were so good that everybody commended and eat heartily of them, though there was fresh pork upon the table. The way of dressing them is thus. Skin them overnight and soak their carcasses in salt water till morn. Then parboil them and throw away the water. Then stew them well with very little water, and when sufficiently tender serve them up with savoury sauce. 1769 February 6. Foul wind. Myself something better. 1769 February 7. Myself better again. In the evening ship made a little westing. 1769 February 8. Fair wind. Blew fresh. 1769 February 9. Blew fresh all last night, which has given us a good deal of westing. This morn some seaweed floated past the ship, and my servant declares that he saw a large beetle fly over her. I do not believe he would deceive me, and he certainly knows what a beetle is, as he has these three years been often employed in taking them for me. 1769, February 10. During all last night the ship has pitched very much, so that there has been no sleeping for landmen. Today misty with little wind. 1769, February 11. Fair wind. Stand to the westward. 1769, February 12. Foul wind, but prodigious fine weather, and smooth water makes amends to us at least. 1769, February 13. Wind still foul and blew fresh. At night, a little mended. 1769, February 14. Wind south. Water soon became smooth. At night, little wind. 1769, February 15. Calm this morn. Went in the boat and killed Procellaria velox, Nectris munda, and Fuliginosa which last two are a new genus between Procellaria and Diomedia. This we reckon a great acquisition to our bird collection. My stay out today was much shortened by a breeze of wind, which brought me aboard by eleven o'clock, and before night blew very fresh. 1769, February 16. All last night and this morn it has blown very fresh, wind south, so that we have three reefs in the topsails for the first time since we left the Straits of La Mer. 1769, February 17. Blew fresh yet, and wind stood, so we went well to the westward. In the evening, more moderate. I ventured upon deck for the first time, and saw several porpoises, without any pinnadorsalis, black on the backs, under the belly, and on the noses white. Also, a kind of albatross different from any I have seen, he being black all over except the head and bill, which were white. 1769, February 18. Fair weather, ship stood northwest. 1769, February 19. Went very slowly through the water, though pleasantly, for the ship had scarcely any motion. 1769, February 20. Wind still foul, but very moderate, and the ship almost without motion. 1769, February 21. Still no swell from the west, though the ship had fresh way through the water. A bird not seen before attended the ship, about the size of a pigeon, black above and light-colored underneath darting swiftly along the surface of the water, in the same manner as I have observed the nectaris to do, of which genus he is probably a species. 1769, February 22. This morn settled rain and scarce any wind. The whole evening small puffs of wind and rain and calms succeeded each other. 1769, February 23. Calm. Went out in the boat. Shot Procellary Velox, Fuliginosa, and Vilificans. At night, wind came to the east, though very little of it. It was, however, a matter of comfort to have any, as we have not had the name of East in the wind since 31st of January. 1769, February 24. At twelve last night, the wind settled at northeast. This morn found studding sails set, and the ship going at a rate of seven knots. No very usual thing with Mrs. Endeavour. 1769, February 25. 
almost calm, so that we trembled for the continuance of our east wind, and soon after noon it left us, at night rain and dirty weather, wind north. 1769, February 26. Blew fresh, before dinner handed all topsails. Albatrosses began to be much less plentiful than they had been. Latitude 41.8. 1769, February 27. Moderate and fine. The weather began to feel soft and comfortable, like the spring in England. 1769, February 28. Weather fine with a pleasant breeze. In the evening a great many porpoises, of a very large size, came about the ship. They differed from any I have seen before in being very large, in having their back fins a great deal higher in proportion, and in every one having a white spot on each side of his face, as large as the crown of a hat, but of an oval shape. End of section 8. February 1769. Section 9 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August 1768 to 12 July 1771 by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 9. March 1769. 1769 March 1. Fine weather and very pleasant. Began the new month by pulling off an under waistcoat. 1769 March 2. Rather squally this morn, and had been so all night. It did not, however, blow up to a gale, though the ship had a good deal of motion. Indeed, I begin to hope that we were now so near the peaceful part of the Pacific Ocean that we may almost cease to fear any more gales. 1769, March 3. Calm. Went in the boat and killed Procellaria velox, two volificans, three sordida, four melanopus, five lugans, agilis, and diomedia exulans. The albatross very brown, exactly the same as the first I killed, which, if I mistake not, was nearly in the same latitude on the other side of the continent. Caught Holotheria obtusata, Philodoce valella, exactly the same as those taken on the other side of the continent, except in size, which in these did not exceed that of an English sixpence. Also, Dagus vitria, the same as that taken off Rio de Janeiro. Now, however, we had an opportunity of seeing its extraordinary manner of reading, which is better to be understood from the drawing than any description I can give. Suffice it, therefore, to say that the whole progeny, fifteen or twenty in number, hung in a chain from one end of the mother, the oldest only, or the largest, adhering to her, and rest to each other. While in the boat among a large quantity of birds I had killed, sixty-nine in all, caught two hippoboscus forest flies, both of one species different from any described. More than probably these belonged to the birds, and came off with them from the land. I found also this day a large sepia cuttlefish, laying on the water, just dead, so pulled to pieces by the birds that his species could not be determined. Only this I know that of him was made one of the best soups I ever eat. He was very large, differed from the Europeans, in that his arms, instead of being, like them, furnished with suckers, were armed with a double row of very sharp talons, resembling in shape those of a cat and like them retractable into a sheath of skin, from whence they might be thrust at pleasure. The weather has now become pleasantly warm, and the barnacles upon the ship's bottom seem to be regenerate. Very few only of the old ones remain alive, but young ones, without number, scarce bigger than lentils. 1769, March 4. Fine weather. The ship goes five knots without rowling or pitching, which she has not done this great while. This we attribute to the empty water casks in the fore hold, having been filled with salt water yesterday. There were several bonitos about the ship, or at least fish something like them. 1769, March 5. Fine weather, but foul wind. It now begins to be very hot, therm 70, and damp, with prodigious dews at night greater than any I have felt. This renews our uncomfortably damp situation, everything beginning to mold, as it did about the equinoctial line in the Atlantic. 1769, March 6. Weather, wind, and heat continued. Due to night as strong as ever. 1769, March 7. Wind, weather, heat, and dew as yesterday. No albatrosses have been seen since the 4th, and for some days before that we had only now and then a single one in sight, so conclude we have parted with them for good and all. 1769, March 8. Rains today with uncommonly large and heavy drops, accompanied with calms and small puffs of wind, all around the compass. 
In the evening a southeast wind took the ship aback, and before night blew brisk. 1769, March 9. Fine weather, wind right aft. A tropic bird was seen by some of the people, but myself did not see him. 1769, March 10. Fine weather continued, wind aft, and very pleasant. 1769, March 11. Wind and weather much the same as yesterday. Though it had blown a steady breeze of wind these three days, no sea at all was up, from whence we began to conclude that we passed the line drawn between the Great South Sea and the Pacific Ocean by the Council of the Royal Society. Notwithstanding, we are not yet within the tropics. 1769, March 12. Wind continued fair, but in the even flagged a little. We began to imagine that it must be the trade, at least if it continues we resolved to call it so. 1769, March 13. Almost calm today, though not quite enough for going out in the boat. I saw a tropic bird for the first time hovering over the ship, but flying very high. If my eyes did not deceive me, it differed from that described by Linnaeus, Phaeton Aetherius, in having the long feathers of his tail red and his chrism black. Towards even set the servants to work with a dipping net, who took Mimis Volutator and Philodoci Galella, both exactly the same as those we have seen in the Atlantic Ocean. Lat, 30.45, Long, 126.23.45. 1769, March 14. Very light winds today shifting from the south to east. At noon, an alarm of land being seen, which proved at night to be no more than a fog bank though it certainly remained many hours without any change in its appearance. The tropic birds this evening made a noise as they flew over the ship, not unlike some gulls. 1769, March 15. All but calm all this day. Many tropic birds were about the ship. The sea today was remarkably quiet, so that the ship had little or no motion. This night happened an occultation of Saturn by the moon, which Mr. Green observed, but was unlucky in having the weather so cloudy that the observation was good for little or nothing. 1769, March 16. Calm almost, but the ship stole through this remarkably smooth water, so that I do not think it worth while to have a boat hoisted out. By observation today, they find that she has gone these two days much faster than the log, which they tell me is very often the case in light winds when the ship goes before them. Our water, which was taken aboard at Terra del Fuego, has remained till this time perfectly good, without the least change. An instance which I am told is very rare, especially as in our case, when water is brought from a cold climate into a hot one. This, however, has stood it without any damage, and now drinks as brisk and pleasant as when first taken on board, or better, for the red color it had at first is subsided, and it is now as clear as any English spring water. 1769, March 17. Most of this day, as yesterday, almost calm. At night, a small breeze came on from east-northeast, so that the ship went four knots. 1769, March 18. Squally weather all night, with heavy rain. This morn much the same, the rain so heavy that the cabin was twice bailed of more than a bucketful at a time, all of which came in at the crevices of the weather quarter window, for there was no leak of any consequence in any other part of the cabin. The wind was at north, and brought with it a hot, damp air which affected, I may safely say, every man in the ship, more or less. Towards even, however, it shifted towards the west, and was much drier. 1769, March 19. Pleasant breeze. Ship went north by west. Some flying fish were seen this morn, and several prosilarias, chiefly of the brown sorts, as sordida. 1769, March 20. Very fine as yesterday. Many tropic birds were about the ship, as indeed there has been every day since I first mentioned them but still more of them as the weather was finer. When I look on the charts of these seas and see our course, which has been near a straight one at northwest since we left Cape Horn, I cannot help wondering that we have not yet seen land. It is, however, some pleasure to be able to disprove that which does not exist but in the opinions of theoretical writers, of which sort most are who have wrote anything about these seas without having been themselves in them. They have generally supposed that every foot of sea which they believed no ship had passed over, to be land, though they had little or nothing to support that opinion but vague reports, many of them mentioned, only as such by the very authors who first published them. As, for instance, the orange tree, one, of the Nassau fleet, who, being separated from her companions, and drove to the westward, reported on her joining them again that she had twice seen the southern continent. 
both which places are laid down by Mr. Dalrymple many degrees to the eastward of our track, though it is probable that he has put them down as far to the westward as he thought it possible that she could go. To strengthen these weak arguments, another theory has been started, which says that it is necessary that so much of the southern sea, as the authors of it call land, should be so, otherwise this world would not be properly balanced, as the quantity of earth known to be situated in the northern hemisphere would not have a counterpoise in this. The number of square degrees of their land, which we have already changed into water, sufficiently disproves this, and teaches me at least, that till we know how this globe is fixed in that place, which has been since its creation assigned to it in the general system, we need not be anxious to give reasons how any one part of it counterbalances the rest. 1769, March 21. Calm this morn. Went out in the boat and shot tropic bird Phaeton erubescens, and Procellaria atrata, velox and sordida. Took turbo fluitans, floating upon the water in the same manner as Helix janthina, Medusa porpita, exactly like those taken on the other side of the continent, and a small simex, question mark, which also was taken before, but appears to be a larva. If so, probably of some animal that lives under water, as I saw many, but none that appeared perfect, though they were enough so to propagate their species, or copulate at least. In examining the phaetons, found that what appeared to me a black chrysis, as they flew, was no other than their black feet. On them was plenty of a very curious kind of Ericus phaetonitus, which either was or appeared to be viviparous. Besides what was shot today, there were seen man of war birds, Pelicanus aquilus, and a small bird of the sterna, question mark kind, called by the seamen egg birds, which were white with red beaks, about the size of sterna herundo. Of these I saw several just at night fall, who flew very high, and followed one another, all standing towards north-northwest. Probably there is land on that point, as we were now not far from the lat and longitude in which Quiros saw his southernmost islands, Incarnation, and St. John Baptiste. 1769, March 22. Fresh breeze of wind today. The ship laid no better than west, so we were forced to give over our hopes on the north-northwest point. Many man-of-war birds were about the ship today, and some egg birds. I shot three of the first, but none of them fell on board the ship. All today the weather very hot and damp, thermometer 80, which it never was at sea before, except in the calms under the line. 1769, March 23. Most troublesome weather, calms and squalls, with very heavy rain, but the wind did not stir. Many egg birds seen today, and some few tropic. 1769, March 24. Blue fresh still, wind as foul as ever. The officer of the watch reported that in the middle watch, the water from being roughish became on a sudden as smooth as the mill pond, so that the ship from going only four knots at once increased to six, though there was little or no more wind than before this, and a log of wood which was seen to pass by the ship by several people made them believe that there was land to windward. At eight, when I came on deck, the signs were all gone. I saw, however, two birds, which seemed to be of the sterna, question mark kind, both very small, one quite white and the other quite black, who from their appearance probably could not venture far from land. Today, by our reckoning, we crossed the tropic. 1769, March 25. Wind continued much the same, but more moderate. Few or no birds were about the ship, but some seaweed was seen by some of the people. Only one bed. This even, one of our marines threw himself overboard, and was not missed till it was much too late even to attempt to recover him. He was a very young man, scarce twenty-one years of age, remarkably quiet and industrious, and to make his exit the more melancholy, was drove to the rash resolution by an accident so trifling that it must appear incredible to everybody who is not well acquainted with the powerful effects that shame can work upon young minds. This day at noon he was sentry at the cabin door, and while he was on duty one of the captain's servants, being called away in a hurry, left a piece of sealskin in his charge, which it seems he was going to cut up to make tobacco pouches, some of which he had promised to several of the men. The poor young fellow, it seems, had several times asked him for one, and when refused, had told him that since he refused him so trifling a thing, he would if he could steal one from him. This he put in practice, as soon as the skin was given into his charge, and was of course found out immediately, as the other returned, who was angry, and took the piece he had cut off from him, but declared he would not complain to the officers for so trifling a cause. In the meantime the fact came to the ears of his fellow soldiers, who stood up for the honor of their corps, thirteen in number, so highly that before night, for this happened at noon, 
they drove the young fellow almost mad by representing his crime in the blackest colours as a breach of trust of the worst consequence a theft committed by a sentry upon duty they made him think an inexcusable crime especially when the thing stole was given into his charge the sergeant particularly declared that if the person aggrieved would not complain he would for people should not suffer scandal from the ill behaviour of one this affected the young fellow much he went to his hammock soon after the sergeant went to him called him and told him to follow him upon deck he got up and slipping the sergeant went forward it was dusk and the people thought he was gone to the head and were not convinced that he was gone over till half an hour after it happened seventeen sixty nine march twenty six this whole day calm succeeded by hard squalls with much rain which weather the seamen call trolley lollies the wind went more than once round the compass which made us hope that we were near the trade at least few or no birds and no tropic birds seventeen sixty nine march twenty seven weather much like yesterday no birds at night a little more settled seventeen sixty nine march twenty eight calm to-day one tropic bird was seen this morn after dinner a shark came the first we had seen in these seas he greedily took the bait but the line being old broke very soon he however returned with a hook and chain hanging out of his mouth but would not take the second bait seventeen sixty nine march twenty nine calm again bent a new shark line in the even a shark alongside took the bait but broke the new line just as we were going to hoist him in i am told by the people that common fishing line will never last above a year if ever so much care is taken of it seventeen sixty nine march thirty some birds and bonitos seen this morn but none after i came upon deck seventeen sixty nine march thirty one pleasant breeze of wind which is the trade some few tropic birds seen this morn myself not quite well a little inflammation in my throat and swelling of the glands End of section 9, March 1769. Section 10 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August 1768 to 12 July 1771 by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 10, April 1769. Part 1. 1769, April 1. Something better today. As my complaint has something in it that at least puts me in mind of the scurvy, I took up the lemon juice put up by Dr. Hume's direction, and found that which was concentrated by evaporating six galls into less than two has kept as well as anything could do. The small keg in which was lemon juice with one-fifth of brandy was also very good. The large part of it had leaked out by some fault in the keg. This, therefore, I began to make use of immediately drinking very weak punch made with it for my common liquor. 1769, April 2. Many birds today about noon passed by the ship, making a noise something like gulls. They were black upon the back and white under the belly, probably of the sterner kind. In company with them were twenty or thirty men of war birds, soaring over the flock, probably the whole in pursuit of a shoal of fish. 1769, April 3. Several of the same kinds of birds seen today, as were seen yesterday. Also many egg birds. The trade continued to blow fresh, with very pleasant weather. 1769, April 4. At ten this morn my servant, Peter Briscoe, saw the land which we had almost passed by. We stood towards it and found it to be a small island, Lagoon Island, about one and a half or two miles in length. Those who were upon the topmast head distinguished it to be nearly circular, and to have a lagoon or pool of water in the middle, which occupied much the largest part of the island. About noon we were close to it, within a mile or thereabouts, and distinctly saw inhabitants upon it, of whom we counted twenty-four. They appeared to us through our glasses to be tall, and to have very large heads, or possibly much hair, upon them. Eleven of them walked along the beach abreast of the ship, with each a pole or pike, as long again as himself in his hand, and every one of them stark naked, and appearing of a brown copper color. As soon, however, as the ship had fairly passed the island, they retired higher up on the beach, and seemed to put on some clothes, or at least cover themselves, with something which made them appear of a light color. The island was covered with trees of very many different verdures. The palms or coconut trees we could plainly distinguish, particularly two that were amazingly taller than their fellows, and at a distance 
bore a great resemblance to a flag. The land seemed all very low, though at a distance several parts of it appeared high, yet when we came near to them they proved to be clumps of palms. Under the shade of these were the houses of the natives, in places cleared of all underwood, so that pleasanter groves cannot be imagined, at least so they appeared to us, whose eyes had so long been unused to any other objects than water and sky. After dinner land was again seen, which we came up with at sunset. It proved a small island, not more than three-quarter of a mile in length, but almost round. We ran within less than a mile of it, but saw no signs of inhabitants, nor any coconut trees, or indeed any that bore the least resemblance to palms, though there were many sorts of trees, or at least many varieties of verdure. In the neighborhood of both this and the other island were many birds, man-of-war birds, and a small black sort of sterna, question mark, with a white spot on its head, which the seamen called noddies, but said that they were much smaller than the West Indian noddies. While we were near the island, a large fish was taken, with a towing line, baited with a piece of pork rind, cut like a swallow's tail. Small sketch. The seamen called it a kingfish. Scomber lanceolatus. 1769, April 5. Less wind this morn than yesterday, with some showers of rain. While we were at dinner, word was brought down that there was land in sight from the masthead, and found it a low island, but of much greater extent than either of those seen yesterday, being from ten to fifteen leagues in circumference. Myself remained at the masthead the whole evening, admiring its extraordinary structure. In shape it appeared to be like a bow, the wood and string of which was land, and the parts within occupied by a large lake of water, which bore about the same proportion to the land as the void space within the bow does to the string and wood. The string of the bow was a flat beach without any signs of vegetation on it, but heaps of seaweed laying in ridges, as higher or lower tides had left them. This was three or four leagues long, and appeared not more than two hundred yards wide, in any part, though doubtless as flat objects foreshorten themselves so much, it might be much more. The horns or angles of the bow were two large tufts of coconut trees, and much the largest part of its arch was filled up likewise with trees of different heights and appearances. A small part of it, however, was in my opinion low, and like the string. Here, some thought there was an opening into the pool in the center, and myself cannot say there was not. Indeed, it was at so great a distance that all must conjecture. Along the low beach or bowstring, we sailed within less than a league of the shore, till sunset, when we judged ourselves about halfway between the two horns. We then brought two and sounded, one hundred and thirty fathom of line out, and no ground. Night, which came on here almost instantly after sunset, made us lose sight of the land before the line was well hauled in. We then steered by the sound of the breakers, which were very distinctly heard in the ship, till we were clear of all. That this land was inhabited appeared clearly by three smokes in different parts of the island, which we saw repeated several different times, probably as signals from one to the other of our approach. Our second lieutenant affirmed that he saw from the deck many inhabitants in the first clump of trees, that they were walking to and fro, as if on their ordinary business without taking the least notice of the ship. He saw also many houses and canoes hold up under the trees. To this I only say that I did not see them, or know that any one else had, till the ship had passed the place one half an hour. 1769, April 6. Pleasant breeze. At one half past eleven, land in sight again, and three came up with it, proved to be distinct islands with many small ones near them, joined by reefs under the water. The islands themselves were long, thin strips of land, ranging in all directions, sometimes ten or more miles in length, but never more than a quarter of a mile broad. Upon them were many coconut and other trees, and many inhabitants, several of whom came out in canoes, as far as the reefs, but would not come without them. Six particularly, who for some time walked along shore abreast of the ship, on our passing the end of the island, launched two canoes with great quickness and dexterity, and three getting into each, they put off, as we thought, intending to come to us. The ship was brought to, and we waited some time, but they, like their fellows, came no farther than the reef, where they stopped, and waited for two messengers, who we saw dispatched from the great canoes, wading and swimming towards them along the reef. They met, and after a council, I suppose, resolved not to come off. The ship, after waiting some time, stood off, and when two or three miles from the shore was followed by a canoe with a sail, but not thinking it worth while to bring two for her, she soon gave over the chase and returned to the reef. The people seemed as well as we could judge, who were a good half-mile from the shore, to be about our size and well-made, of a dark brown complexion, 
stark naked, wearing their hair tied back with a fillet, which passed round their head and kept it sticking out behind like a bush. The greatest number of them carried in their hands two weapons, one a slender pole from ten to fourteen feet in length, at one end of which was a small knob or point, not unlike the point of a spear. The other, not above four feet long, made much like a paddle, as possibly it was intended, for their canoes were very different in size. The two which we saw them launch seemed not intended to carry more than barely the three men who had got into each of them. Others there were which had six and some seven men. One of these hoisted a sail, which did not seem to reach above six feet high above the boat. This, as soon as they came into the reef and stopped their boat, they took down and converted into a shed to shelter them from a small shower of rain, which then fell. The canoe which followed us to sea hoisted a sail, like an English lug sail, and near as lofty as an English boat of the same size would have carried. The people on the shore made many signals, but whether they meant to frighten us away or invite us ashore it is difficult to tell. They waved with their hands and seemed to beckon us to them, but they were assembled together with clubs and staves, as they would have done had they meant to oppose us. Their signs we answered by waving our hats and shouting, which they answered by shouting again. Our situation made it very improper to try them farther. We wanted nothing. The island was too trifling to be an object worth taking possession of. Had we therefore, out of mere curiosity, hoisted out a boat, and the natives by attacking us oblige us to destroy some of them, the only reason we could give for it would be the desire for satisfying a useless curiosity. We shall soon, by our connections with the inhabitants of George's Island, who already know our strength, and if they do not love, at least fear us, gain some knowledge of the customs of these savages, or possibly persuade one of them to come with us, who may serve as an interpreter, and give us an opportunity hereafter of landing wherever we please, without running the risk of being obliged to commit the cruelties which the Spaniards and most others, who have been in these seas, have often brought themselves under the dreadful necessity of being guilty of, for guilty I must call it. 1769, April 7. This morning at daybreak land is in sight again. By eight o'clock came up with an island, made up like the last, of narrow strips of land and reefs of rock. The greatest part of the land looked green and pleasant, but it was without coconut trees or any signs of inhabitants. I purposely omit to mention the size of these islands, as it is almost impossible to guess at, and very difficult to give an idea of the contents of narrow strips of land which run one within another, as a riband thrown carelessly down would do. If you measure the length of it, it four or five times exceeds the space of sea that it occupies. If the circumference, such land of one hundred leagues in circumference, would scarce contain one hundred square miles. If the space of sea that they occupy, you err as much, for of that twenty, forty, nay, sometimes one hundred parts, are sea for one of land, though that sea is so shut in by banks and reefs that no ship can get into it. 1769, April 8. Pleasant breeze, but we have as yet found the trade hardly so strong as it was in the Atlantic. At two o'clock land was seen from the masthead. The ship stands for it, and about sunset came abreast of it distant two leagues. It proved an island larger than any we had seen, as it extended six or seven leagues. It was everywhere covered with plenty of large trees, probably coconuts, and it is also inhabited, as we judge from a smoke, rising from among the trees. In everything it appeared exactly of the same nature with the rest which we have seen. We could plainly distinguish it in some places, broken off into reefs behind which we saw distant land, and thence judged that there was a lagoon within it. The land, however, appeared to be broader than any we had seen before. 1769, April 9. Fine weather and pleasant breeze. It is now almost night, and time for me to wind up the coup of my this day's lucubrations. So, as we have found no island, I shall employ the time in paper, which I had allotted to describe one, in a work which I am sure will be more useful at, if not more entertaining, to all future navigators, by describing the method which we took to cure cabbage in England which cabbage we have eat every day since we left Cape Horn, and have now good store of, remaining as good at least to our palates, and full as green and pleasing to the eye, as if it was brought fresh every morning at Covent Garden Market. Our steward has given me the receipt, which I shall copy exactly, false spelling excepted. Take a strong iron-bound cask, for no weak or wooden-bound one should ever be trusted in a long voyage. Take out the head, and when the hole is well cleaned, cover the bottom with salt. Then take a cabbage, and stripping off the outside leaves, 
Take the rest, leaf by leaf, till you come to the heart, which cut into four. These leaves and heart lay upon the salt, about two or three inches thick, and sprinkle salt pretty thick over them, and lay cabbage upon the salt stratum super thick, until the cask is full. Then lay on the head of the cask with a weight, which in five or six days will have pressed the cabbage into a much smaller compass. After this, fill up the cask with more cabbage, as before directed, and head it up. N.B. The cabbage should be gathered in dry weather some time after sunrise, that the dew may not be upon it. Halves of cabbages are better for keeping than single leaves. 1769, April 10. Last night a halo was observed round the moon, which was followed by a very disagreeable night, the wind being all round the compass, and sometimes blowing very fresh, with severe thunder and lightning, and very heavy rain. This morning, the wind from north to northwest, the weather very hazy and thick. About nine it cleared up a little, and showed us Osnabrück Island, discovered by the dolphin in her last voyage. It was distant about six leagues, and appeared like a very short cone. Very light winds northwest. About one, land was seen ahead in the direction of George's land. It was, however, so faint that very few could see it. Soon after, it was seen off the deck in the same faint manner, but appearing high. Our distance when it was first seen was twenty-five leagues. At sunset, the ship was nearly abreast Osnabrück Island, two or three leagues from it. It appeared to have many trees upon it, but in some parts the rocks were quite bare. At this time, it remained in dispute whether what had been so long seen to the westward was really land or only vapors. Myself went to the masthead, but the sunset was cloudy, and we could see nothing of it. As soon as I came down, a shark at the stern attacked the net in which tomorrow's dinner was towing to freshen. We hooked and took him, just as it became dark. 1769, April 11. Up at five this morn, to examine the shark, who proves to be a blue shark, Squalus glaucus. While we were doing it, three more came under the stern, of which we soon caught two, which were common grey sharks, Squalus carcarius. On one of them were some sucking fish, Echinus remora. The seamen tell us that the blue shark is worst of all sharks to eat. Indeed, his smell is so abominably strong, so as we had two of the better sort, he was hove overboard. Little wind and variable with squalls from all points of the compass bringing heavy rain. George's island in sight, appearing very high in the same direction as the land, was seen last night. So I found the fault was in our eyes yesterday, though the non-seers were much more numerous in the ship than the seers. Today and yesterday many birds were about the ship, among which a bird which I took to be the tropic bird, Phaeton Ethereus, was one. He was about the size of our tropic bird, but differed from him in having black bars upon his back, and the long feathers in his white tail. So much, I say, but the weather was so uncertain that I could not go out to shoot one. Calm this even. At sunset, George's land appeared plain, though we had not neared it much. Since the clouds went from the tops of the hills, it appeared less high than it did, though it certainly is very high. As I am now on the brink of going ashore after a long passage, thank God, in as good health as a man can be, I shall fill a little paper in describing the means which I have taken to prevent the scurvy in particular. The ship was supplied by the Admiralty with sauerkraut, which I eat of constantly, till our salted cabbage was opened, which I prefer as a pleasant substitute. Wort was served out almost constantly. Of this I drank from a pint or more every evening, but all this did not so entirely check the distemper as to prevent my feeling some small effects of it. About a fortnight ago my gums swelled, and some small pimples rose in the inside of my mouth, which threatened to become ulcers. I then flew to the lemon juice, which had been put up for me according to Dr. Hume's method, described in his book, and in his letter which is inserted here. Every kind of liquor which I used was made sour, with a lemon juice number three, so that I took near six ounces a day of it. The effect of this was surprising. In less than a week my gums became as firm as ever, and at this time I am troubled with nothing but a few pimples on my face, which have not deterred me from leaving off the juice entirely. 1769, April 12. George's Land Sighted. Very nearly calm all last night. George's Land was now but little nearer to us than last night. The tops of the hills were wrapped in clouds. About seven a small breeze sprung up and we saw some canoes coming off to us. By ten or eleven they were up with us. I forbear to say anything about either people or canoes, as I shall have so many better opportunities of observing them. 
We, however, bought their cargoes, consisting of fruits and coconuts, which were very acceptable to us after our long passage. 1769, April 13. Arrival, Port Royal Bay. This morn early came to an anchor in Port Royal Bay, King George III's island. Before the anchor was down, we were surrounded by a large number of canoes, who traded very quietly and civilly, for beads chiefly, in exchange for which they gave coconuts, breadfruit, both roasted and raw, some small fish, and apples. They had one pig with them, which they refused to sell for nails upon any account, but repeatedly offered it for a hatchet. Of these we had very few on board, so thought it better to let the pig go away than to give one of them in exchange, knowing from the authority of those who had been here before that if we once did it, they would never lower the price. As soon as the anchors were well down, the boats were hoisted out, and we all went ashore, where we were met by some hundreds of the inhabitants, whose faces at least gave evident signs that we were not unwelcome guests, though they at first hardly dare approach us. After a little time, they became very familiar. The first who approached us came creeping almost on his hands and knees, and gave us a green bough, the token of peace. This we received, and immediately each gathered a green bough, and carried in our hands. They marched with us about half a mile, then made a general stop, and scraping the ground from the plants that grew upon it, every one of the principals, threw his bow down upon the bare place, and made signs that we should do the same. The marines were drawn up, and marching in order dropped each a bow upon those that the Indians had laid down. We all followed their example, and thus peace was concluded. We then walked into the woods, followed by the whole train, to whom we gave beads and small presents. In this manner we walked for four or five miles, under groves of coconut and breadfruit trees, loaded with a profusion of fruit, and giving the most grateful shade I have ever experienced. Under these were the inhabitants of the people, most of them without walls. In short, the scene we saw was the truest picture of an Arcadia, of which we were going to be kings, that the imagination can form. Our pleasure in seeing this was, however, not a little allayed by finding in all our walk only two hogs and not one fowl. The dolphins' people, who were with us, told us that the people who we saw were only of the common sort, and that the bettermost had certainly removed. As a proof of this, they took us to the place where the Queen's palace formerly stood, of which there were no traces left. We, however, resolved not to be discouraged at this, but to proceed tomorrow morning in search of the place to which these superior people had retreated, in hopes to make the same peace with them, as we have done with our friends, the Blackguards. 1769, April 14. This morn several canoes came on board, among which were two, in which were people who, by their dress and appearance, seemed to be of a rank superior to those who we had seen yesterday. These we invited to come on board, and on coming into the cabin each singled out his friend. One took the captain and the other me. They took off a large part of their clothes, and each dressed his friend with them he took off. In return for this, we presented them with each a hatchet and some beads. They made many signs to us, desiring us to go to the places where they lived to the southwest of where we lay. The boats were hoisted out, and we took them with us, and immediately proceeded according to their directions. After rowing about a league, they beckoned us in shore, and showed us a long house, where they gave us to understand that they lived. Here we landed, and were met by some hundreds of inhabitants, who conducted us into the long house. Mats were spread, and we were desired to sit down, fronting an old man, who we had not before seen. He immediately ordered a cock and hen to be brought, which were presented to Captain Cook and me. We accepted of the present. Then a piece of cloth was presented to each of us, perfumed after their manner, not disagreeably, which they took great pains to make us understand. My piece of cloth was eleven yards long and two wide. For this I made return by presenting him with a large laced silk neckcloth I had on, and a linen pocket handkerchief. These he immediately put on him, and seemed to be much pleased with. After this ceremony was over, we walked freely about several large houses, attended by the ladies who showed us all kinds of civilities our situation could admit of. But as there were no places of retirement, the houses being entirely without walls, we had not an opportunity of putting their politeness to every test that maybe some of us would not have failed to have done had circumstances been more favorable. Indeed, we had no reason to doubt any part of their politeness, as by their frequently pointing to the mats on the ground and sometimes by force seating themselves and us, upon them they plainly showed that they were much less jealous of observation than we were. We now took our leave of our friendly chief and proceeded along shore for about a mile when we were met by a throng of people at the head of whom appeared another chief. 
we had learnt the ceremony we were to go through, which was to receive the green bough, which was always brought to us at every fresh meeting, and to ratify the peace of which that was the emblem by laying our hands on our breasts and saying, Tayo, which I imagine signifies friend. The bow was here offered and accepted, and in return every one of us said, Tayo. The chief made us signs that if we chose to eat, he had victuals ready. We accepted the offer, and dined heartily on fish and breadfruit, with plantains, etc., dressed after their way. Raw fish was offered to us, which it seems they themselves eat. The adventures of this entertainment I much wish to record particularly, but am so much hurried by attending the Indians ashore almost all day long, that I fear I shall scarce understand my own language when I read it again. Our chief's own wife, ugly enough in conscience, did me the honour with very little invitation to squat down on the mats close by me. No sooner had she done so than I espied among the common crowd a very pretty girl, with a fire in her eyes that I had not before seen in the country. Unconscious of the dignity of my companion, I beckoned to the other, who after some entreaties came and sat on the other side of me. I was then desirous of getting rid of my former companion, so I ceased to attend to her, and loaded my pretty girl with beads in every present I could think pleasing to her. The other showed much disgust, but did not quit her place, and continued to supply me with fish and coconut milk. How this would have ended is hard to say. It was interrupted by an accident, which gave us an opportunity of seeing much of the people's manners. Dr. Solander and another gentleman, who had not been in as good company as myself, found that their pockets had been picked. One had lost a snuff-box, the other an opera-glass. Complaint was made to the chief, and to give it weight I started up from the ground, and striking the butt of my gun made a rattling noise, which I had before used in our walk, to frighten the people and keep them at a distance. Upon this as a signal every one of the common sort, among whom was my pretty girl, ran like sheep from the house, leaving us with only the chief his three wives, and two or three better dressed than the rest, whose quality I do not yet guess at. The chief then took me by the hand to the other end of the house, where lay a large quantity of their cloth. This he offered to me piece by piece, making signs that if it would make amends, I might take any part of it. I put it back and by signs told him that I wanted nothing but our own which his people had stole. On this he gave me into charge of my faithful companion, his wife, who had never budged an inch from my elbow. With her I sat down on the mat and conversed by signs, for near one half an hour, after which time he came back, bringing the snuff-box and the case of the opera-glass, which with vast pleasure in his countenance he returned to the owners. But his face soon changed, when he was shown that the case was empty, which ought to have been full. He then took me by the hand and walked along shore with great rapidity, about a mile. By the way, he received a piece of cloth from a woman, which he carried in his hand. At last we came to a house in which we were received by a woman. To her he gave the cloth he had, and told us to give her some beads. The cloth and beads were left on the floor by us, and she went out. She stayed about one quarter of an hour, and then returned bringing the glass in her hand, with a vast expression of joy on her countenance, for few faces have I seen which have more expression in them than those of these people. The beads were now returned, with a positive resolution of not accepting them and the cloth was as resolutely forced upon Dr. Solander as a recompense for his loss. We then made a new present of beads to the lady, and our ceremonies ended, we returned to the ship, admiring a policy at least equal to any we had seen in civilized countries, exercised by people who have never had any advantage but mere natural instinct, uninstructed by the example of any civilized country. End of section 10. Section 11 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August 1768 to 12 July 1771 by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 11. 1769, April, Part 2. 1769, April 15. This morn we landed at the watering place, bringing with us a small tent, which we set up. In doing this, we were attended by some hundreds of the natives, who showed a deference and respect to us, which much amazed me. I myself drew a line before them, with the butt end of my musket, and made signs to them to set down without it. They obeyed instantly, and not a man attempted to set a foot within it. Above two hours were spent so, and not the least disorder being committed. We proposed to walk into the woods, and see if today we might not find more hogs, etc., than when we last visited them, 
supposing it probable that a part of them at least had been drove away on our arrival. This in particular tempted us to go away, with many other circumstances, as our old man, an Indian well known to the dolphins, attempted by many signs to hinder us from going into the woods. The tent was left in charge of a midshipman, with the marines, thirteen in number. We marched away, and were absent about two hours. A little while before we came back we heard several musket shots. Our old man immediately called us together, and by waving his hand sent away every Indian who followed us, except three, every one of whom took in their hands a green bough. On this we suspected that some mischief had happened at the tent, and hastened home with all expedition. On our return we found that an Indian had snatched a sentry's musket from him, unawares, and run off. The midshipman, may be, imprudently, ordered the marines to fire. They did fire into the thickest of the flying crowd, some hundreds in number, several shot, and pursuing the man who stole the musket killed him dead, but whether any others were killed or hurt, no one can tell. No Indian was now to be seen about the tent by our old man, who with us took all pains to reconcile them again. Before night, by his means, we got together a few of them, and explaining to them that the man who suffered was guilty of a crime deserving of death, for so we were forced to make it, we retired to the ship not well pleased with the day's expedition, guilty no doubt in some measure, of the death of a man who the most severe laws of equity would not have condemned to so severe a punishment. 1769, April 16. No canoes about the ship this morning. Indeed, we could not expect any, as it is probable that the news of our behavior yesterday was now known everywhere, a circumstance which will doubtless not increase the confidence of our friends, the Indians. We were rather surprised that the dolphin's old man, who seemed yesterday so desirous of making peace, was not come on board today. Some few people were upon the beach, but very few in proportion to what we saw yesterday. At noon went ashore, the people rather shy of us, as we must expect them to be, till by good usage we gain anew their confidence. Poor Mr. Buchan, the young man who I brought out as a landscape and figure painter was yesterday attacked by an epileptic fit. He was today quite insensible. Our surgeon gives me very little hopes of him. 1769, April 17. At two this morn Mr. Buchan died. About nine everything was ready for his interment, he being already so much changed that it would not be practicable to keep him even till night. Dr. Solander, Mr. Sporing, Mr. Parkinson, and some of the officers of the ship attended his funeral. I sincerely regret him as an ingenious and good young man, but his loss to me is irretrievable. My airy dreams of entertaining my friends in England, with the scenes that I am to see here, are vanished. No account of the figures and dresses of men can be satisfactory, unless illustrated with figures. Had Providence spared him a month longer, what an advantage would it have been to my undertaking, but I must submit. Our two friends, the chiefs of the West, came this morn to see us. One I shall for the future call Lysurgis, from the justice he executed on his offending subjects on the 14th. The other, from the large size of his body, I shall call Hercules. Each of these brought a hog and breadfruit ready dressed as a present for which they were presented in return with a hatchet and a nail each. Hercules' present is the largest. He seems indeed to be the richest man. In the afternoon we all went ashore to measure out the ground for the tents which done, Captain Cook and Mr. Green slept ashore in a tent erected for that purpose, after having observed an eclipse of one of the satellites of Jupiter. 1769, April 18. This morning at daybreak all hands were ashore and employed in getting up the tents and making a defense round them. The ground we have pitched upon is very sandy, which makes it necessary to support it with wood. For the doing of this our people cut the boughs of trees, and the Indians very readily assisted them in bringing them down to the place. Three sides of our fort are thus to be guarded. The other is bounded by a river on the banks of which water casks are to be placed. The Indians brought down so much provision of coconuts and breadfruit today that before night we were obliged to leave off buying and acquaint them by signs that we should not want any more for two days. Everything was bought for beads, a bead about as large as a pea, purchasing four or six breadfruits and a like number of coconuts. My tents were got up before night and I slept ashore in them for the first time. The lines were guarded round by many sentries, but no Indian attempted to come near them during the whole night. 1769, April 19. This morn, Lysurgis and his wife come to see us, and bring with them all their household furniture, and even houses to be erected in our neighborhood, a circumstance which gave me great pleasure, as I had spared no pains to gain the friendship of this man, who seemed more sensible than any of his fellow chiefs we have seen. His behavior in this instance 
makes us not doubt of having gained confidence at least. Soon after his arrival, he took me by the hand and led me out of the lines, signing that I should accompany him into the woods. This I made no difficulty of doing, as I was desirous of knowing how near us he really intended to settle. I followed him about a quarter of a mile, when we arrived at a small house, or rather, the awning of a canoe set upon the shore, which seemed to be his occasional habitation. Here he unfolded a bundle of their clothes and clothed me in two garments, one red cloth, the other very pretty matting. After this we returned to our tents. He eat pork and red fruit, which was brought to him in a basket, using salt water instead of sauce, and then retired into my bedchamber and slept about half an hour. About dinner time, Lycurgus's wife brought a handsome young man about twenty-two to the tents, whom they both seemed to acknowledge as their son. At night, he and another chief, who had also visited us, went away to the westward, but Lycurgus and his wife went towards the place I was at in the morning, which makes us not doubt of their staying with us for the future. Mr. Monkhouse, our surgeon, walked this evening into the woods, and brought back an account of having seen the body of the man who was shot on the 15th. It was placed on a kind of bier supported by stakes, and covered by a small hut, which seemed to have been built for the purpose. The body was wrapped up in cloth, and near it were placed war instruments, a hatchet, some hair, a coconut, and a cup of water. Farther he did not examine on account of the stench of the body, which was intolerable. They also saw two more huts of the same kind in one of which they saw the bones of the person who had lain there quite dry. A custom so new as this appears to be surprised us all very much, but whether all who die are thus disposed of, or it is a peculiar honor shown to those who die in war, is to be cleared up by future observation. 1769, April 20. Rain hard all this day at intervals, so much so that we could not stir at all. The people, however, went on briskly with a fortification in spite of weather. Lycurgus dined with us, he imitates our manners in every instance, already holding a knife and fork more handily than a Frenchman could learn to do in years. Notwithstanding the rain, some provisions are brought to the market, which is kept just without lines. Indeed, ever since we have been here, we have had more breadfruit every day than both the people and hogs can eat. But in the pork way, we have been so poorly supplied that I believe fresh pork has not been served to the ship's company above once. 1769, April 21. Several of our friends at the tents this morn one of whom, from his grim countenance, we have called Ajax, and at one time thought to be a great king. He had on his canoe a hog, but he chose rather to sell it at the market than give it to us as a present, which we account for by his having in the morning received a shirt in return for a piece of cloth, which made him fear that had he given the hog, it might have been taken into the bargain, a conduct very different from that of our friend Lycurgus, who seems in every instance to place a most unbounded confidence in us. 1769, April 22. Pleasant weather. Our friends, as usual, come early to visit us. Hercules with two pigs, and a dolphin's axe, which he wished to have repaired, as it accordingly was. Lycurgus brought two large fish, an acceptable present, as that article has always been scarce with us. Trade risk today. Since our new manufacture of hatches has been set on foot, we get some hogs, though our tools are so small and bad that I only wonder how they can stand one stroke. The flies have been so troublesome, ever since we have been ashore, that we can scarce get any business done for them. They eat the painter's colors off the paper as fast as they can be laid on, and if a fish is to be drawn, there is more trouble in keeping them off it than in the drawing itself. Many expedients have been thought of. None succeed better than a mosquito net which covers table, chair, painter, and drawings, but even that is not sufficient. A fly trap was necessary to set within this to attract the vermin from eating the colors. For that purpose yesterday, tar and molasses was mixed together but did not succeed. The plate smeared with it was left on the outside of the tent to clean. One of the Indians, observing this, took an opportunity, when he thought that no one observed him, to take some of this mixture up into his hand. I saw, and was curious to know for what use it was intended. The gentleman had a large sore upon his backside, to which this clammy lineament was applied, but with what success I never took the pains to inquire. Hercules gave us today a specimen of the music of this country. Four people performed upon flutes, which they sounded with one nostril, while they stopped the other with their thumbs. To these four more sang, keeping very good time. But during half an hour, of which we stayed with them, they played only one tune, consisting of not more than five or six notes. More, I am inclined to think, they have not upon their instruments, which have only two stops. 1769, April 23. Mr. Green and myself went today a little way upon the hills, in order to see how the roads were. 
Lysurgis went with us, but complained much in the ascent, saying that it would kill him. We found as far as we went, possibly three miles, exceeding good paths, and at the farthest part of our walk, boys bringing wood from the mountains, which we look upon to be a sure proof that journey will be easy whenever we attempt to go higher. In our return I visited the tomb or bier in which was deposited the body of the man who was shot. I lifted up the cough and saw part of the body already dropping to pieces with putrefaction about him, and indeed, within all parts of his flesh, were an abundance of maggots of a species of beetle very common here. Such an advance of putrefaction in eight days, for it was no more since he was shot, is almost past credit, but what will not a hot climate and plenty of insects do? We had this evening some conversation about an axe, which was wrought in the morning by Hercules. It wanted grinding. Its make was very different from our English ones. Several gentlemen were of the opinion that it was a French one. Some went so far as to give, as their opinion, that some other ship had been here since the dolphin. The difficulty, however, appeared to me at least easily solved, by supposing axes to have been taken in the dolphin as trade, in which case old ones might have been bought of the make of any country, for many such, I suppose, there are in every old iron shop in London. 1769, April 24. Dr. Solander and myself went along shore to the eastwards, in hope of finding something worth observation by enlarging our ground. For about two miles the country within us was flat and fertile. The hills then came very near the water's edge, and soon after quite into the sea, so that we were obliged to climb over them. This barren country continued for about three miles more, when we came to a large flat full of good houses and wealthy-looking people. Here was a river much more considerable than our own. It came out of a very deep and beautiful valley, and was where we crossed it, near one hundred yards wide though not quite at the sea. About a mile farther than this river we went, when the land became again as barren as possible, the rocks everywhere projecting into the sea, so we resolved to return. Soon after this resolution one of the natives made us an offer of refreshment which we accepted. He was remarkable for being much the whitest man we had seen. On examining him more nearly, his skin was dead pale, without the least signs of complexion in any part of it. Some parts were lighter than others, but the darkest was lighter than any of our skins. His hair and eyebrows and beard were as white as his skin, his eyes bloodshot. He appeared to be very short-sighted. His whole body was scurfy, and maybe disease had been the cause of his color. If not, we shall see more such. In our return met Lysurgis, who seemed much rejoiced at seeing us, as did all his women. To show their regard, I suppose they all cried most heartily. 1769, April 25. I do not know by what accident I have so long omitted to mention how much these people are given to thieving. I will make up for my neglect, however, today, by saying that great and small chiefs, and common men, are all firmly of opinion that if they can once get possession of anything, it immediately becomes their own. This we were convinced of the very second day we were here. The chiefs were employed in stealing what they could in the cabin, while their dependents took everything that was loose about the ship, even the glass ports not escaping them, of which they got off with two. Lysurgis and Hercules were the only two who had not yet been found guilty, but they stood in our opinion but upon ticklish ground, as we could not well suppose them entirely free from a vice their countrymen were so much given up to. Last night Dr. Solander led his knife to one of Lysurgis's women, who forgot to return it. This morn mine was missing. I could give no account of it, so resolved to go to Lysurgis and ask him whether or not he had stole it, trusting that if he had, he would return it. I went and taxed him with it. He denied knowing anything concerning it. I told him I was resolved to have it returned. On this, a man present produced a rag, in which was tied up three knives. One was Dr. Solander's, the other a table knife, the other no one laid claim to. With these, he marched to the tents to make restitution, while I remained with the women, who much feared that he would be hurt. When come there, he restored the two knives to their proper owners, and began immediately to search for mine, in all the places where he had ever seen it lay. One of my servants, seeing what he was about, brought it to him. He had, it seems, laid it by the day before, and did not know of my missing it. Lysurgis then burst into tears, making signs with my knife, that if he was ever guilty of such an action, he would submit to have his throat cut. He returned immediately to me with a countenance, sufficiently upbraiding me for my suspicions. The scene was immediately changed. I became the guilty, and he the innocent person. His looks affected me much." A few presents and staying a little with him reconciled him entirely. His behavior has, however, given me an opinion of him much superior to any of his countrymen. 1769, April 26. 
plenty of trade this morn. Indeed, we have always had enough of breadfruit and coconuts. Refreshments may be more necessary for the people than pork, though they certainly do not like them so well. Our friends as usual at the tents today, but do nothing worthy of record. 1769, April 27. The day passed as usual. Lysurgis and a friend of his, who eats most monstrously, dined with us. We christened him Epicurus. At night they took their leave and departed, but Lysurgis soon returned with fire in his eyes, seized my arm, and signed me to follow him. I did, and he soon brought me to a place where was our butcher, who he told me by signs had either threatened or attempted to cut his wife's throat with a reap hook he had in his hand. I signed to him that the man should be punished tomorrow, if he would only clearly explain the offence, for he was so angry that his signs were almost unintelligible. He grew cooler and showed me that the butcher had taken a fancy to a stone hatchet, which lay in his house. This he offered to purchase for a nail. His wife, who was there, refused to part with it, upon which he took it, and throwing down the nail threatened to cut her throat, if she attempted to hinder him. In evidence of this the hatchet and nail were produced, and the butcher had so little to say in his defense that no one doubted his guilt. After this we parted, and he appeared satisfied, but did not forget to put me in mind of my promise that the butcher should to-morrow be punished. This day we found that our friends had names, and they were not a little pleased to discover that we had them likewise. For the future, Lysurgis will be called Tuburai Tamaidi, and his wife Tomio, and the three women who commonly come with him, Tarapo, Turaru, and Omi. As for our names, they make so poor a hand of pronouncing them, that I fear we shall be obliged to take each of us a new one for the occasion. 1769, April 28. Many of our friends were with us very early, even before day, some strangers with them. Tarapo was observed to be among the women, on the outside of the gate. I went out to her and brought her in. Tears stood in her eyes, which the moment she entered the tent began to flow plentifully. I began to inquire the cause. She, instead of answering me, took from under her garment a shark's tooth, and struck it into her head with great force six or seven times. A profusion of blood followed these strokes, and alarmed me not a little. For two or three minutes she bred freely, more than a pint in quantity. During that time she talked loud, in a most melancholy tone. I was not a little moved at so singular a spectacle, and holding her in my arms did not cease to inquire what might be the cause of so strange an action. She took no notice of me till the bleeding ceased, nor did any Indian in the tent take any of her. All talked and laughed, as if nothing melancholy was going forward. But what surprised me most of all was that as soon as the bleeding ceased, she looked up smiling, and immediately began to collect pieces of cloth, which during her bleeding she had thrown down to catch the blood. These she carried away out of the tents, and threw into the sea, carefully dispersing them abroad, as if desirous that no one should be reminded of her action by the sight of them. She then went into the river, and after washing her whole body, returned to the tents, as lively and cheerful as any one of them. In breakfast, Mr. Molyneux came ashore, and the moment he entered the tent fixing his eyes upon a woman who was sitting there, declared her to be the dolphin's queen. She also instantly acknowledged him to be a person whom she had seen before. Our attention was now entirely diverted from every other object to the examination of a personage we had heard so much of in Europe. She appeared to be about forty, tall and very lusty, her skin white and her eyes full of meaning. She might have been handsome when young, but now few or no traces of it were left. As soon as Her Majesty's quality was known to us, she was invited to go on board the ship, where no presents were spared that were thought to be agreeable to her, in consideration of the service she had been of to the dolphin. Among other things, a child's doll was given to her, of which she seemed very fond. On her landing, she met Hercules, who for the future I shall call by his real name, Tutaha. She showed him her presents. He became uneasy, nor was he satisfied, till he had also got a doll given to him, which he now seemed to prefer to a hatchet that he had in return for presents, though after this time the dolls were of no kind of value. The men who visited us constantly eat with us of our provisions, but the women never had been prevailed on to taste a morsel. Today, however, they retired some time after dinner into the servants' apartment and eat there a large quantity of plantains, though they could not be persuaded to eat with us, a mystery we find it very difficult to account for. 1769, April 29. My first business this morning was to see the promise I had made to Tuburai and Tomio of the butchers being punished performed a promise they had not failed to remind me of yesterday, when the crowd of people who were with us hindered it from being performed. 
In consequence of this, I took them on board of the ship, where Captain Cook immediately ordered the offender to be punished. They stood quietly and saw him stripped and fastened to the rigging. But as soon as the first blow was given, interfered with many tears, begging the punishment might cease, a request which the captain would not comply with. On my return ashore, I proceeded to pay a visit to Her Majesty Oberea, as I shall for the future call her. She, I was told, was still asleep in her canoe awning, where I intended to call up Her Majesty, but was surprised to find her in bed with a handsome, lusty young man of about twenty-five, whose name was Obadi. I, however, understood that he was her gallant, a circumstance which she made not the least secret of. Upon my arrival, Her Majesty proceeded to put on her breeches, which done she clothed me in fine cloth, and proceeded with me to the tents. At night I visited Taburai, as I often did by candlelight, and found him and all his family in a most melancholy mood. Most of them shed tears, so that I soon left them, without being at all able to find out the cause of their grief. Uhua, the dolphin's old man, and another, who we did not know, had prophesied to some of our people that in four days we should fire our guns. This was the fourth night, and the circumstance of Tuburai crying over me, as it was interpreted, alarmed our officers a good deal. The sentries therefore doubled, and we sleep tonight under arms. 1769, April 30. A very strict watch was kept last night as intended. At two in the morn myself went round the point, found everything so quiet that I had no kind of doubts. Our little fortification is now complete. It consists of high breastworks at each end, the front palisades and the rear, guarded by the river, on the bank of which are placed full water casks. At every angle is mounted a swivel and two carriage guns, pointing the two ways by which the Indians might attack us out of the woods. Our sentries are also as well relieved as they could be in the most regular fortification. About ten, Tomio came running to the tents. She seized my hand and told me that Taborai was dying, and I must go instantly with her to his house. I went and found him leaning his head against a post. He had vomited, they said, and he told me he should certainly die in consequence of something our people had given him to eat, the remains of which were showed me carefully wrapped up in a leaf. This, upon examination, I found to be a chew of tobacco, which he had begged of some of our people, and trying to imitate them in keeping it in his mouth, as he saw them do, had chewed it almost to powder, swallowing his spittle. I was now master of his disease, for which I prescribed coconut milk, which soon restored him to health. End of section 11. 1769. April. Part 2. Section 12 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August, 1768, to 12 July, 1771. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 12. May, 1769, Part 1. 1769, May 1. This morn, in walking around the point, I saw a canoe which I supposed to have come from a distance, by her having a quantity of fresh water in her bamboos. In every other respect, she is quite like those we have seen. Her people, however, are absolute strangers to us. Before noon, our friends visit us as usual, and the day passed without any events. 1769, May 2. About ten this morn, the astronomical quadrant, which had been brought ashore yesterday, was missed, a circumstance which alarmed us all very much. It had been laid in Captain Cook's berth, where no one slept. The telescopes were in my tent safe. Every place was searched aboard and ashore, but no such thing was to be found. It appeared very improbable that the Indians could have carried so large a thing out of the tents without being observed by the sentries. Our people might have stole it, as it was packed up in a deal case, and might by them have been supposed to contain nails or some kind of traffic. A large reward was therefore offered to anyone who could find it, and all hands sent out to search round the fort. Upon a supposition, that the Indians would immediately quit a prize that could be of so little use to them. In about an hour all returned. No news of the quadrant. I now went into the woods to get intelligence, no longer doubting but that it was in the hands of the Indians. Tuburai met me crossing the river, and immediately made with three straws in his hand the figure of a triangle. The Indians had opened the cases. No time was now to be lost. I made signs to him that he must instantly go with me to the place where it was. He agreed, and out we set, accompanied by a midshipman and Mr. Green. We went to the eastward. At every house we went past, Tuburai inquired after the thief by name. 
the people readily told him which way he had gone, and how long it was since he'd passed by, a circumstance which gave great hopes of coming up with him. The weather was excessive hot. The thermometer before we left the tents, up at 91, made our journey very tiresome. Sometimes we walked, sometimes we ran, when we imagined, as we did sometimes, that the chase was just before us, till we arrived at the top of a hill about four miles from the tents. From this place, Tuburai showed us a point about three miles off, and made us understand that we were not to expect the instrument till we got there. We now considered our situation. No arms among us but a pair of pocket pistols, which I always carried. Going at least seven miles from our fort, where the Indians might not be quite so submissive as at home, going also to take from them a prize for which they had ventured their lives. All this considered, we thought it proper that while Mr. Green and myself proceeded, the midshipmen should return and desire Captain Cook to send a party of men after us, telling him at the same time that it was impossible we should return till dark night. This done, we proceeded, and in the very spot Tuburai had mentioned, were met by one of his own people, bringing part of the quadrant in his hand. We now stopped, and many Indians gathered about us rather rudely. The sight of one of my pistols, however, instantly checked them, and they behaved with all the order imaginable, though we quickly had some hundreds surrounding a ring we had marked in the grass. The box was now brought to us, and some of the small matters, such as reading glasses, etc., which in their hurry they had put into a pistol case. This I knew belonged to me. It had been stole out of the tents, with a horse pistol in it, which I immediately demanded, and had immediately restored. Mr. Green began to overlook the instrument to see if any part or parts were wanting. Several small things were, and people were sent out in search of them, some of which returned and others did not. The stand was not there, but that we were informed had been left behind by the thief, and we should have it in our return. An answer which coming from Tuburai satisfied us very well. Nothing else was wanting, but what could easily be repaired, so we packed all up in grass as well as we could, and proceeded homewards. After walking about two miles, we met Captain Cook with a party of marines coming after us. All were, you may imagine, not a little pleased at the event of our excursion. The captain, on leaving the tents, left orders both for the ship and shore, which were that no canoes should be suffered to go out of the bay, but that nobody's person should be seized or detained. As we rightly guessed that none of our friends had any hand in the theft, these orders were obeyed by the first lieutenant who was ashore, but the second aboard, seeing some canoes going along shore, sent a boat to fetch them back. The boatswain commander did so, and with them brought Dutaha. The rest of their crews leapt overboard. He was sent ashore prisoner. The first lieutenant, of course, could not do less than confine him, which he did to the infinite dissatisfaction of all the Indians. This we heard from them, two miles before we reached the tents on our return. Tuburai, Tomayo, and every Indian that we let in, joined in lamenting over Dutaha with many tears. I arrived about a quarter of an hour before the captain, during which time this scene lasted. As soon as he came, he ordered him to be instantly set at liberty, which done he walked off sulky enough, though at his departure he presented us with a pig. 1769 May 3. Dr. Solander and myself, who have all along acted in the capacity of market men, attended this morn, but no kind of provisions were bought. Indeed, few Indians appeared except the servants of Dutaha, who very early took away his canoe. Soon after, Tubaya, Oberia's right-hand man, who was with her in the dolphin's time, came and overhauled every part of her canoe, which had also been detained, seemed satisfied with what he saw, so much so that he would not take it away. About noon, several fishing boats came abreast the tents. They, however, parted with very few fish. In the course of the whole day, a small quantity of breadfruit was got, chiefly in a present, and six coconuts only were bought. A very disagreeable change, this from our former situation. We have now no coconuts, and not one quarter enough of breadfruit for the people, who have scarce ever before failed to turn away the latter from the market, and purchase of the other from three to four hundred a day. In the course of the day I went into the woods. The Indians were civil, but everywhere complained of the ill usage Dutaha had met with. They said that he had been beat and pulled by the hair. I endeavored all I could to convince them that no violence had been offered to them, but without success. I fear the boatswain has been rougher in his usage of him than he chooses to acknowledge. Tupaya stayed with us all day, 
and at night slept in Oborea's canoe, not without a bedfellow, though the gentleman cannot be less than forty-five. 1769, May 4. This morn, no trade this morn, but a little fish. So we are for the first time in distress for necessaries. I went into the woods to Tuburai, and persuaded him to give me five long baskets of breadfruit, a very seasonable supply, as they contain above one hundred and twenty fruits. A very few Indians appear today before the fort, fewer than yesterday. After dinner came a messenger from Dutaha requesting a shirt and a hatchet. He had been here yesterday with the same demand. I suppose in return for the hog he gave us on his release. The captain sent him back, telling him that he would tomorrow visit him and bring the things himself. In the evening I went into the woods, found the Indians as usual civil, but complaining much of the treatment Dutaha had met with on the 2nd. 1769, May 5. This morning, Obadi, Her Majesty's bedfellow, came pretty early to visit us, or rather himself, to take a view of her canoe. He carefully overhauled everything in it, and complained of the loss of some trifling thing. I could not understand what. After this, he brought everything out of it, and delivered them into my charge, desiring they might be taken care of, after which he left us. A very small quantity of breadfruit brought this morn. At breakfast time came two messengers from Dutaha to put the captain in mind of his promising of visiting him. Accordingly, at nine, the boat set out carrying the captain, Dr. Solander, and myself. We arrived in about an hour, a paré, his residence being about four miles from the tents. An imminent throng of people met us on the shore crowding us very much, though they were severely beat for doing so by a tall, well-looking man who laced about him with a long stick most unmercifully, striking all who did not get out of his way without intermission till he had cleared us a path sufficient to go to Dutaha, who was seated under a tree attended by a few grave-looking old men. With him we sat down and made our presents consisting of an axe and a gown of broadcloth made after their fashion and trimmed with tape. With these he seemed mightily satisfied. Soon after this, Oboria joined us, and with her I retired to a house adjacent, where I could be free from the suffocating heat, occasioned by so large a crowd of people as were gathered about us. Here was prepared for our diversion and entertainment, quite new to us, a wrestling match, at which the other gentlemen soon joined us. A large courtyard railed round with bamboo about three feet high was the scene of this diversion. At one end of this, Dutaha was seated, and near him was left seats for us, but we rather chose to range at large among the spectators than confine ourselves to any particular spot. The diversion began by the combatants, some of them at least, walking round the yard with a slow and grave pace, every now and then striking their left arms very hard, by which they caused a deep and very loud noise, which it seems was a challenge to each other or any one of the company who chose to engage in the exercise. Within the house stood the old men, ready to give applause to the victor, and some few women who seemed to be here out of compliment to us, as much the larger number absented themselves upon the occasion. The general challenge was given, as I before said. The particular one soon followed it, by which any man singled out his antagonist. It was done by joining the finger ends of both hands, even with the breast, and then moving the elbows up and down. If this was accepted, the challenged immediately returned the signal, and instantly both put themselves in an attitude to engage, which they very soon did, striving to seize each other by the hands, hair, or the cloth they had round their middles, for they had no other dress. This done, they attempted to seize each other by the thigh, which commonly decided the contest in the fall of him who was thus taken at disadvantage. If this was not soon done, they always parted either by consent, or their friends interfered in less than a minute, in which case both began to clap their arms and seek anew for an antagonist, either in each other or someone else. When anyone fell, the whole amusement ceased for a few moments, in which time the old men in the house gave their applause in a few words, which they repeated together in a kind of tune. This lasted about two hours, all which time the man who we observed at our first landing continued to beat the people, who did not keep at proper distance, most unmercifully. We understood that he was some officer belonging to Dutaha, and was called Tom T. The wrestling over, the gentleman informed me that they understood that two hogs, and a large quantity of breadfruit, etc., was cooking for our dinners, news which pleased me very well, 
as my stomach was by this time sufficiently prepared for the repast. I went out and saw the ovens in which they were now buried. These the Indians readily showed me, telling me at the same time that they would soon be ready, and how good a dinner we should have. In about half an hour all was taken up, but now Dutaha began to repent of his intended generosity. He thought, I suppose, that a hog would be looked upon as no more than a dinner, and consequently no present made in return. He therefore changed his mind, and ordering one of the pigs into the boat, sent for us, who soon collected together, and getting our knives prepared to fall too, saying that it was civil of the old gentleman to bring the provisions into the boat, where we could with ease keep the people at a proper distance, who in the house would have crowded us almost to death. His intention was, however, very different from ours, for instead of asking us to eat, he asked to go on board of the ship, a measure we were forced to comply with, and row four miles with the pig, growing cold under our noses, before he would give it to us. Aboard, however, we dined upon this same pig, and his majesty eat very heartily with us. After dinner we went ashore. The sight of Dutaha, reconciled to us, acted like a charm upon the people, and before night breadfruit and coconuts were brought to sell in tolerable plenty. 1769, May 6. Plenty of breadfruit at market this morn, but few coconuts. After dinner Dutaha visited the tents, bringing five baskets of breadfruit and some coconuts. He went to the eastward and slept tonight at a long house. Trade rather slack this morn, but we have so much breadfruit beforehand from the trade and presents of yesterday that it is immaterial whether we buy any or not today. 1769, May 7. After dinner, Dutaha came in a double canoe. After him came another, bringing four hogs, and one of these he ordered out of the boat with some breadfruit. I undertook to coax him out of the rest, but had not the success I could have wished. He would part with only one more, and for that the captain and myself were obliged to go aboard with him and give him a broad X. 1769, May 8. Messrs. Molyneux and Green went to the eastward today in the pinnace intending to purchase hogs. They went twenty miles, saw many hogs and one turtle, but the people would part with neither one nor the other. They belonged, they said, to Dutaha, and without his leave they could not sell them. We now began to think that Dutaha is indeed a great king, much greater than we have been used to imagine him. Indeed, his influence upon the late occasion as well as today has proved to be so great that we can hardly doubt it. Mr. Green measured today a tree which he saw. It proved to be sixty yards in circumference. He brought home some boughs of it, but they were thrown overboard before I could see them, so the species of this monstrous tree remains a doubt with us. This morn I fixed my little boat before the door of the fort, it serves very well for a place to trade in. Trade is not now as it had been. Formerly we used to buy enough for all hands, between sunrise and eight o'clock. Now attendance must be given all day, or little can be done. 1769, May 9. Coconuts have been for some days rather scarce. We are therefore obliged for the first time to bring out our nails. Last night our smallest size, about four inches long, was offered for twenty coconuts. Accordingly, this morning several came with that number, so that we had plenty of them. Smaller lots, as well as breadfruit, sold, as usual, for beads. Soon after breakfast came Oboria, Obadi, and Tupaya, bringing a hog and some breadfruit. They stayed with us till night, then took away their canoe and promised to return in three days. We had today 350 coconuts, and more breadfruit than we would buy, so that we approached our former plenty. 1769, May 10. This morn, Captain Cook planted diverse seeds, which he had brought with him in a spot of ground turned up for the purpose. They were all bought of Gordon at Mile End, and sent in bottles sealed up. Whether or no that method will succeed, the event of this plantation will show. Plenty of breadfruit and coconuts again today. Towards evening, Tuberai and Tumayo returned from the west, and seemed extremely glad to see all of us. We have now got the Indian name of the island, Otahite, so therefore for the future, I shall call it that. As for our names, the Indians find so much difficulty in pronouncing them that we are forced to indulge them in calling us what they please, or rather what they say, when they attempt to pronounce them. I give here the list. Captain Cook, Tuta. Dr. Solander, Torano. Mr. Hicks, Hete. Mr. Gore, Toaro. Mr. Molino, Boba. From his Christian name, Robert. Mr. Monkhouse, Mato and myself, Tapane. In this manner, 
They have names for almost every man in the ship. 1769, May 11. Coconuts were brought down so plentifully this morn that by half past six I had bought 350. This made it necessary to drop the price of them, lest so many being brought at once we should exhaust the country and want hereafter. Notwithstanding I had before night bought more than a thousand at the rates of six for an amber-colored bead, ten for a white one, and twenty for a four-penny nail. 1769, May 12. Coconuts very plentiful this morning. About breakfast time, Dutaha visits us. Immediately after, while I sat trading in the boat at the door of the fort, a double canoe came with several women and one man under the awning. The Indians round me made signs that I should go out and meet them. By the time I had got out of the boat, they were within ten yards of me. The people made a lane from them to me. They stopped and made signs for me to do the same. The man in company with them had in his hands a large bunch of boughs. He advanced towards me bringing two, one a younger plantain, the other blank. Tupaya, who stood by me, acted as my deputy in receiving them and laying them down in the boat. Six times he passed backwards and forwards in the same manner and bringing the same present. Another man then came forward, having in his arms a large bundle of cloth. This he opened out and spread it piece by piece on the ground between the women and me. It consisted on nine pieces. Three were first laid. The foremost of the women, who seemed to be the principal, then stepped upon them, and quickly unveiling all her charms, gave me a most convenient opportunity of admiring them, by turning herself gradually round. Three pieces more were laid, and she repeated her part of the ceremony. The other three were then laid, which made a treble covering of the ground between her and me. She then once more displayed her naked beauties, and immediately marched up to me, a man following her, and doubling up the cloth as he came forwards, which she immediately made me understand was intended as a present for me. I took her by the hand and led her to the tents, accompanied by another woman, her friend. To both of them I made presents, but could not prevail upon them, to stay more than an hour. In the evening, Oberia and her favorite attendant, Otheothea, paid us a visit, much to my satisfaction, as the latter, my flame, has for some days been reported either ill or dead. End of section 12, part 1 of May, 1769. Section 13 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August, 1768, to 12 July, 1771, by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 13. May, 1769, Part 2. 1769, May 13. Our friends with us this morn, in very good time, as they generally are. Very shortly after sunrise, plenty of coconuts, etc., at the market. After it was over, at ten o'clock, I walked into the woods with my gun, as I generally did to spend the heat of the day in the Indian houses, where I could be cool from the shade of the trees which everywhere grow about them. In my return, I met Tuburai near his house. I stopped with him. He took my gun out of my hand, cocked it, and holding it up in the air, drew the trigger. Fortunately for him, it flashed in the pan. Where he had got so much knowledge of the use of a gun, I could not conceive, but was sufficiently angry, that he should attempt to exercise it upon mine, as I had upon all occasions taught him and the rest of the Indians that they could not offend me so much as even to touch it. I scolded him severely and even threatened to shoot him. He bore all patiently, but the moment I had crossed the river, he and his family, bag and baggage, moved to their other house at Ipare. This step was no sooner taken than I was informed of it by the Indians about the fort. Not willing to lose the assistance of a man who had upon all occasions been particularly useful to us, I resolved to go this evening and bring him back. Accordingly, as soon as dinner was over, I set out, accompanied by Mr. Molyneux. We found him setting in the middle of a large circle of people, himself and many of the rest, with most melancholy countenances, some in tears. One old woman, on our coming into the circle, struck a shark's tooth into her head many times, till it foamed with blood, but her head seemed to have been so often exercised with this expression of grief, that it was become quite callous, for though the crown of it was covered with blood, enough did not issue from the wounds to run upon her cheeks. 
After some few assurances of forgiveness, Tuburai agreed to return with us, in consequence of which resolution a double canoe was put off, in which we all returned to the tents before supper time. And as a token of a renewal of friendship, both him and his wife slept in my tent all night. About eleven, one of the natives attempted to scale our walls, intending, no doubt, to steal whatever he could find. But seeing himself observed, he made off much faster than any of our people could follow him. 1769, May 14. Our friends, Dutaha, Oberia, Otheothea, etc., at the tents this morn as usual. It being Sunday, Captain Cook proposed that divine service should be celebrated, but before the proper time of doing it, most of our Indian friends were gone home to eat. I was resolved, however, that some should be present, that they might see our behavior, and we might, if possible, explain to them, in some degree at least, the reasons of it. I went, therefore, over the river and brought back to Borai and Tomio, and having seated them in the tent, placed myself between them. During the whole service, they imitated my motions, standing, setting, or kneeling, as they saw me do, and so much understood that we were about something very serious that they called to the Indians without the fort to be silent. Notwithstanding this, they did not, when the service was over, ask any questions, nor would they attend at all to any explanations we attempted to give them. We have not yet seen the least traces of religion among these people. Maybe they are entirely without it. 1769, May 15. In the course of last night, one of the Indians was clever enough to steal an iron-bound cask. It was indeed without the fort, but so immediately under the eye of the sentry that we could hardly believe the possibility of such a thing having happened when we looked at the place. The Indians, however, acknowledged it and seemed inclined to give intelligence, in consequence of which I set off in pursuit of it and traced it to a part of the bay where they told me it had been put into a canoe. The thing was not of consequence enough to pursue with any great spirit, so I returned home, where I found Oboria, Otheothea, Obadi, etc. At night, Tuburai made many signs that another cask would be stole before morning, and thinking, I suppose, that we did not sufficiently regard them, himself, his wife, and family, came to the place where the cask lay, and making their beds, said that they would themselves take care that no one should steal them. On being told this, I went to them and explaining to them that a sentry was this night put over those particular casks. They agreed to come and sleep in my tent, but insisted upon leaving a servant to assist the sentry, in case the thief came, which he did about twelve, and was seen by the sentry, who fired at him, on which he retreated most expeditiously. 1769, May 16. The morning wet and disagreeable. We hauled the seine in several parts of the bay without the least success. The Indians are so fond of fish, and so expert in catching it, using almost every method we do in Europe, that our want of success is not at all to be wondered at. Tonight, Tuburai, Tomio, Oberia, Obadi, and Othiothea slept in my tent. At midnight, the water casks were again attempted, and two shot fired at the thief, which alarmed my bedfellows not a little. They were, however, soon quieted by my going out and bringing back word of the reason of the firing. 1769, May 17. Fine weather. Oberia and her friends went early to Ipare, as the rest of our chiefs did yesterday, in eighteen double canoes, so that we are quite dull for want of company in the tents. Tuburai and Tamio slept with me as usual. 1769, May 18. Fine weather and good market. The apples now begin to ripe, and are brought in in large quantities, very cheap, so that apple pies are a standing dish with us. 1769, May 19. This morning, Tuburai, who had slept with me as usual, was observed by my servant to have an uncommonly large nail under his clothes. This I was informed of, and knowing that no such had been either given or disposed of in trade, was obliged to suspect my friend of theft. I therefore went instantly to his house and charged him with it. He immediately confessed, but attempted to keep his booty by telling me that the nail was gone to Ipare. I became much in earnest, and a few threats soon produced the stolen goods. I was more hurt at the discovery than he was. I firmly believe he was the only Indian I trusted, and in him I had placed a most unbounded confidence. This event shows more than he could bear. Seven of these nails lay in a basket, in one of the tents, and on examining it, five were missing. I thought it necessary after this discovery to bring the offender to the tents to receive judgment, which I did. Everybody there was of opinion that his fault was pardonable. 
I confess that upon thinking over the circumstances, I blamed myself more for leaving the nails in his way than him for stealing them. It was therefore resolved that if he brought back the other four, he should be forgiven and his fault forgot. This I told him, and he agreed readily, but instead of performing his part, he and his family moved off before night, taking with them all their furniture. 1769, May 20. Rain and very disagreeable weather, so that we had but little trade. About ten, Oborea came to the fort and brought a large present of breadfruit. She had with her Othiothea and her other maids of honor, as we call them, but Obadi, her gentleman attendant, was absent. We inquired the reason. She told us that she had dismissed him. About eight, however, he came by torchlight, and going to the house in the woods, where she slept, slept with her. 1769, May 21. Sunday. Divine service performed, at which was present Oberea, Othiothea, Obadi, etc. All behaved very decently. After dinner, Obadi, who had been for some time absent, returned to the fort. Oberea desired he might not be let in. His countenance was, however, so melancholy that we could not but admit him. He looked most piteously at Oberea, she most disdainfully at him. She seems to us to act in the character of a Ninon d'Enclou, who satiated with her lover resolves to change him at all events. The more so, as I am offered, if I please, to supply his place. But I am at present otherwise engaged. Indeed, was I free as heir, Her Majesty's person is not the most desirable. 1769, May 22. This morning showery and cool, seemingly a good opportunity of going upon the hills. I went accompanied only by Indians, indeed all of them, but one soon left me. He, however, accompanied me during my whole walk. The paths were very open and clear till I came to the woods, but afterwards very bad, so much so that I could not reach the top of the lowest of the two high hills seen from the fort, which was all I intended. I was in some measure, however, recompensed by finding several plants which I had not seen before, with which I returned before sunset, and had Oberea, Obadi, and Othiothea to sleep with me in my tent. 1769, May 22. Trade very slack today, so much so that we have only coconuts for the sick, and the people are obliged to have bread served them at dinner. 1769, May 24. We had received repeated messages from Dutaha, signifying that if we could go and visit him, we should have four hogs for our pains. In consequence of this, our first lieutenant was sent today with orders to go to him and try if by any civilities he could show him he could procure them. He found him removed from his old residence at Ipare to a place called Titahaha, about five miles farther. He was received with great cordiality. One hog was immediately produced, and he was told that the others should be brought somewhere from a distance if he would stay till next morning. This he did not at all scruple. The morning came, however, without the hogs, so he was obliged to return with the one he had got overnight, not a little dissatisfied with Dutaha's non-performance of his promises. Messrs. Monkhouse and Green attempted this day to climb the same hill that I attempted on the 22nd, with much the same success. They got, however, higher than I did, but could not reach the summit. 1769, May 25. Tuburai and Mio made their appearance at the fort for the first time since the breach of the 19th. He in particular seemed much frightened, nor did my behavior to him give him much comfort. I had resolved not to restore him either to my friendship or confidence, unless he restored the nails, which he seemed to have no intention of doing. After staying a little time, he went home, sulky as he came. 1769, May 26. Mr. Monkhouse, who I think is rather too partial to Tuburai, went this morning to his house, intending to persuade him to come to the tents. He made many excuses. He was hungry, he must sleep, his head ached. In short, he would not, nor did he come. Tamillo, however, did, but took alarm at my being absent, who was aboard of the ship and soon departed. 1769, May 27. This day Mr. Monkhouse went to Ipare with Tuburai and Tamillo. Mark a tolerable. Mr. Hicks, in his return from Dutaha, brought word that if the captain would go over, the four pigs would be given to him. This produced a resolution of going tomorrow, though we none of us much credited his promise. Yet, we would leave no stone unturned to keep him in good humor. I omitted to mention on the 25th that the longboat, being very leaky, was hauled dry, and her bottom found to be eat entirely through by worm, which surprises us much, 
as the dolphin's boats met with no such inconvenience. Her bottom was paved with brimstone and tallow. The pinnace, which has been in the water as long as her, is totally untouched, which we attribute to hers being painted with white lead and oil. 1769, May 28. This morning the pinnace set out for the eastward with the captain, Dr. Solander, and myself. Dutaha was removed from Titaha, where Mr. Hicks saw him on the 24th, to Atahuru, about six miles farther, a place to which the boat could not go. We were resolved not to be disappointed, so walked afoot. It was evening before we arrived. We found him sitting under a tree with a vast crowd about him as usual. We made our presents in due form, consisting of a yellow stuff petticoat, etc., which were graciously received, and a hog immediately brought, with many promises of more in the morning. Night came on apace. It was necessary to look out for lodgings. As Dutaha made no offer of any, I repaired to my old friend Ogoria, who readily gave me a bed in her canoe much to my satisfaction. I acquainted my fellow travellers with my good fortune, and wishing them as good, took my leave. We went to bed early, as is the custom here. I stripped myself for the greater convenience of sleeping, as the night was hot. Oberia insisted that my clothes should be put into her custody, otherwise, she said, they would certainly be stolen. I readily submitted and laid down to sleep, with all imaginable tranquility. About eleven I awaked, and wanting to get up felt for my clothes in the place in which I had seen them laid at night, but they were missing. I awaked Oberia. She started up, and on my complaining of the loss, candles were immediately lit. Dutaha, who slept in the next canoe, came to us, and both went in search of the thief. For such it seems it was who had stolen my coat and waistcoat, with my pistols, powder horn, etc. They returned, however, in about one half an hour, without any news of the stolen goods. I began to be a little alarmed. My musket was left me, but that, by my neglect the night before, was not loaded. I did not know where Captain Cook or Dr. Solander had disposed of themselves. Consequently, could not call upon them for assistance. Tupia stood near me, awakened by the hubbub that had been raised on account of my loss. To him I gave my musket, charging him to take care that the thief did not get it from him, and betook myself again to rest, telling my companions in the boat that I was well satisfied with the paints that Oberia and Dutaha had taken for the recovery of my things. Soon after, I heard their music and saw lights near me. I got up and went towards them. It was a haiva, or assembly, according to their custom. Here I saw Captain Cook and told my melancholy story. He was my fellow sufferer. He had lost his stockings, and the two young gentlemen who were with him had lost each a jacket. Dr. Solander was away. We neither of us knew where. We talked over our losses and agreed that nothing could be done toward recovering them till the morning, after which we parted and went to our respective sleeping places. 1769, May 29. At daybreak we rose according to the custom of our companions. Tupaya was the first man I saw, attending with my musket and the remainder of my clothes. His faith had often been tried. On this occasion, it shone very much. Oberia took care to provide me with cloth to supply the place of my lost jacket, so that I made a motley appearance, my dress being half English and half Indian. Dutaha soon after made his appearance. I pressed him to recover my jacket, but neither he nor Oboria would take the least step towards it, so that I am inclined to believe that they acted principles in the theft. Indeed, if they did, it may be said in their excuse that they knew I had in my pockets a pair of pistols, weapons to them more dreadful than a cannon to a man marching up to its mouth. Could they get possession of them, they thought no doubt, that they would be as useful to them as to us. Self-defense and preservation, therefore, in this case, came in opposition to the laws of hospitality, duties to which mankind usually give the preference in all cases. About eight, Dr. Solander returned from a house about a mile off, where he had slept. He had met with more honest companions than we had, for nothing of his was missing. We spent the most of the morning in trying to persuade our friends either to restore our clothes or to give us some hogs, according to promise, but neither could they do. So we were forced to set out for the boat, with only the pig got yesterday, dissatisfied enough with our expedition. In our return to the boat, we saw the Indians amuse or exercise themselves in a manner truly surprising. It was in a place where the shore was not guarded by a reef, as is usually the case. Consequently, 
a high surf fell upon the shore, a more dreadful one I have not often seen. No European boat could have landed in it, and I think no European who had by any means got into it could possibly have saved his life, as the shore was covered with pebbles and large stones. In the midst of these breakers, ten or twelve Indians were swimming, who, whenever a surf broke near them, dived under it with infinite ease, rising up on the other side. But their chief amusement was carried on by the stern of an old canoe. With this before them they swam out as far as the outermost breach. Then one or two would get into it, and opposing the blunt end to the breaking wave, were hurried in with incredible swiftness. Sometimes they were carried almost ashore, but generally the wave broke over them before they were halfway, in which case they dived and quickly rose on the other side, with the canoe in their hands, which was towed out again, and the same method repeated. We stood, admiring this very wonderful scene, for full half an hour, in which time no one of the actors attempted to come ashore, but all seemed most highly entertained with their strange diversion. 1769, May 30. Carpenters employed today in repairing the longboat, which is eat in a most wonderful manner. Every part of her bottom is like a honeycomb, and some of the holes one-eighth of an inch in diameter. Such a progress has this destructive insect made in six weeks. 1769, May 31. The day of observation now approaches. The weather has been for some days fine, though in general, since we have been upon the island, we have had as much cloudy as clear weather, which makes us all not a little anxious for success. In consequence of hints from Lord Morton, the captain resolves to send a party to the eastward, and another to Emao, an island in sight of us, thinking that in case of thick weather, one or the other might be more successful than the observatory. The carpenters work very hard to finish the longboat. I resolve to go to the Emao expedition. End of section 13. May, 1769. Section 14 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August, 1768 to 12 July, 1771 by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 14. June, 1769, Part 1. 1769, June 1. The boat could not be got ready till after dinner when we set out. We rode most of the night and came to a grappling just under the land of Imao. 1769, June 2. Soon after daybreak we saw an Indian canoe, and upon hailing her she showed us an inlet through the reef, into which we pulled, and soon fixed upon a coral rock, about 150 yards from the shore, as a very proper situation for our observatory. It was about 80 yards long and 60 broad, and had in the middle of it a bed of white sand, large enough for our tents to stand upon. The second lieutenant and people therefore immediately set about it, while I went upon the main island to trade with the inhabitants for provisions, of which I soon bought a sufficient supply. Before night our observatory was in order, telescopes all set up and tried, etc., and we went to rest, anxious for the events of tomorrow. The evening, having been very fine, gave us, however, great hopes of success. 1769, June 3. Various were the changes observed in the weather during the course of last night. Some one or other of us was up every half hour, who constantly informed the rest that it was either clear or hazy. At daybreak we rose, and soon after had the satisfaction of seeing the sun rise as clear and bright as we could wish him. I then wished success to the observers, Messrs. Gore and Monkhouse, and repaired to the island, where I could do the double service of examining the natural produce and buying provisions for my companions who were engaged in so useful a work. About eight, a large quantity of provisions were procured when I saw two boats coming towards the place where I traded. These, I was told, belonged to Taroa, the king of the island, who was coming to pay me a visit. As soon as the boats came near the shore, the people formed a lane. He landed, bringing with him his sister, Nuna, and both came towards the tree under which I stood. I went out and met them, and brought them very formally into a circle I had made, into which I had before suffered none of the natives to come. Standing is not the fashion among these people. I must provide them a seat, which I did by unwrapping a turban of Indian cloth, which I wore instead of a hat, and spreading it upon the ground, upon which we all sat down, and the king's present was brought, consisting of a hog, a dog, a quantity of breadfruit, coconuts, etc. 
I immediately sent a canoe to the observatory to fetch my present, and adds a shirt, and some beads, with which His Majesty seemed well satisfied. Tuburai and Tamayo, who came with us now, came from the observatory. She said that she was related to Taroa, and brought him a present, a long nail, and a shirt, which she gave to Nuna. After the first internal contact was over, I went to my companions at the observatory, carrying with me Taroa, Nuna, and some of their chief attendants. To them we showed the planet upon the sun, and made them understand that we came on purpose to see it. After this, they went back, and myself with them. I spent the rest of the day in examining the produce, etc., of the island, and found it very nearly similar to that of Otahiti. The people exactly the same. Indeed, we saw many of the identical same people, as we had often seen at Otahite, and every one knew very well every kind of trade we had and the value it bore in that island. The hills in general came nearer to the water, and flats were considerably less, and less fertile, than at Otahite. The low point near which we lay was composed entirely of sand and coral. Here neither breadfruit nor any useful vegetables would grow. It was covered over with pandanus tectorius, and with these grew several plants we had not seen at Otahite. Among them, Iberus, which Mr. Gore tells me is the plant called by the voyagers scurvy grass, which grows plentifully upon all the low islands. At sunset I came off, having purchased another hog from the king. Soon after my arrival at the tent, three handsome girls came off in a canoe to see us. They had been at the tent in the morning with Taroa. They chatted with us very freely, and with very little persuasion agreed to send away their carriage and sleep in the tent, a proof of confidence which I have not before met with upon so short an acquaintance. 1769, June 4. We prepared ourselves to depart, in spite of the entreaties of our fair companions, who persuaded us much to stay. What with presents and trade, our stock of provisions was so large that we were obliged to give away a large quantity. This done we put off, and before night arrived at the tents, where we have the great satisfaction that the observation there had been attended with as much success as Mr. Green and the captain could wish. The day having been perfectly clear, not so much as a cloud intervening. We also heard the melancholy news that a large part of our stock of nails had been purloined by some of the ship's company during the time of the observation, when everybody was ashore who had any degree of command. One of the thieves was detected, but only seven nails were found upon him, out of one hundred weight, and he bore his punishment without impeaching any of his accomplices. This loss is of a very serious nature, as these nails have circulated by the people among the Indians will much lessen the value of iron, our staple commodity. 1769, June 5. During our absence at Imau, an old woman of some consequence, a relation of Tamio, was dead, and was placed not far from the fort, to rot above ground, as is the custom of the island. I went this morn to see her. A small square was neatly railed in with bamboo, and in the midst of it a canoe awning set up upon two posts. In this the body was laid, covered with fine cloth. Near this was laid fish, etc., meat for the gods, not for the deceased, but to satisfy the hunger of the deities, lest they should eat the body, which Tuberai told us they would certainly do if this ceremony was neglected. In front of the square was a kind of stile, or place lower than the rest, where the relations of the deceased stood when they cried or bled themselves, and under the awning were numberless rags containing the blood and tears they had shed. Within a few yards were two occasional houses, in one of them, some of the relations constantly remained, generally a good many. In the other, the chief male mourner resided, and kept a very remarkable dress, in which he performed a ceremony, both which I shall describe, when I have an opportunity of seeing it in perfection, which Tuburai promises me I shall soon have. This day we kept the king's birthday, which had been delayed on account of the absence of the two observing parties. Several of the Indians dined with us and drank His Majesty's health, by the name of Kihi Arko for we could not teach them to pronounce a word more like King George. Tupaya, however, to show his loyalty, got most enormously drunk. 1769, June 6. In walking into the woods yesterday, I saw in the hands of an Indian an iron tool, made in the shape of the Indian adzes. Very different, I was sure, from anything that had been carried out or made, either by the dolphin or this ship. This excited my curiosity, much the more so, when I was told that it did not come out of either of those ships, but from two others which came here together. This was a discovery not to be neglected. 
With much difficulty and labor, I at last got the following account of them. This, that in their month of Peperi, which answers to our January, 1768, two Spanish ships came here, commanded by a man whom they called To Otra, that they lay eight days in a bay called Hidia, some leagues to the eastward of Matavi, where the ship now lies, that during their stay they sent tents ashore, and some slept in them, that they were chiefly connected with a chief, whose name was Orete, whose younger brother they carried away with them, promising to return in nine months, that they had on board their ships a woman, and that on their departure they stood to the westward as long as they were seen from the island. I was very particular in these inquiries, as the knowledge got by them may be of some consequence. The methods I took to gain this account would be much too tedious to mention. One of my greatest difficulties was to determine of what nation they were, which was done thus. I pointed to our colors and asked whether the ship said such or not. No, was the answer, when the question was thoroughly understood. I opened a large sheet of flags, and asked which of them they had. Tuburai looked steadfastly over them, and at last pitched upon the Spanish ensign, and to that he adhered, though we tried him over and over. 1769, June 7. We were this morn visited by several of Dutaha's relations, women especially, probably to sound us upon the score of our usage at Atahoru. We had resolved at that place rather to put up with our losses than to matau or frighten the Indians, the consequence of which we knew to be scarcity of provisions. We therefore treated these people very well, making them presents to tempt them to come again and bring Dutaha, king of the hogs, as we called him, and certainly have always found him. 1769, June 8. Fresh proofs of the Spanish ships every day and things of theirs, which have been left here. Among the rest, a coarse shirt and a woolen jacket, both of manufacture different from any English. 1769, June 9. Yesterday and today, the Heiva no Medua, or funeral ceremony, walked. My curiosity was raised by his most singular dress. I was desirous of knowing what he did during his walk. I asked to Borai, at the same time, desired leave to attend him to-morrow, upon which my consenting to perform a character was readily granted. To-morrow, therefore, I am to be smutted from head to foot, and to do whatever they desire me to do. Breadfruit has for some time been scarce with us. About ten days ago the trees were thinned all at once, from there being a great show of fruit. Everyone was employed in making mahi for about a week. Where the breadfruit we now have comes from, we cannot tell, but we have more than the woods in our neighborhood can supply us with. Probably our consumption has thinned the trees in this neighborhood, as the dolphins, who came here about this time, saw great plenty all the time they stayed. If this is the case, what we now get may be brought from some neighboring place, where the trees are not yet exhausted. 1769, June 10. This evening, according to my yesterday's engagement, I went to the place where the Medua lay, where I found Tuborai, Tamio, Huna, the Medua's daughter, and a young Indian prepared to receive me. Tuborai was the Heiva. The three others and myself were to Nineveh. He put on his dress, most fantastical, though not unbecoming. The figure in next will explain it far better than words can. I was next prepared by stripping off my European cloths and putting me on a small strip of cloth round my waist, the only garment I was allowed to have. But I had no pretensions to be ashamed of my nakedness, for neither of the women were a bit more covered than myself. They then began to smut me and themselves with charcoal and water. The Indian boy was completely black, the women and myself as low as our shoulders. We then set out. Tuburai began by praying twice, one near the corpse, again near his own house. We then proceeded toward the fort. It was necessary, it seems, that the procession should visit that place, but they dare not do it without the sanction of some of us. Indeed, it was not till many assurances of our consent that they ventured to perform any part of their ceremonies. To the fort, then, we went, to the surprise of our friends and a fright of the Indians who were there, for they everywhere fly before the Heiva, like sheep before a wolf. We soon left it and proceeded along the shore towards a place where above one hundred Indians were collected together. We, the Nenevas, had orders from the Heiva to disperse them. We ran towards them, but before we came within one hundred yards of them, they dispersed every way, running to the first shelter, hiding themselves under grass, or whatever else would conceal them. We now crossed the river into the woods and passed several houses. All were deserted. 
not another Indian did we see for about half an hour that we spent in walking about. We, the Nineves, then came to the Heiva and said, Imatata, there are no people. After which we repaired home, the Heiva undressed, and we went into the river and scrubbed one another till it was dark before the blackening would come off. 1769, June 11. This evening, Tuburai came to the tents, bringing a bow and arrows. In consequence of a challenge, Mr. Gore had given him some time ago to shoot. This challenge was, however, misunderstood. Tuburai meant to try who could shoot the farthest. Mr. Gore to shoot at a mark, and neither was at all practiced in what the other valued himself upon. Tuburai, to please us, shot in his way. He knelt down and drew the bow, and as soon as he let slip the string dropped the bow from his hand. The arrow, however, went 274 yards. 1769, June 12. In my morning's walk today, I met a company of traveling musicians. They told me where they should be at night, so after supper, we all repaired to the place. There was a large concourse of people round this band, which consisted of two flutes and three drums, the drummers accompanying their music with their voices. They sung many songs generally in praise of us, for these gentlemen like Homer of old must be poets, as well as musicians. The Indians seeing us entertained with their music, asked us to sing them an English song, which we most readily agreed to, and received much applause, so much so, that one of the musicians became desirous of going to England to learn to sing. These people, by what we can learn, go about from house to house. The master of the house and the audience, paying them for their music in cloth, meat, beads, or anything else, which the one wants and the other can spare. 1769, June 13. Mr. Monkhouse, our surgeon, met today with an insult from an Indian, the first that has been met with by any of us. He was pulling a flower from a tree, which grew on a burying ground, and consequently was, I suppose, sacred, when an Indian came behind him and struck him. He seized hold of him and attempted to beat him, but was prevented by two more who, coming up, seized hold of his hair and rescued their companion, after which they all ran away. 1769, June 14. I lay in the woods last night, as I very often did. At daybreak I was called up by Mr. Gore and went with him shooting from which party we did not return till night, when we saw a large number of canoes in the river behind the tents, of which we have this account. Last night an Indian was clever enough to steal a coal rake out of the fort without being perceived. In the morning it was missing, and Captain Cook being resolved to recover it, as also to discourage such attempts for the future, went out with a party of men and seized twenty-five of their large sailing canoes, which were just come in from Tithuroa a neighboring island, with a supply of fish for the inhabitants of this. The coal rake was upon this soon brought back, but Captain Cook thought he now had in his hands an opportunity of recovering all the things which had been stolen. He therefore proclaimed to every one that till all the things which had been stolen from us were brought back, the boats should not stir. A list of these was immediately drawn up and read several times to the Indians, who readily promised that everything should be brought back. Great application was made to me in my return that some of these might be released. I did not, till I got to the fort, understand the reason of their being detained, and when I did nothing appeared so plain as that no one of them should on any account be let go from favor, but the whole kept till the things were returned, if ever they were, which I much doubted, as the canoes pretty certainly did not belong to the people who had stolen the things. I confess, had I taken a step so violent, I would have seized either the persons of the people who had stolen from us, most of whom we either knew or shrewdly suspected, or their goods at least instead of those of people who are entirely unconcerned in the affair, and have not probably interest enough with their superiors, to whom all valuable things are carried, to procure the restoration demanded. 1769, June 15. Some few presents today, but no trade at all. We found ourselves today involved in an unexpected difficulty with regard to the boats. They were loaded with provisions which their owners must live upon or starve, in consequence of which they asked leave to go and take them out, and are allowed to do so as much as they can eat. We are not able, however, to distinguish the true owners, so many avail themselves of this indulgence by stealing their neighbors, which we cannot prevent. Indeed, in a few days more, the whole consisting chiefly of fish, cured to keep about that time, 
will be spoiled. 1769, June 16. Some presents today, but no trade. Several petitions for canoes backed by our principal friends, but none complied with. In the afternoon, the body of the old woman, which lay near us, was removed, but to what place or on what account we could not learn. 1769, June 17. This morn, Mr. Gore and myself went to Opare to shoot ducks, little thinking what the consequence of our expedition would be, for, before we had half filled our bags, we had frightened away Dutaha and all his household and furniture, a matter of no small diversion to us, to find his majesty so much more fearful than his ducks. 1769, June 18. This morn the boat was sent to get ballast for the ship. The officer sent in her, not finding stones convenient, began to pull down a burying ground. To this the Indians objected much, and a messenger came to the tents, saying that they would not suffer it. I went with the second lieutenant to the place. They had desired them to desist from destroying the burying ground they had begun upon, but showed them another. The officer, however, thought it best not to molest anything of the kind, and sent the people to the river, where they gathered stones very easily, without any possibility of offending anybody. 1769, June 19. The fish in the canoes stink most immoderately, so as in some winds to render our situation in the tents rather disagreeable. This evening, Oboria, Othiothea, and Tuarua came to visit us for the first time since the affair of the jacket. They were very desirous of sleeping in the fort, but my marquis was full of Indians, and no one else chose to entertain them, so they were obliged to repair to their canoes to sleep rather out of humor. 1769, June 20. This morn early, Oberia and company came to the tents, bringing a large quantity of provisions as a present. Among the rest, a very fat dog. We had lately learned that these animals were eaten by the Indians and esteemed more delicate food than pork. Now, therefore, was our opportunity of trying the experiment. He was given immediately over to Tupaya, who, finding that it was a food that we were not accustomed to, undertook to stand butcher and cook both. He killed him by stopping his breath, holding his hands fast over his mouth and nose, an operation which took above a quarter of an hour. He then proceeded to dress him much in the same manner as we would do a pig, singeing him over the fire, which was lighted to roast him, and scraping him clean with a shell. He then opened him with the same instrument, and taking out his entrails, pluck, etc., sent him to the sea, where they were most carefully washed, then put into coconut shells with what blood he had found in them. The stones were now laid, and the dog well covered with leaves laid upon them. In about two hours he was dressed, and in another quarter of an hour completely eat. A most excellent dish he made for us, who were not much prejudiced against any species of food. I cannot, however, promise that an European dog would eat as well, as these scarce in their lives touch animal food, coconut kernel, breadfruit, yams, etc., being what their masters can best afford to give them, and what indeed from custom, I suppose, they prefer to any kind of food. 1769, June 21. This morning came Oamo, a chief we had not seen before. With him came a boy and a young woman, to whom all the people present showed a most uncommon respect, everyone taking their garments from their shoulders and wrapping them round their breasts. We were, upon this, very desirous of showing them all the respect we could, as well as learning who they were. We could not, however, prevail upon the woman to come into the tents, though she seemed very desirous of it. The people all joined in preventing her by their advice at some times, almost using force. The boy was in the same manner kept without. Dr. Salander met him by accident, close by the gate, and laying hold of his hand he followed him in, before the people were aware. Those in the tents, however, very soon sent him out again. Upon inquiry, we find that this boy is the son of Oamo and Oboria, who are husband and wife, but have long ago been parted by mutual consent, which gives both leave to enjoy the pleasures of this life, without control from their former engagements. The girl, about sixteen, is intended for his wife, but he being not more than eight years old, they have not cohabited together. 1769, June 22. Our visitors returned early this morn. Oboria, Othiothea, Oamo, etc. The latter begins to show himself a very sensible man by the shrewd questions he asks about England, its manners and customs, etc. Much interest is made to procure the release of the boats. Indeed, 
Captain Cook is now tired of keeping them, as he finds that not the least motion is made towards returning any of the stolen goods. Four of them are therefore set at liberty. 1769, June 23. Our friends with us as usual. One of our seamen, a Portuguese, was last night missing. As there was no news of him this morning, we concluded that he was runaway and meant to stay among the Indians. Captain Cook therefore offered a hatchet to any man who would bring him back. One soon offered and returned with him at night. He said that two Indians seized him and stopping his mouth forced him away. But as he was out of the fort after a woman this account appeared improbable, the man was, however, not punished. 1769, June 24. Our friends all went to the westward last night. Nothing material happened during our solitude. The market has been totally stopped ever since the boats were seized, nothing being offered to sale but a few apples. Our friends, however, are liberal in presents, so that we make a shift to live without expending our bread, which, and spirits, are the most valuable articles to us. Late in the evening, Tuburai and Tamio returned from Ipare, bringing with them several presents, among the rest a large piece of thick cloth, which they desired that I should carry home to my sister, Opia, and for which they would take no kind of return. They are often very inquisitive about our families, and remember anything that is told to them very well. 1769, June 25. Prayers today, it being Sunday. Soon after, Potatau and Polo Thiara came to see us. 1769, June 26. At three o'clock this morn, Captain Cook and myself set out to the eastward in the pinnace, intending, if it was convenient, to go round the island, the weather calm and pleasant. We rode till eight, and then went ashore in a district called Ohiana, governed by a chief called Ahio, who favored us with his company to breakfast. Here we saw our old acquaintances, Titu Boalo, Huna, who carried me immediately to their house, near which was placed the body of the old woman, which was removed from Matavi on the 16th. End of section 14. Part 1 of June 1769. Section 15 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks, Journal from 25 August, 1768, to 12 July, 1771, by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 15. June, 1769, Part 2. 1769, June 26th, Continued. This, it seems, was the estate which descended to Huna by inheritance from her, and it was on that account necessary that she should be brought here. From hence we proceeded on foot, the boat attending within call, till we came to Ahedia, the place where the Spaniards were said to lay. We met with the chief, their friend Oreta, whose brother, Uturu, went with them. Our inquiries here were very particular, and we have the account I have before given. They showed us also the place where the ships lay, which is situate on the west side of the great bay under the shelter of a small island, called Buru, near which is another called Tawiri. The beach in the reef was here very large, but the shelter for ships indifferent. We saw also the place where their tents were pitched. They pointed out the hole in which each pole stood, and showed one corner in which they set up a cross I had made for them, and said Turu Turu, which in their language signifies the knees. In search upon this spot, I found a small piece of potsherd or tile, a sure proof, though a small one, that in place at least the Indians had not deceived me. Soon after this we took boat, and asked Titiburo to go with us. He refused and advised us not to go. On the other side of the bay, he said, lived people who were not subjects to Dutaha, and who would kill him and us. On seeing us put balls into our muskets, he, however, consented to go with us. We rode till dark, at which time we arrived at the bottom of the deep bay. We were not yet among our enemies we might go ashore and sleep with safety. We did so, but found very few houses. Here were, however, some double canoes, whose owners were known to us. They provided us with supper and lodgings, for my share of which I was indebted to Ura Taoa, a lady remarkable among us for the ceremony she performed on the 12th of May last. 1769, June 27. At daybreak we turned out to see a little of the country about us, which we did not arrive at last night till dark. We found the traces of canoes having been hauled inland, and the people told us that the island was in this place very narrow, and that they dragged their canoes quite across, chiefly over soft bogs. 
we now prepared to set out for the other kingdom, for so we are told it is, called Taerebu, and governed by Wahiatua, as ours was Oborionu, and governed by Dutaha. Titi Boalo is in better spirits now than yesterday. They will not kill us, he says, but they have got no meat. Indeed, we had not, since we came out, seen a bit of breadfruit. We thought that we might have exhausted it in this part of the island, but hoped to find plenty in the other, the people of which, if enemies, had certainly not traded with us. After a few miles rowing, we landed in a district called Anu'uhe, the name of the chief of which was Mara'itata, the burying place of men, and his father, Paha'iredo, the stealer of boats, names which did not a little confirm Titiboalu's relation. These gentlemen, however, notwithstanding their terrible titles, received us with all manner of civility, gave us provisions, and after some delay sold us a very large hog for a hatchet. We saw among the crowd only two people whose faces we knew, and not one bead or ornament which came out of our ship, though there were several European ones. In one of the houses lay two twelve-pound shot, one of which was marked with the English broad arrow. These, they said, had been given them by Tuutero, the Spanish commander. We now walked forward on foot till we came to the district which particularly belonged to Wahiatua. It was situate on the westernmost point of the large bay before mentioned, a large and most fertile flat. On it was a river so large that we were obliged to ferry over in a canoe and our Indian train to swim, which they did with as much facility as a pack of hounds taking the water much in the same manner. Here were no houses, but ruined remains of very large ones. We proceeded along shore, and found at last Wahiatua setting near some pretty canoe awnings, which seemed to be intended to furnish him with lodgings. He was a thin old man with very white hair and beard. With him was a well-looking woman of about twenty-five year old, whose name was Tudidi. We had heard her name mentioned very often, and by what the people told us, she was a woman of much consequence in this part of the island, answering in some measure to what Oboria is in the other. From this place, Tiare, son to Wahiatua, accompanied us, having sold us a hog. The country we went through was more cultivated than anything we have seen in the island. The brooks were everywhere banked into narrow channels with stone, and the very sea was confined by a wall of stone also. The houses were not very large or very numerous, but the large canoes which were hauled up everywhere along the shore almost innumerable. They were of a different build from those we have seen at Oborionu, longer and their heads and sterns higher. Upon these were kind of crutches, which we supposed were to support large images, many of which we saw hanging up in the houses. Their awnings were also supported on pillars. At almost every point was a morai, or burying place, and many within land. They were like those of Oborionu, raised into the form of the roof of a house, but these were cleaner and better kept, and also ornamented with many carved boards set upright, on the tops of which were various figures of birds and men. On one, particularly, a figure of a cock painted red and yellow in imitation of the feathers of that bird. In some of them were figures of men, standing on each other's heads, which they told me was the particular ornament of burying grounds. But fertile as this country was, we did not get or even see a single breadfruit. The trees were entirely bared. The people seemed to live entirely on ahi fagifera, which were plentiful here. After tiring ourselves with walking, we called up the boat, but both our Indians were missing. They had, it seems, stayed behind at Wahiatua's, depending upon a promise we had made to the old man of returning and sleeping with him, a promise we were often forced to make without any intention of performing it. Tiari and another went with us. We rowed till we came abreast of a small island called Tuarite, when it became dark and our Indians piloted us ashore to a place where they said that we might sleep. It was a deserted house, and near it was a very snug cove for the boat to lay so we wanted nothing but victuals, of which article we had met with very little since morning. I went into the woods. It was quite dark, so that neither people nor victuals could I find, except one house, where I was furnished with fire, a breadfruit, and a half, and a few ahis, with which, and a duck or two, and a few curlews, we were forced to sleep, which I did in the awning of a canoe that followed us belonging to Thierry. 1769, June 28. This morn at daybreak we rose and agreed to stay here an hour or two, in hopes to get some provision. Salt beef we had with us, but nothing of the bread kind, for that we depended on the natives, who had on all former occasions been both able and willing to supply us with any quantity of breadfruit. 
I went out meaning to go among the houses. In my way, I went through several burying grounds, Marai, on the pavements of which I saw several vertebrae and skulls of men, laying about as if no care was taken to bury them. In everything else they were quite like what we had seen before. In my excursion I could not procure the least supply of provision, so we were forced to set out in hopes of meeting some country where provision was less scarce. We walked, and the boat followed us. In about three miles we arrived at a place where were several large canoes, and a number of people with them. We were not a little surprised to find that these people were our intimate acquaintance, several at least, who we had often seen at the tents in other places, Towia, who we were told was brother to To Didi, Rudero, etc. Here we thought ourselves sure of getting a supply of provisions, and applied to our friends accordingly. They told us we should have some, if we would wait. We did, till we were out of patience. We then desired them to get us some coconuts, the kernel of which made a substitute for bread. They said yes, but nobody went up the trees. We were resolved to have them, at least so calling for a hatchet. We threatened to cut down the trees, if our demands were not complied with. Nobody objected to our doing so if we chose it, nor did anybody attempt to climb the trees to supply us. Just now, however, we luckily saw two men, busy in stripping a parcel of them. These we obliged to sell their stock, consisting of sixteen. With these we embarked, taking with us to a hoe, one of our Indians, who had returned to us last night, long after dark. When we in the boat talked over this behavior of our friends, we were inclined to believe that they were strangers here, and consequently had not the disposal of the provisions. Indeed, we never had before met with any difficulty in getting from them any provisions, of which they had enough. The reef here was irregular and the ground very foul, so that the boat was continually surrounded with breakers. We followed a canoe which led us to a passage, whereby waiting for a sledge of still water, we got out, though not without danger, for the sea broke quite across almost as soon as the boat was clear. We were now off the southwest end of the island. The land appeared very barren, no reef to shelter the coast, and the hills everywhere butting out to the sea without any flats. Here were, however, some houses and inhabitants, and on ledges of the hills here and there a little breadfruit, and higher up, large quantities of fae. This lasted for about a league when we saw again the reef and a flat on which we went ashore by the recommendation of our Indian guide, who told us that the country was rich and good. The name of this district, or Fenua, was Ahoy, the chief, Matiabo, soon came down to us. He seemed a total stranger both to us and our trade. His subjects brought down plenty of coconuts and about twenty breadfruits, which latter we bought at a very dear rate, while his majesty sold us a pig for a glass bottle, preferring that to anything we could give him. We saw here an English goose and a turkey cock, which they told us had been left by the dolphin, both of them immensely fat and as tame as possible, following the Indians everywhere, who seemed immensely fond of them. In a long house in this neighborhood I saw a sight quite new to me. Fifteen under jaw bones of men were fastened to a semicircular piece of board and hung up at one end of it. They appeared quite fresh, not one at all damaged, even by the loss of a tooth. I asked many questions about them, but the people would not attend at all to me, and either did not or would not understand either words or signs upon that subject. On our departure from hence, Matiabo desired leave to accompany us, which was granted. He proved a good pilot, but persuaded us to land often, five or six times in as many miles. In all these districts we saw nothing remarkable. The general face of the country was greener than on our side of the island, and the hills were covered with wood almost down to the water's edge, the flats in general small but fertile enough. At last we opened a large bay, which being opposite to as large a one on the other side, almost intersects the island at the place over which they drag their canoes. About two-thirds down this bay we resolved to lodge at a large house, which we saw, and which Mati Abo informed us belonged to a friend of his. From this place, many canoes came off to meet us, and in them some very handsome women, who by their behavior seemed to be sent out to entice us to come ashore, which we most readily did, and were received in a very friendly manner by Wivaru, who was chief of the district, which was called Owio Uru. He ordered his people to assist in dressing our provisions, of which we had now got a tolerable stock, about thirty breadfruit, some plantains, and fish, enough to last us two days. I stuck close to the women, hoping to get a snug lodging by that means, as I had often done. They were very kind, too much so, for they promised more than I asked, 
but when they saw that we were resolved to stay, they dropped off one by one, and at last left me jilted five or six times, and obliged to seek out for lodging myself. Supper was by this time ready, and repaired to that part of the house where Riveru was to eat it. He sent for his at the same time, and Matiabo supping with us, we made a very snug party. As soon as we had done, we began to think of sleeping and asked for a bed. We were shown a part of the house where we might lay. We then sent for our cloaks and began to prepare ourselves. Myself, as my constant custom, was by stripping myself and sending my clothes into the boat, covering myself only with a piece of Indian cloth, after their fashion, which I have done ever since I had my jacket, etc., stolen from Atahuru. Matiabo complained of cold, and a cloak was sent for him also. Captain Cook and myself agreed that he had behaved so well to us that there was not the least doubt of his honesty. We laid down. Matiabo did not come. I imagined that he was gone to wash as the Indians always do in the evening. I was almost asleep when an Indian who was a stranger to me came and told me that he was gone off with a cloak. I did not believe him but laid down again. Tuahau our Indian then came and confirmed the report. I then found that it was high time to give chase, so I leapt up and declared my case to the company, showing one of my pocket pistols, which I always kept with me. They took the alarm and began to walk off. I seized, however, the best-looking man I could see, and told him that if he did not find out where Matiabo was, I would shoot him in his stead. The threat had the desired effect. He offered to accompany me in the chase. The captain, myself, and him set out as hard as we could run, and in about ten minutes met a man bringing back the cloak. But our friend Matiabo was fled, and by that means escaped a severe thrashing, which we had agreed to be a proper reward for this breach of trust. When we returned, everybody was gone from the house. We quickly, however, made them sensible that our anger was entirely confined to Matiabo, and they all returned, Wiveru and his wife taking up their lodging within ten feet of us. 1769, June 29. About five o'clock our sentry awaked us with the alarming intelligence of the boat being missing. He had, he said, seen her about half an hour before at her grappling, which was about fifty yards from the shore, but that on hearing the noise of oars he looked out again and could see nothing of her. We started up and made all possible haste to the waterside. The morn was fine and starlit, but no boats in sight. Our situation was now sufficiently disagreeable. The Indians had probably attacked her first, and finding the people asleep easily carried her, in which case they would not fail to attack us very soon, who were four in number armed with one musket and cartouche box, and two pocket pistols, without a spare ball or charge of powder for them. In about a quarter of an hour, however, we had the satisfaction to see the boat return, which had drove from her grappling by some effect of the tide, probably as it was perfectly calm. As soon as the boat returned, we got our breakfast and set out. The first district on which we landed was the last in Tiaribo. It was governed by Omoe. He was employed in building a house for which purpose he wanted a hatchet very much, and was inclined to offer any price for it. But our stock was quite spent. After some conversation, we found that he would not deal for nails, and put off the boat. He and his wife, Juana Ouda, followed in a canoe. We took them into the boat, and after rowing about a league, they desired we would put them ashore, which we did, and found his people, who had brought a very large hog. We had much chaffering about the price of it. It was worth an axe we had in the ship, but we had no axe at all in the boat. We therefore told Omoe that if he could come to Matavi with his hog, we should have a large axe and a nail into the bargain for his trouble, which he, after consulting his wife readily, agreed to, and gave us a large piece of cloth as a pledge of his intention to perform this agreement. At this place we saw a singular curiosity, a figure of a man made of basket work, roughly, but not ill-designed. It was seven feet high and too bulky in proportion to its height. The whole was neatly covered with feathers, white to represent skin and black, to represent hair and tattoo. On the head were three protuberances, which we should have called horns, but the Indians called them Tataiti, little men. The image was called by the Mawe. They said it was the only one of the kind in Otahite, and readily attempted to explain its use, but their language was totally unintelligible, and seemed to refer to some customs to which we are perfect strangers. After this we got into the boat, and rowed several miles before we went ashore. When we did, we saw nothing remarkable but a burying ground, whose pavement was unusually neat. It was ornamented by a pyramid, about five feet high, covered entirely with the fruits of Pandanus, Tectorius, and Crata Eva, Gynandra. 
In the middle of all, near the pyramid, was a small image of stone very roughly worked, the first instance of carving in stone I have seen among these people. And this they seemed to value as it was covered from the weather with a kind of shed built purposely over it. Near it were three skulls of men laid in order, very white and clean, and quite perfect. From hence we proceeded to Papara, the district of our friends Oama and Oboria, where we proposed to sleep to-night. We came there an hour before night, and found that they were both from home. They were gone to Matavi to see us. This did not alter our resolution of sleeping here, and we chose for that purpose the house of Oboria, which though small was very neat, and had nobody in it but her father, who was very civil to us. After having settled our matters, we took a walk towards the point on which we had, from very far observed trees, of Itoa, Casuarina equisetifolia, from whence we judged that thereabouts should be some marae. Nor were we disappointed, for we no sooner arrived there than we were struck with the sight of a most enormous pile, certainly the masterpiece of Indian architecture in this island, so all the inhabitants allowed. Its size and workmanship almost exceeds belief. I shall set it down exactly. Its form was like that of Marais in general, resembling the roof of a house, not smooth at the sides but formed into eleven steps, each of these four feet in height, making in all forty-four feet, its length two sixty-seven, its breadth seventy-one. Each one of these steps were formed of one course of white coral stones, most neatly squared and polished. The rest were round pebbles, but these seemed to have been worked from their uniformity of size and roundness. Some of the coral stones were very large. One I measured was three and a half by two and a half feet. The foundation was of rock stones, likewise squared. One of these corner stones measured four feet seven inches by two feet four inches. The whole made a part of one side of a spacious area which was walled in with stone. The size of this, which seemed to be intended for a square, was 118 by 110 paces, which was entirely paved with flat paving stones. It is almost beyond belief that Indians could raise so large a structure without the assistance of iron tools to shape their stones or mortar to join them, which last appears almost essential as the most of them are round. It is done, though, and almost as firmly as a European workman would have done it, though in some things it seems to have failed. The steps, for instance, which range along its greatest length, are not straight. They bend downward in the middle, forming a small segment of a circle. Possibly the ground may have sunk a little under the greatest weight of such an immense pile, which, if it happened regularly, would have this effect. The labor of the work is prodigious. The quarry stones are but few, but they must have been brought by hand from some distance at least, as we saw no signs of quarry near it, though I looked carefully about me. The coral must have been fished from under water, where indeed it is most plentiful, but generally covered with three or four feet of water at least, and oftenest with much more. The labor of forming them, when got, must also have been at least as great as the getting them. They have not shown us any way by which they could square a stone, but by means of another, which must be most tedious and liable to many accidents by the breaking of tools. The stones are also polished, and as well and truly as stones of the kind could be, by the best workmen in Europe. In that particular they excel, owing to the great plenty of a sharp coral sand, which is admirably adapted to that purpose, and is found everywhere upon the seashore in this neighborhood. About one hundred yards to the west of this building was another court or paved area, in which were several ifatas, a kind of altars raised on wooden pillars about seven feet high. On these they offer meat of all kinds to the gods. We have seen large hogs offered, and here were the skulls of about fifty of them, besides those of dogs, which the priest who accompanied us assured us were only a small part of what had been here sacrificed. This morai and apparatus for sacrifice belonged, we were told, to Oboria and Oamo. The greatest pride of an inhabitant of Otahite is to have a grand morai. In this particular our friends far exceeded any one in the island, and in the dolphin's time the first of them exceeded every one else in riches and respect as much. The reason of the difference of her present appearance, from that I found by an accident, which I now relate. In going to and coming home from the Marai, our road lay by the seaside, and everywhere under our feet were numberless human bones, chiefly ribs and vertebrae. So singular a sight surprised me much. I inquired the reason, and was told that in the month called by them Owirahu, last, which answers to our December 1768, the people of Tiarebo 
made a descent here and killed a large number of people whose bones we now saw that upon this occasion oberia and oamo were obliged to fly for shelter to the mountains though the conquerors burnt all the houses which were very large and took away all the hogs etc that the turkey and goose which we saw with matiabo were part of the spoils as were the jawbones which we saw hung up in his house these they had carried away as trophies and are used by the indians here in exactly the same manner as north americans do scalps 1769 june 30 after having slept last night without the least interruption we proceeded forwards but during the whole day saw little or nothing worth observation we bought a little breadfruit which article has been equally scarce all round the island more so even than it is at matavi at night we came to atahuru the very place at which we were on the twenty eighth of may here we were among our intimate friends who expressed the pleasure they had in entertaining us by giving us a good supper and good beds in which we slept the better for being sure of reaching matavi to-morrow night at the farthest here we learned that the breadfruit a little of which we saw just sprouting upon the trees would not be fit to use in less than three months end of section fifteen part two june seventeen sixty nine Section 16 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August 1768 to 12 July 1771 by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 16. July 1769. Part 1. 1769. July 1. Proceed homewards without meeting anything new the country we passed by and over being the same as we had gone over on the twenty-eighth of last month. The day turned out rainy and bad, the only bad weather we have had since we left the ship, in which instance we are certainly fortunate that we had neither of us a change of clothes with us, so little did either of us expect to go round the island when we set out from Matavi. 1769, July 2. All our friends crowded this morn to see us, and tell us that they were rejoiced at our return nor were they empty-handed. Most of them brought something or other. The canoes were still in the river. Captain Cook, finding that there was no likelihood now of any of the stolen goods being restored, resolved to let them go as soon as he could. His friend, Po Tatao, solicited for one which was immediately granted, as it was imagined the favor was asked for some of his friends. But no sooner did he begin to move the boat than the real owners and a number of Indians opposed him, telling him and his people very clamorously that it did not belong to them. He answered that he had bought it of the captain and given a pig for it. But the people were by this declaration satisfied, and had we not luckily overheard it, he would have taken away this, and probably soon after have solicited for more. On being detected, he became so sulky and ashamed that for the rest of the day neither he nor his wife would open their mouths or look straight at any of us. 1769, July 3 this morn very early, Mr. Monkhouse and myself set out, resolving to follow the course of the valley down which our river comes, in order to see how far up it was inhabited, etc., etc. When we had got about two miles up it, we met several of our neighbors coming down, with loads of breadfruit upon their backs. We had often wondered from whence the small supplies of breadfruit we had came, as there was none to be seen upon the flats. But they soon explained the mystery, showing us breadfruit trees planted on the sides of the hills, and telling us at the same time that when the fruit in the flats failed, this became ready to use, which had been by them planted upon the hills to preserve the succession. The quantity was, they informed us, much less than was in the lowland, and not sufficient by any means to supply all the interval of scarcity. When this was exhausted, they must live upon ahi nuts, plantains, and vi, a wild plantain which grows very high up in the mountains. How the dolphins, who were here much about the same time, came to find so great plenty of breadfruit upon the trees, is to me a mystery, unless perhaps the seasons of this fruit alter. As for their having met with a much larger supply of hogs, fowls, etc., than we have done, I can most readily account for that, as we have found by constant experience that these people may be frightened into anything. They have often described to us the terror which the dolphins' guns put into them, and when we asked how many people were killed, they numbered names upon their fingers, some ten, some twenty, some thirty, and they say waro, waro, the same word as is used for a flock of birds or a shoal of fish. The journals also serve to confirm this opinion. 
quote, when, end quote, they say, quote, toward the latter end of our time provisions were scarce, a party of men were sent towards Epare to get hogs, etc., an office which they had not the smallest difficulty in performing, for the people as they went along the shore drove out their hogs to meet them, and would not allow them to pay for anything for them, end quote. We proceeded about four miles farther, and had houses pretty plentifully on each side of the river, the valley being all this way three or four hundred yards across. We were now shown a house, which we were told would be the last we should see. The master offered us coconuts, and we refreshed ourselves. Beyond this we went maybe six miles. It is difficult to guess distances, when roads are bad as this was, we being generally obliged to travel along the course of the river. We passed by several hollow places under stones, where they told us that people who were benighted slept. At length we arrived at a place where the river was banked on each side with steep rocks, and a cascade which fell from them made a pool so deep that the Indians said we could not go beyond it. They never did. Their business lay upon the rocks on each side of the plains, above which grew plenty of vi. The avenues to these were truly dreadful. The rocks were nearly perpendicular, one near one hundred feet in height, the face of it constantly wet and slippery, with the water of numberless springs. Directly up the face, even of this, was a road, or rather, a succession of long pieces of bark of hibiscus tiliaceus, which served them as a rope to take hold of and scramble up from ledge to ledge, though upon those very ledges none but a goat or an Indian could have stood. One of these ropes was near thirty feet in length. Our guides offered to help us up this pass, but rather recommended one lower down a few hundred yards, which was much less dangerous, though we did not choose to venture, as the site which was to reward our hazard was nothing but a grove of vi trees, which we had often seen before. In the whole course of this walk the rocks were almost constantly bare to the view, so that I had a most excellent opportunity of searching for any appearance of minerals, but saw not the smallest. The stones everywhere showed manifest signs of having been at some time or other burned. Indeed, I have not seen a specimen of stone yet in the island that has not the visible marks of fire upon it. Small pieces, indeed, of the hatchet stone may be without them, but I have pieces of the same species burned almost to a pumice. The very clay upon the hills gives manifest signs of fire. Possibly the island owes its origin to a volcano, which now no longer burns, or theoretically speaking, for the sake of those authors who balance this globe by a proper weight of continent, placed near about these latitudes, that so necessary continent may have been sunk by dreadful earthquakes and volcanoes, two or three hundred fathoms under the sea, the tops of the highest mountains only still remaining above water, in the shape of islands. An undoubted proof that such a thing now exists, to the great emolument of their theory, which, was it not for this proof, would have been already totally demolished by the course our ship made from Cape Horn to this island. 1769, June 4. Very little company today. I employed myself in planting a large quantity of the seeds of watermelons, oranges, lemons, limes, etc., which I had brought from Rio de Janeiro. They were planted on both sides of the fort, in as many varieties of soil as I could choose. I have very little doubt of the former, especially coming to perfection, as I have given away large quantities among the natives, and planted also in the woods. They now continually ask me for seeds, and have already showed me melon plants of their raising, which look perfectly well. The seeds that Captain Cook sowed have proved so bad that no one has come up except mustard. Even the cucumbers and melons have failed, owing probably to the method of their being packed, which was in small bottles, sealed down with rosin. 1769, June 5. This morn I saw the operation of tattooing the buttocks, performed upon a girl of about twelve years old. It proved, as I have always suspected, a most painful one. It was done with a large instrument, about two inches long, containing about thirty teeth. Every stroke of this, hundreds of which were made in a minute, drew blood. The patient bore this for about one quarter of an hour, with most stoical resolution. By that time, however, the pain began to operate too strongly to be peacefully endured. She began to complain and soon burst out into loud lamentations, and would fain have persuaded the operator to cease. She was, however, held down by two women, who sometimes scolded, sometimes beat, and at others coaxed her. I was sitting in the adjacent house with Tomia for an hour, all which time it lasted and was not finished when I went away, though very near. This was one side of her buttocks only, for the other had been done some time before. The arches upon the loins, upon which they value themselves, 
much were not yet done the doing of which they told caused more pain than ever i had seen about dinner-time many of our friends came oamo othiothia tuarua etc seventeen sixty nine june six we began now to prepare in earnest for our departure the sails were to-day carried on board and bent the guns were also taken on board our friends began now to believe that we are really preparing for our departure a circumstance which they have of late much doubted this evening we had a second visit from tiri deri and toimata the people again paying them the same respect as on the twenty first of june poor toimata was again balked in her desire of seeing the fort oamo insisting that she should not come in soon after these had left us some of our friends came to inform us that mona amia the man who had stole the quadrant was landed and meant this night to make an attempt upon us all were ready to assist us and several to ane mate especially very desirous of sleeping in the fort which probably was the reason why this arch thief did not this night exercise his abilities seventeen sixty nine july seven the carpenters were this morn employed in taking down the gates and palisades of our little fortification to make us firewood for the ship when one of the indians without made shift to steal the staple and hook of the great gate we were immediately apprised of the theft to the great affright of our visitors of whom the bell tent was full their fears were however presently quieted and i as usual set out on my ordinary occupation of thief catching the indians most readily joined me and away we set full cry much like a pack of foxhounds we ran and walked and walked and ran for i believe six miles with as little delay as possible when we learned that we had very early in the chase passed our game who was washing in a brook saw us coming and hid himself in the rushes we returned to the place and by some intelligence which some of our people had got found a scraper which had been stole from the ship and was hid in those very rushes with this we returned and soon after our return to borai brought the staple seventeen sixty nine june eight our friends with us as usual the fort more and more dismantled our friends seemed resolved to stay till we go though the greatest part of them are absolutely without victuals we have been for some days obliged to spare them every little assistance that we can and the best of them are most thankful for a single basket of apples notwithstanding this we had four small pigs brought to-day from oberia and polo theara seventeen sixty nine june nine our friends with us early in the morning as usual some i believe really sorry at the approach of our departure others desirous to make as much as they can of our stay several of the people were this evening out on liberty two foreign seamen were together and one had his knife stolen he attempted to recover it maybe roughly for the indians attacked him and wounded him grievously with a stone over his eye the other was also slightly wounded in the head the people who had done this immediately fled to the mountains two of our marines left the fort some time last night or this morn without leave their doing though at this time when our departure is so near makes us suspect them of an intention of staying among these people nothing however has been said about them to-day in hopes of their returning which they have not yet done seventeen sixty nine july ten we are told by the indians this morn that our people do not intend to return they are they say gone up into the mountains where our people cannot get at them and one is already married and become an inhabitant of otahite after some deliberation however to Animate, and patia undertook to carry our people to the place where they were they were known to have no arms so two were thought sufficient for the service a midshipman and a marine who set off without loss of time we were now quite ready for the sea so no time was to be lost in recovering the deserters the indians gave us but little hopes of our people bringing them back one certain method remained however in our power the seizing of some of their principal people and detaining them which was immediately resolved upon Oberia, Potatau, Polothiara, Tuburai, Tamio, Tuorua, Othiothia, and Tetuahitia, and Nuna were in the fort and were told that they would not be permitted to go from it till our people returned. At first they were not at all alarmed. They hardly believed us in earnest till they saw the pinnace come ashore and soon after go away to the westward. They immediately suspected what was the case that she had gone to fetch Dutaha. They were now alarmed but depending on our having used them well on all occasions showed but little signs of either discontent or fear but assured us that the people should be brought back 
as soon as possible. In the evening, Dutaha was brought on board. Lieutenant Hicks, who had been sent on the service, found him at Titaha, and easily took him, or rather stole him, from the people. Night came on. It was thought unsafe to let the prisoners remain in the fort, which was totally dismantled. Obaria, Potatau, and Tuborai were ordered to the ship. In going into the boat they expressed much fear, and shed many tears. The captain stayed on board with them. I slept ashore, and the rest of the prisoners in my tent. About eight, our Indians came back with the two deserters, but brought the disagreeable news of one of the people who had been sent after them being seized by the Indians, who declared that they would not release them till Dutaha had his liberty. The news was sent abroad, and a boat came off immediately for Nuna and Tuanimate. They were sent to the ship. A boat armed went immediately in search of the people, and in her the latter, and Tupaya, who was our voluntary prisoner. 1769, July 11. The night was tolerably well spent. The women cried a little at first, but were soon quieted by assurances that at all events they should not be hurt. At daybreak a large number of people gathered about the fort, many of them with weapons. We were entirely without defenses, so I made the best I could of it by going out among them. They were very civil, and showed much fear, as they have done of me upon all occasions, probably because I never showed the least of them but have upon all our quarrels gone immediately into the thickest of them. They told me that our people would soon return. Accordingly, about eight, they did, safe and sound. We saw them through our glasses go up the side, and immediately discharged our prisoners, making each such a present as we thought would please them, with which some were well content. The prisoners from the ship were by this time coming ashore. They were received with much joy by the multitude. I met them from the boat, but no sign of forgiveness could I see in their faces. They looked sulky and affronted. I walked with Oberia along the beach. Four hogs were soon offered me, two from her and as many from Dutaha. I refused them, however, positively, unless they would sell them, which they refused to do. The rest of the morning was employed in getting the tents aboard, which was done by dinner time, and we dined on board. The smaller bower had been got up, and the stalk found to be so much worm-eaten that we were obliged to make a new one. And as we have no hopes of the best bower being in better repair, it is probable that we shall not get to see this day or two. 1769, July 12. This morn Tupaya came on board. He had renewed his resolves of going with us to England, a circumstance which gives me much satisfaction. He is certainly a most proper man, well-born, chief Tahoa, or priest of this island, consequently skilled in the mysteries of their religion but what makes him much more than anything else desirable is his experience in the navigation of these people and knowledge of the islands and these seas. He has told us the names of above seventy, the most of which he has himself been at. The captain refuses to take him on his own account, in my opinion, sensibly enough. The government will never, in all human probability, take any notice of him. I, therefore, have resolved to take him. Thank heaven I have a sufficiency, and I do not know why, I may not keep him as a curiosity, as well as some of my neighbors do lions and tigers, at a larger expense than he will probably ever put me to. The amusement I shall have in his future conversation, and the benefit he will be of to this ship, as well as what he may be if another should be sent into these seas, will I think fully repay me. As soon as he had made his mind known, he said that he would go ashore, and return in the evening, when he would make a signal for a boat to be sent off for him. He took with him a miniature picture of mine to show his friends, and several little things to give them as parting presents. After dinner we went ashore to the Marae no Lutaha, of which I was desirous to have a drawing made, and had not yet done it. We no sooner landed than several of our friends, those who were not totally affronted at the imprisonment of the day before yesterday, came to meet us. We proceeded with them to Dutaha's house, where we met Oboria, etc., they were glad to see us, and a perfect reconciliation ensued, in consequence of which they promised to visit us tomorrow morning, to take their leave of us, as we told them that we should sail before noon. With them was Tupaya, who most willingly returned in the boat with us, aboard the ship, where he took up his lodgings for the first time. End of section 16, part 1 of July 1769. Section 17 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. 
journal from twenty five august seventeen sixty eight to twelve july seventeen seventy one by joseph banks this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gail timmerman vaughan section seventeen july seventeen sixty nine part two seventeen sixty nine july thirteen depart otahite about ten this morn sailed from otahite leaving our friends some of them at least i really believe personally sorry for our departure notwithstanding the confinement of the day before yesterday had frightened and affronted them as much as possible yet our nearest friends came on board at this critical time except only tuburai and tamio we had oburia otheothea taioa nuna tuana mate potatu polothera etc on board when the anchor was weighed they took their leaves tenderly enough not without plenty of tears, though entirely without the clamorous weeping made use of by the other Indians, several boats of whom were about the ship, shouting out their lamentations, as vying with each other, not who should cry most, but who should cry loudest, a custom we had often condemned in conversation with our particular friends, as savoring more of affected than real grief. Tupaya, who after all his struggles stood firm at the last in his resolution of accompanying us, parted with a few heartfelt tears so i judged them to have been by the efforts i saw him make to hide them he sent by otheathea his last present a shirt to potamai dutaha's favorite mistress he and i went then to the topmast head where we stood a long time waving to the canoes as they went off after which he came down and showed no further signs of seriousness or concern in the evening tethuroa in sight before night it appears clearly to be a very low island, and but small, which, with Tupaya's declaring that there were no fixed inhabitants upon it, only the people of Otahiti, who went there for a few days to fish, determined us to content ourselves with what we had seen, and stand on in search of Uriotia, which he described to be a well-peopled island as large as Otahite. 1769, July 14. Before noon today two islands are in sight, which Tupaya calls Huahene, and Ulhiatia, both of them make high and large. 1769, July 15. Calm all last night. This morn hazy, so that no land is seen. Light breezes and calm succeed each other all morn. Our Indian often prayed to Tane for a wind, and has often boasted to me of the success of his prayers, which I plainly saw he never began till he saw a breeze so near the ship that it generally reached her before his prayer was finished. At sunset, a pleasant breeze. Owahini and Ulhiatia, very plainly seen. 1769, July 16. This morn, we were very near the island. Some canoes very soon came off, but appeared very much frightened. One, however, came to us, bringing a chief and his wife, who, on to Pius assurances of friendship from us, came on board. They were like the Otahiti people in language, dress, tattoo, in short, in everything. Tupaya has always said that the people of this island and Uriatia will not steal, in which they indeed differ much from our late friends, if they only keep to their character. Soon after dinner, we came to an anchor in a very fine bay called by the natives Owala, and immediately went ashore. As soon as we landed, Tupaya squatted down on the ground, and ranging us on one side and the Indians on the other, began to pray. Our chief, who stood opposite to him, answering him in kind responses. This lasted about a quarter of an hour, in which time he sent at different intervals two handkerchiefs and some beads he had prepared for the purpose as presents to Iatua. These were sent among many messages, which passed backwards and forwards with plantains, malapoides, etc. In return for this present to the gods, which it seems was very acceptable, we had a hog given for our Iatua, which in this case will certainly be our bellies. 1769, July 17 went ashore this morn and walked up the hills. Found the productions here almost exactly similar to those of Otahite. Upon the hills the rocks and clay were burnt, if anything more than they were in that island. The people were also almost exactly like our late friends, but rather more stupid and lazy, in proof of which I need only say that we should have gone much higher up the hills than we did if we could have persuaded them to accompany us, whose only excuse was the fear of being killed by the fatigue. Their houses are very neat, and their boathouses particularly large. One of those I measured fifty long paces in length, ten broad, and twenty-four feet high. The Gothic arch of which it consisted 
was supported on one side by twenty-six, on the other by thirty, pillars, or rather clumsy thick posts, of about two feet high and one thick. Most of these were carved with heads of men, boys, or other devices, as the rough fancy and more rough workmanship of these stone hatchet furnished gentry suggested and executed. The flats were filled with very fine breadfruit trees and an infinite number of coconuts, upon which latter the inhabitants seemed to depend much more than those of Otahite. We saw, however, large spaces occupied by lagoons and salt swamps, upon which neither breadfruit nor coconuts would thrive. 1769, July 18. This morning, went to take a further view of a building, which we had seen yesterday and admired a good deal, taking with us to Paya's boy Tayeto, for himself was too much engaged with his friends to have time to accompany us. The boy told us that it was called Ehuare no Iatua, or the House of the God, but could not explain at all the use of it. It consisted of a chest whose lid was nicely sewed on, and thatched over very neatly with palm nut leaves. The whole was fixed upon two poles, by little arches of carved wood very neat. These poles seemed to be used in carrying it from place to place, though when we saw it, it was supported upon two posts. One end of the chest was open, with a round hole within a square one. This was yesterday stopped up with a piece of cloth, which, lest I should offend the people, I left untouched. But today the cloth, and probably the contents of the chest, were removed, as there was nothing at all in it. The trade today does not go on with any spirit. The people, when anything is offered, will not take it on their own judgment, but take the opinion of twenty or thirty people about them, which takes up much time. We, however, got eleven pigs. 1769, July 19. This morn trade rather better. Got three very large hogs and some pigs by producing hatchets, which had not been before given, and we hoped to have had no occasion for, in an island which had not before been seen by Europeans. In the afternoon go to sea. The island of Huahene differs scarce at all from that of Otahiti, either in its productions or in the customs of the people. In all our searches here, we have not found above ten or twelve new plants, a few insects indeed, and a species of scorpions, which we did not see at Otahiti. This island seems, however, this year, at least to be a month forwarder than the other, as the ripeness of the coconuts now full of kernel and the new breadfruit, some of which is fit to eat, fully evinces. Of the coconut kernels they make a food, which they call poi, by scraping them fine and mixing them with yams also scraped. These are put into a wooden trough and hot stones laid upon them, by which means a kind of oily hasty pudding is made, which our people relished very well, especially fried. The men here are large made and stout. One we measured was six foot three high and well made. The woman very fair, more so than at Otahite, though we saw none so handsome. Both sexes seemed to be less timid as well as less curious. The firing of a gun frightened them, but they did not fall down, as our Otahite friends at first generally did. On one of their people, being taken in the fact of stealing, and seized upon by the hare, they did not run away, but coming round inquired into the cause, and seemingly, at least, approving of the justice recommended, a beating for the offender, which was immediately put in practice. When they first came on board the ship, they seemed struck with a sight so new, and wondered at every thing that was shown to them, but did not seem to search and inquire for matters of curiosity, even so much as the Otahiti people did, though they had before seen almost everything we had to show them. 1769, July 20. At noon today come to an anchor at Ulhiatia, in a bay called by the natives Oapoa, the entrance of which is very near a small islet called Ohuatera. Some Indians soon came on board, expressing signs of fear. They were two canoes, each of which brought a woman. I suppose, as a mark of confidence, and a pig as a present. To each of these ladies was given a spike nail and some beads, with which they seemed much pleased. Tupaya, who has always expressed much fear of the men of Bolobola, says that they have conquered this island, and will tomorrow come down and fight with us. We therefore lose no time in going ashore, as we are to have today to ourselves. On landing, Tupaya repeated the ceremony of praying, as at Huahine after which an English jack was set up on shore and Captain Cook took possession of this and the other three islands in sight, viz. Huahine, Otaha, and Bolabola, for the use of his Britannic Majesty. After this we walked together to a great marae, called Tapo de Boatia, whatever that may signify. It is different from those of Otahiti, being no more than walls about eight feet high of coral stones, some of an immense size, 
filled up with smaller ones. The whole, ornamented with many planks, set upon their ends and carved their whole length. In the neighborhood of this we found the altar, or ihuata, upon which lay the last sacrifice, a hog of about eighty pounds weight, which had been put up there whole, and very nicely roasted. Here were also four or five ehuare no iatua, or godhouses, which were made to be carried on poles. One of these I examined by putting my hand into it. Within was a parcel, about five feet long and one thick, wrapped up in mats. These I tore with my fingers, till I came to a covering of mat, made of plaited coconut fibres, which it was impossible to get through, so I was obliged to desist, especially as what I had already done gave much offence to our new friends. From hence we went to an adjoining longhouse, where among several things, such as rolls of cloth, etc., was standing a model of a canoe, about three feet long, upon which were tied eight under jawbones of men. Dubaya told us that it was the custom of these islanders to cut off the jawbones of those who they had killed in war, these were, he said, the jawbones of Ulhiatia people, but how they came here, or why tied thus to a canoe, we could not understand. We were therefore contented to conjecture that they were placed there as a trophy won back from the men of Bola Bola, their mortal enemies. Night now came on apace, but Dr. Sullender and myself walked along the shore a little way, and saw an Ehuare no Iatua, the under part of which was lined with a row of jawbones, which we were also told were those of El Hiatua men. We saw also coconut trees, the stems of which were hung round with nuts, so that no part of them could be seen. These, we were told, were put there, that they might dry a little, and be prepared for making poi. We saw also a tree of ficus prolixa in great perfection, the trunk, or rather conjuries, of roots, of which was forty-two paces in circumference. 1769, July 21. Dr. Sullender and myself walked out this morn, and saw many large boathouses, like that described at Huahine page 303 and 401. On these the inhabitants were at work making and repairing the large canoes called by them pahi, at which business they worked with incredible cleverness, though their tools certainly were as bad as possible. I will first give the dimensions and description of one of their boats, and then their method of building, its extreme length from stem to stern, not reckoning the bending up of both those parts, 51 feet, breadth in the clear at the top forward, 14 inches. Midships, 18, aft, 15. In the bilge forward, 32 inches. Midships, 35, aft, 33. Depth midships, 3 feet 4. Height from the ground, she stood on, 3 foot 6. Her head raised, without the figure, 4 foot 4 from the ground. The figure, 11 inches. Her stern, 8 feet 9. The figure, 2 feet. Alongside of her was lashed another like her in all parts, but less in proportion, being only 33 feet in her extreme length. The form of these canoes is better to be expressed by a drawing than by any description. This and next may serve to give some idea of a section. AA is the first seam, BB the second, CC the third. The first stage or keel under AA is made of trees hollowed out like a trough, for which purpose they choose the longest trees they can get, so that two or three make the bottom of their largest boats, some of which are much larger than that described here, as I make a rule to describe everything of this kind from the common size. The next stage under BB is formed of straight plank, about four feet long and fifteen inches broad, and two inches thick. The next stage under CC is made like the bottom of trunks of trees hollowed into its bilging form. The last, or that above CC, is formed also out of trunks of trees, so that the moulding is of one piece with the plank. This work difficult as it would be to an European, with his iron tools, they perform, without iron, and with amazing dexterity. They hollow with their stone axes at least as fast as our carpenters could do, and dub those slowly with prodigious nicety. I have seen them take off the skin of an angular plank without missing a stroke, the skin itself scarce one sixteenth part of an inch in thickness. Boring the holes through which their sewing is to pass seems to be their greatest difficulty. Their tools are made of bones of men, generally the thin bone of the upper arm. These they grind very sharp, and fixed to a handle of wood, making the instrument serve the purpose of a gouge, by striking it with a mallet, made of a hard black wood, and with them would do as much work as with iron tools, was it not that the brittle edge of the tool is very liable to be broke. When they have prepared their planks, etc., the keel is laid on blocks, and the whole canoe put together, much in the same manner as we do a ship, the sides being supported by stanchions, 
and all the seams wedged together before the last sewing is put on, so that they become tolerably tight, considering that they are without caulking. With these boats they venture themselves out of sight of land. We saw several of them at Otahite, which had come from Ulhiatia, and Tupaya has told us that they go voyages of twenty days, whether true or false, I do not affirm. They keep them very carefully, under such boathouses as are described, one of which we measure today sixty yards by eleven. 1769, July 22. Weather worse than yesterday. In the course of last night it blew very fresh, this morn rainy. Walk out, but meet little worth observation. Saw a double pahi, such as that described yesterday, but much larger. She had upon her an awning supported by pillars which held the floor of it, four feet at least above the deck, or upper surface of the boat. Also a trough for making poi poi, or sour paste, carved out of a hard black stone, such as their hatchets are made of. It was two feet seven long and one foot four broad, very thick and substantial, and supported by four short feet, the whole neatly furnished and perfectly polished, though quite without ornaments. Today, as well as yesterday, every one of us who walked out saw many jawbones, fixed up in houses, as well as out of doors, a confirmation of their taking them instead of scalps. 1769, July 23. Weather mended a little. Dr. Solider and myself go upon the hills in hopes of finding new plants, but ill-rewarded. Return home at night, having seen nothing worth mentioning. 1769, July 24. Foul wind. The captain attempts to go out of the reef at another passage, situate between the two islets of Opururu and Tamo, the ship turning to the windward within the reef, in doing which she narrowly escapes going ashore. The quartermaster in the cabins called out two fathom. The ship drawing at least fourteen feet made it impossible that such a shoal should be under her keel. So either the man was mistaken or she went along the edge of a coral rock, many of which were here as steep as a wall. Soon after this he came to an anchor, and I went ashore, but saw nothing but a small marae ornamented with two sticks, about five feet long, each hung with jawbones as thick as possible, and one having a skull stuck on its top. 1769, July 25. This morn get to sea and turn to windward all day. Find that the two islands, Ulhiatia and Otaha, are enclosed by one reef. Tupaya says that there is a large passage through it, between them, and a harbour within it. Also another fronting a large bay on the easternmost end of Otaha. 1769, July 26. Foul wind continues last night. The ship has fallen much to leeward. Before night, however, we have gained our loss in something more as we discover a low highland ahead, which Tupaya tells us is called by the natives Tupi. He says that it is low without a harbour and yields nothing but coconuts and fish. 1769, July 27. Turn to leeward all night and all day again, so much that at night Tupi is not in sight. 1769, July 28. Wind still baffles us as much as ever. This morn hoisted out a boat and sent ashore on the island of Otaha, in which Dr. Solander and myself took a passage. We went through a large breach in the reef situate between two islands called Tohatu and Wenuaya, within which we found very spacious harbours, particularly in one bay, which was at least three miles deep. The inhabitants as usual, so that long before night we had purchased three hogs, twenty-one fowls, and as many yams and plantains as the boat could hold. Indeed, of these last, we might have had any quantity, a more useful refreshment they are to us, in my opinion, even than the pork. They have been for this week past boiled and served instead of bread. Every man in the ship is fond of them, and with us in the cabin they agree much better than the breadfruit did, which sometimes griped us. But what makes any refreshments of this kind the more acceptable is that our bread is at present so full of vermin that notwithstanding all possible care, I have sometimes had twenty at a time in my mouth, every one of which tasted as hot as mustard. The island itself seemed more barren than Ulhiatia, though much like it in produce, breadfruit being less plentiful than plantains and coconuts. The people perfectly the same, so much so that I did not observe one new custom or anything else among them worth mention. They were not very numerous, but flocked from all quarters to the boat, wherever she went bringing with them whatever they had to sell. Here as well as in the rest of the islands they paid us the same compliment they are used to pay to their own kings, uncovering their shoulders and lapping their garments round their breasts. Here particularly, 
they were so scrupulously observant of it that a man was sent with us who called out to every one he met telling him what we were and what he was to do seventeen sixty nine july twenty nine the wind last night has favoured us a little so that we were this morn close to the island of bola bola whose high craggy peak seems on this side at least totally inaccessible to men round it is a large quantity of low land which seems very barren tubaya tells us that between the shore and the mountain is a large salt lagoon a certain sign of barrenness in this climate he however tells us that there are upon the island plenty of hogs and fowls as well as the vegetables we have generally met with we see but few people on the shore tupaya tells us that they are gone to ulhiatia where we shall find them he says also that there is no breach in the reef on this side of the island but on the other there is one large enough for a ship to go in and a good harbour within it seventeen sixty nine july thirty this morn wind right on end see a new island called by tupaya morua he says it is fertile and yields plentifully all kinds of provision but that there is no breach in the reef large enough for the ship to go into seventeen sixty nine july thirty one still turning to windward with the wind right in our teeth towards evening however it mends and gives us hopes that we may to-morrow morn come to anchor in hohiatia tupaya to-day shows us a large breach in the reef of otaha through which the ship might conveniently pass into a large bay where he says there is good anchorage we have now a very good opinion of tupaya's pilotage especially since we observed him at huahine send a man to dive down to the heel of the ship's rudder this the man did several times and reported to him the depth of the water the ship drew after which he has never suffered her to go in less than five fathom water without being much alarmed end of section seventeen part two of july seventeen sixty nine section eighteen of the endeavour journal of sir joseph banks journal from twenty five august seventeen sixty eight to twelve july seventeen seventy one by joseph banks this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gail timmerman vaughan section eighteen august seventeen sixty nine seventeen sixty nine august one the wind right off the land of ulhiatia making it difficult to get in though we see a good inlet after turning to windward till afternoon we however at last got hold of anchorage in the mouth of it many canoes came immediately about the ship bringing all sorts of trade so that before night we have purchased several pigs and fowls and a large quantity of plantains and coconuts on attempting to warp the ship in this even the anchor was found to be fast in a rock at least no attempts could stir it till night when the tide which runs strong through the inlet turned the ship then going over the anchor tripped it herself seventeen sixty nine august two dr solander and myself have spent this day ashore and been very agreeably entertained by the reception we have met with from the people though we were not fortunate enough to meet with one new plant everybody seemed to fear and respect us but nobody to mistrust us in the smallest degree men women and children came crowding after us but no one showed us the least incivility on the contrary wherever there was dirt or water to pass over they strove who should carry us on their backs when we came to the houses of the principal people we were received with a form quite new to us the people who generally followed us rushed into them before us leaving however a lane sufficiently wide for us to pass when we came in we found them ranged on each side a long mat spread upon the ground at the farther end of which sat one or more very young women or children neatly dressed who without stirring expected us to come up to them and make them presents which we did with no small pleasure for prettier children or better dressed we had nowhere seen one of these tituas as they were called was about six years old her aho or gown was red and round her head was wound a large quantity of tamu plaited hair an ornament they value more than anything they have she sat at the farther end of a mat thirty feet long on which no one of the spectators presumed to set a foot notwithstanding the crowd leaning upon the arm of a well-looking well-dressed woman of about thirty possibly her nurse we walked up to her as soon as we approached she stretched out her hand to receive the beads we were to give but had she been a princess royal of england giving her hand to be kissed no instruction could have taught her to have done it with a better grace so much is untaught nature superior to art that i have seen no sight of the kind that has struck me half so much 
grateful possibly for the presents we had made to these girls. The people in our return tried every method to oblige us. Particularly in one house the master ordered one of his people to dance for our amusement, which he did thus. He put upon his head a large cylindrical basket, about four feet long and eight inches in diameter, on the front of which was fastened a facing of feathers, bending forwards at the top, and edged around with shark's teeth, and the tail feathers of tropic birds. With this on he danced, moving slowly, and often turning his head round, sometimes swiftly throwing the end of his headdress, or wow, so near the faces of the spectators as to make them start back, which was a joke that seldom failed of making everybody laugh, especially if it happened to one of us. We had also an opportunity of seeing the inside of the Ehuari no Iatua, so often mentioned. There were three of them much ornamented with jawbones, and very full of bundles lapped up with their cloth. These the people opened with some persuasion, and in them we found complete skulls, with their lower jawbones in the proper places. Perhaps these were the skulls of those of the victorious party who died in battle, and the jawbones fastened on the outside were those of the conquered. But for this conjecture I had no authority from the Indians, who seemed to avoid as much as possible any questions upon the subject. 1769, August 3. This day went along shore in the opposite direction to that we took yesterday, intending to spend most of our time in purchasing stock, which we have always found the people readier to part with at their houses and selling cheaper than at the market. In the course of our walk, we met a set of strolling dancers, called by the Indians Haiva, who detained us two hours, and during all that time entertained us highly indeed. They consisted of three drums, two women dancers, and six men. These two Paya tells us go round the island, as we have seen the little Haivas do at Otahite, but differ from those in that most of the people here are principal people, of which assertion we had in the case of one of the women an undoubtable proof. I shall first describe their dresses, and then their dances. The women had on their heads a quantity of tamu, or plaited hair, which was rolled, and between the interstices of it flowers of gardenia were stuck, making a headdress truly elegant. Their shoulders, arms, and breasts, as low as their arms, were bare. Below this they were covered with black cloth, and under each shoulder was placed a bunch of black feathers, as much as our ladies' nosegays or bouquets. On their hips rested a quantity of cloth, pleated very full, which reached almost up to their arms, and fell down below into long petticoats, reaching below their feet, which they managed with as much dexterity as our opera dancers could have done. These pleats were brown and white alternately, but the petticoats were all white. In this dress they advanced sideways, keeping excellent time to the drums, which beat brisk and loud. They soon began to shake their hips, giving the folds of cloth that lay upon them a very quick motion, which was continued during the whole dance. They sometimes standing, sometimes sitting, and sometimes resting on their knees and elbows, and generally moving their fingers with a quickness, scarce to be imagined. The chief entertainment of the spectators seemed, however, to arise from the lascivious motions they often made use of, which were highly so, more indeed than I shall attempt to describe. One of these girls had in her ear three pearls, one of them very large, but so foul, that it was worth scarcely anything. The other two were as large as a middling pea, and of a good and clear water, as well as shape. For these I offered at different times any price the owner would have, but she would not hear of parting with them. I offered once the price of four hawks down, and anything she would ask beside, but she would not hear of it. Indeed, they have always set a value upon their pearls, tolerably good, almost equal to our valuation, supposing them, as they always are, spoiled by the drilling. Between the dances of the women, for they sometimes rested, the men acted a kind of interlude in which they spoke as well as danced. We were not, however, sufficiently versed in their language to be able to give an account of the drama. 1769, August 4. We had often heard Tobias speak of lands belonging to him, which had been taken away by the Bola Bola men. These, he tells us now, are situate in the very bay where the ship lies. On going ashore this morning, the inhabitants confirmed what he has told us, and showed us several different huenuas, which they all acknowledged belong of right to him. The largest number of the people here are, it seems, the so much feared Bola Bola men, and we are told that tomorrow Opuni, the king of that island, will come to visit us. We are much inclined to receive him civilly, as we have met with so civil a reception from his subjects. Dr. Solander and myself go upon the hills, accompanied by several Indians, who carried us by excellent paths so high that we saw plainly the other side of the island and the passage through which the ship went out of the reef between the islets of Opororo and Tamu. 
Our walk did not turn out very profitably, as we found only two plants that we had not seen before. In coming down again, we saw the game that the Indians call Irohua, which is no more than pitching a kind of light lances headed with hard wood at a mark. Of this amusement, they seemed to be very fond, but none that we saw now excelled in doing it. Not above one in twelve striking the mark, which was the bowl of a plantain tree, about twenty yards distant. 1769, August 5. Went in the boat to the southward with the captain, etc. Saw two inlets in the reef and good harbors within them. They were both situate close to islets, one having one on each side of it. Indeed, in general, I have seen breaches in reefs almost wherever there are islands upon them. The people all along shore were very poor, so much so that after all our day's work, we did not procure either hog or fowl, nor indeed did we see either. 1769, August 6. Yesterday, Opuni, the king of Bolabola, sent his conts and a present of hogs and fowls to the king of the ship sending word also that he would in person wait upon him to-day. We therefore all hands stayed at home, in hopes of the honour of His Excellency's visit. We were disappointed in our expectations, not disagreeably, for instead of His Majesty came three handsome lively girls, who stayed with us the morning, and took off all regret for the want of His Majesty's company. In the evening we all went to see the great King and thank him for his civilities, particularly of this morning. The King of the Tatatoas, or clubmen, who have conquered this, and are the terror of all other islands, we expected to see young, lively, handsome, etc., etc. But how were we disappointed when we were led to an old, decrepit, half-blind man, who seemed to have scarce reason enough left to send hogs, much less gallantry enough to send ladies? 1769, August 7. We learned from Bopuni yesterday that his chief residence was at Otaha. To this place he proposed to accompany us. As today Captain Cook and Dr. Salander went upon the expedition, myself stayed at home. They proceeded with Opuni and all his train, many canoes, to a bay in Otaha, called Obuto Buto, His Majesty's chief residence. Here the houses were very large and good, and the canoes also finer than any the gentlemen had seen before. Such a prelude made them expect much from the owners of so fine houses. A boatload of hogs was the least they thought of, especially as they had plenty of Spartan money to pay for them. But alas, the gentlemen who fatigued themselves with building the houses chose to refresh themselves with eating the hogs, so that after the whole day was spent, a small number only were procured in proportion to what was expected. Myself stayed at home this morning and traded for some provisions and curiosities. In the morning took Mr. Parkinson to the Hiva, that he might sketch the dresses. The dancing was exactly the same as I had seen it before, except that another woman was added to the two I saw before. The interludes of the men were varied. They gave us five or six which resembled much the drama of the English stage dance. Most of my friends were constantly at the Hiva. Their names I set down and relationships, as they are chiefly one family. 1. Tiari no Hororo, a king or chief. 2. Fana Utoa, wife to one. 3. Otuboi, sister to two. 4. Orai, elder brother to two. 5. Tituanui, younger brother to two. Six, Otahamina, dancing girl. Seven, Urua Toa Do. Eight, Matiahia, father to one. Nine, Opipi, mother to one. 1769, August 8. Dr. Solander and self went along shore to gather plants, buy hogs, or anything else that might occur. We took our course towards the Haiva, and at last came up to it. It has gradually moved from very near us till it is now two leagues off. Tupaya tells us that it will, in this manner, move gradually round the island. Our friends received us, as is usual, with all manner of civility, dancing, and giving us, after the amusement, a very good dinner, as well as offering us a quantity of their cloth, by way of present, which we should have accepted had we not been full stocked with it before. We now understood a little more of the interludes than we had formerly done. I shall describe one as well as I can. The men dancers were divided into two parties, differing in the color of their clothes, one brown, the other white. The chief of the brown ones gave a basket of meat to the rest of his servants, that they might take care of it. The white represented thieves, who attempted to steal it several times, dancing all the time. Several different expedients they make use of without success, till at last they found the watchman asleep. They then gently went up to them, and lifting them off from the basket, 
which for security's sake they had placed in the middle of them, they went off with their prize. The others woke and danced, but seemed to show little regret for their loss, or indeed hardly to miss the basket at all. 1769, August 9. This morn spent in trading with the canoes, for whatever they would bring, resolving to sail as soon as they left off to bring provision, which about noon they did, and we again launched out into the ocean in search of what chance, and to Paya, might direct us to. 1769, August 10. Myself sick all day. 1769, August 11. Tupaya talks of an island which he calls Manua. He says that we shall see it tomorrow morning, but points out its place upon the weather bow, so we shall probably go to leeward of it. 1769, August 12. Get rid of seasickness today. Tupaya's island not in sight. He tells us that it is Itpa. We are past it. For the same word is used by them for the setting of the sun or the leaving behind of an island. He says, however, that tomorrow or next day we shall see another, which he calls Ojetera. 1769, August 13. At noon today, high land in sight, which proved to be Tupaya's island of Ojetera. At night we were close in with it. He said that there were many other islands from south to southwest of us, most of their names beginning with Ojete. None, however, were in sight. Many albacores have been about the ship all the evening. Dupaya took one, and had not his rod broke, would probably have taken many. He used an Indian fish hook made of mother of pearl, so that it served at the same time both for hook and bait. 1769, August 14. Close under the land, a boat was sent from the ship in which Dr. Solander and myself took a passage. She rowed right in for the land on which several natives appeared, armed with long lances. The boat standing along shore, not intending to land, till she got round the next point, made them, I believe, think that we were afraid of them. The main body of about sixty sat down upon the shore, and sent two of their number forwards, who, after walking some time abreast of us, leapt into the water, intending to swim to us, but were soon left behind. Two more then attempted the same thing, and were in like manner left behind. A single man then ran forwards, and taking good start of the boat, fetched her easily but when he was alongside, I could not persuade the officer of the boat to take him, notwithstanding it was so fair an opportunity of making friends with a people who certainly looked upon us as their enemies. He was therefore left behind, as was another who followed his example. We now came round a point where all our followers left us. We had opened a large bay at the bottom of which we saw another body of men, armed like the former. Here we hoped to land, and push towards the place. The natives had pushed off a canoe, which came out to meet us. As soon as it approached us, we lay upon our oars, and called to them that we were friends, and would give them nails if they would come to us. They, after very little hesitation, came up to the boat's stern, and took the nails that were given them, seemingly with great satisfaction, but in less than a minute seemed to have formed a design of boarding our boat and taking her, in pursuance of which three leapt almost in an instant into our boat and the others brought up the canoe, which had flown off a little, intending, probably, to follow their countrymen's example. The first who came in the boat was close to me. He instantly snatched my powder horn out of my pocket, which I immediately laid hold of, and wrenched out of his hand, not without some difficulty. I then laid my hand on his breast and attempted to shove him overboard, but he was too strong for me and kept his place. The officer ordered a musket to be fired over their heads, his own having misfired. Two were immediately fired, and they all instantly leapt into the water. One of our people, however, inconsiderately leveled a third at one of them, who was swimming, and the ball grazed his forehead, but I believe did him no material harm, as he recovered his boat and stood up in her, as active as ever. The canoe now stood for the shore, where were a large number of people collected, I believe two hundred. Our boat also pulled in, but found the land guarded all round with a shoal upon which the sea broke much so I was obliged to go along shore in hopes of finding a more convenient landing place. We saw the canoe go ashore, where the people were assembled, who came down to her seemingly very eager to inquire into our behavior to them. Soon after, a single man came along shore, armed with a long lance. He came abreast of the boat and then began to dance, and shake his weapon, calling out in a very shrill voice, which we understood from Dupaya was a defiance sent from the people. We rowed along shore, and he attended us some time. We found it, however, impracticable to land, and as for the gentleman's tricks, we gave ourselves very little concern about them. We therefore resolved to return to the bay, and try if it would be practicable to land where the canoe did, hoping that if we should not 
the people would at least come and make peace, either on the shore or in their canoes, of which we saw only two in the island, which was one more than Tupaya allowed them, who said they had but one. As we rode gently along shore, our defying champion was joined by another, likewise armed with a lance, and dressed with a large cap of tail feathers of tropic birds, and his body covered, as indeed many of them were, with stripes of different colored cloths, yellow, red, and brown. He, who we now called Harlequin, danced as the other had done, only with much more nimbleness and dexterity. These two were soon after joined by an older-looking man, likewise armed, who came gravely down to the beach, and hailing us asked from whence we came. Tupaya answered him from Otahite. The three then went peaceably along the shore, till the boat came to a shoal upon which a few people were collected. They talked together and soon after began to poora, or pray, very loud, to which Tupaya made his responses, but continued to tell us that they were not our friends. We, after this, entered into a parley with them, telling them that if they would lay by their arms, which were lances and clubs, we would come ashore and truck with them, for whatever they would bring. They agreed, but upon condition, that we should lay down our muskets, an article which we did not think fit to comply with, so our negotiation dropped for the present at least. After a little time, however, they took courage and came nearer to the boat, near enough to begin to trade, which they did very fairly for a small quantity of cloth and some of their weapons. But as they gave us no hopes of provisions or indeed anything else, unless we would venture through a narrow channel to the shore, we put off the boat and left them. In this expedition we labored under many disadvantages. We left the ship in a hurry, taking with us no kind of arms but our muskets, which without bayonets would have made but a poor resistance against these people's weapons, all meant to fight hand to hand. But what was worse of all was the difficulty of landing, which we could not do without wetting ourselves and arms, unless we had ventured through the passage I have spoke of, which was so small, that though the weather was perfectly fine, the sea often broke right across it. So that had we gone in, and the least surf rose, we could never have got out again, but must have remained the night in shoal water, liable to any stratagems that our enemies might devise. Ill-furnished as we were to oppose their boarding us by swimming, to which we were always liable. The island, to all appearance that we saw, was more barren than anything we have seen in these seas, the chief produce seeming to be a ta, with the wood of which their weapons were made. Indeed, everywhere along shore, where we saw plantations, they were covered by trees of this kind, planted between them and the sea. It is without a reef, and the ground in the bay we were in so foul and corally, that though a ship might come almost close to the shore, she could not possibly anchor. The water was clearer than I ever saw it. I saw distinctly the ground at twenty-five fathoms depth. The people seemed strong, lusty, and well-made, but were rather browner than those we have left behind. They were not tattooed on their backsides, but instead of that had black marks about as broad as my hand under their armpits, the sides of which were deeply indented. They also had circles of smaller ones round their arms and legs. Their dress was indeed most singular, as well as the cloth with which they were dressed, which I shall first describe. It was made of the same materials as the inhabitants of the other islands make use of, and generally dyed of a very bright and deep yellow. Upon this was, on some sorts, spread a composition which covered it like oil color or varnish. It was either red or of a dark lead color. Upon this again was painted stripes in many different patterns, with infinite regularity, much in the same way as some lute string silks in England are wove, all the straight lines upon them drawn with such accuracy that we were almost in doubt whether or not they were stamped on with some kind of press. The red cloth was painted in this manner with black, the lead colored with white. Of this cloth, generally the lead colored, they were on a short jacket that reached about their knees, made of one piece, with a hole through which they put their heads, the sides of which hole was contrary to anything I have seen before, stitched with long stitches. This was confined to their bodies by a piece of yellow cloth, which passed behind their necks and came across their breasts, in two broad stripes, crossing each other. It was then collected round their waist, in the form of a belt, under which was another of red cloth, so that the whole made a very gay and warlike appearance. Some had on their heads caps, as before described, made of the tails of tropic birds, but they did not become them so well as a piece of white or lead-colored cloth, which the most of them had wound on like a small turban. Their arms consisted of long lances, made of the etoa or hardwood, well polished and sharpened at one end. Of these there were some near twenty feet long, 
and scarce so thick as three fingers. They had also clubs or pikes of the same wood, about seven feet long, well polished and sharpened at one end into a broad point. How expert they may be in the use of these weapons we cannot tell, but the weapons themselves seem more intended for show than use. As the lance was not pointed with the stings of stingrays, and the clubs or pikes, which must do more execution by their weight than their sharpness, were not more than half so heavy as the smallest I have seen in the other islands. Defensive weapons I saw none. They, however, guarded themselves against such weapons as their own, by mats folded and laid upon their breasts and bellies, under their outer cloths. Of the few things we saw among these people, every one was ornamented, infinitely superior to anything we had before seen. Their cloth was better colored, as well as nicely painted. Their clubs were better cut and polished. The canoe which we saw, though a very small and very narrow one, was nevertheless carved and ornamented very highly. One thing particularly in her seemed to be calculated, rather for the ornaments of the thing, that was never intended to go into the water than a boat, which was two lines of small white feathers that were placed on the outside of the canoe, which were, when we saw them, totally wet with the water. After leaving these inhospitable people, we stood to the southward as usual, and had in the evening a great dew which wetted everything. See manners and customs of South Sea Islands below. 1769, August 15, crossed Tropic. Crossed the Tropic this morn. Wind north and weather very pleasant. At night, wind rather variable. 1769, August 16. Soon after we rose this morn, we were told that land was in sight. It proved to be a cloud, but at first sight was so like land that it deceived every man in the ship. Even Tupaya gave it a name. The ship bore down towards it, but in about three hours all hands were convinced that it was but a cloud. 1769, August 17. A heavy swell from the southwest all day, so we are not yet under the lee of the continent. In the even no wind. Our taros, roots of the yam, called in the West Indies cocos, failed us today. Many of them were rotten. They would probably have kept longer, had we had either time or opportunity of drying them well, but I believe that at the best they are very much inferior to either yams or potatoes for keeping. 1769, August 18. Southeast swell continues today, with little wind at north. 1769, August 19. Weather and swell much as yesterday. Some of our people tell me that they have seen albatrosses both yesterday and the day before. 1769, August 20. A large albatross about the ship most of the day. Little wind. The swell less than yesterday, but still troublesome. At night, a heavy dew. 1769, August 21. A fine breeze at northwest. Some pintado birds, Procellaria capensis, about the ship. This day our plantains failed us. They were all eat. Not one ever was rotten. Indeed, since we left Ulhiatia, the hogs have almost entirely subsisted upon them, of which we have no small number, who I fear will feel the loss of them most sensibly as not one, I believe, has yet eat the smallest portion of English food. 1769, August 22. Fresh breeze of wind today, but little sea. Several albatrosses and pintado birds about the ship today. 1769, August 23. Light breeze. Our hogs and fowls begin to die apace. Of the latter, a great many. Want of proper food and cold, which now begins to pinch even us, as I suppose the cause. Afternoon calm many albatrosses and pintado birds about the ship. 1769, August 24. The morning was calm. About nine it began to flow fresh with rain, which came on without the least warning. At the same time a water spout was seen to leeward. It appeared to me so inconsiderable that had I not been showed it, I should not have particularly noticed the appearance. It resembled a line of thick mist, as thick as a middling tree, which reached not in a straight line almost to the water's edge, and in a few minutes totally disappeared. Its distance, I suppose, made it appear so trifling, as the seamen judged it not less than two or three miles from us. Many birds about the ship, Pintado, Common, and Southern Albatross. 1769, August 25. Less wind today, but the swell occasioned by yesterday's wind, still troublesome. Birds today about the ship, Pintado, Common, and Southern Albatross, and a sheer water in size and shape like the Common, but gray or whitish on the head and back. It was this day a twelve-month since we left England, in consequence of which a piece of Cheshire cheese was taken from a locker where it had been reserved for this occasion, and a cask of porter tapped, which proved excellently good, so that we lived like Englishmen and drank the healths of our friends in England. 
1769, August 26. Few birds today, chiefly albatrosses, few pintados. In the evening, several grampuses about the ship. 1769, August 27. Pleasant breeze. Birds today as plentiful as ever. Albatrosses of both kinds, pintados and grey shear waters. Birds as yesterday. 1769, August 28. Birds as yesterday, with the addition of a kind of shear water, quite black. The same as was seen and shot on the 21st of March last in our passage to the westward. P. Atrata. Tupaya not well today. He complains of a pain in his stomach. His distemper probably proceeds from cold, of which we have for some days past, had more than from our latitude we should have expected. One of the seamen, Raiden by name, was this morn found so drunk that he had scarce any signs of life, and in about an hour he expired. Where he could have got his liquor is a mystery, which, however, nobody seems to inquire into. Probably not fairly. I have more than once had occasion to congratulate myself on my prudence in not taking wine on board at Madeira, as I believe I may safely say that there is not a cask on board the ship that has not been tapped to the great dissatisfaction of the owners, who in general have had the comfort to find the gentleman honest enough not to have filled up with salt water. In some cases, however, this was not a consideration of much comfort, as many of the casks were two-thirds empty, and some quite. 1769, August 29. Very moderate and pleasant. Scarce any motion. Few or no birds about the ship. In the course of last night a phenomenon was seen in the heavens, which Mr. Green says is either a comet or a nebulous. He does not know which. The seamen have observed it these three nights. 1769, August 30. Our comet is this morning acknowledged, and proves a very large one, but very faint. Tupaya, as soon as he saw it, declared that the people of Bulabula would upon the sight of it kill the people of Ulhiatia, who would, as many as could, fly into the mountains. More see today than yesterday heaving in from west-southwest. Several birds, pintados, albatrosses of both kinds. The little silver-backed bird, which we saw off Falkland Islands in Cape Horn, P. R. Velox, and grey shear water. Peter saw a green bird about the size of a dove, the colour makes us hope that it is a land bird. It took, however, not the least notice of the ship. Some seaweed was also seen to pass by the ship, but as it was a very small piece, our hopes are not very sanguine on that head. The thermometer today fifty-two, which pinches us much who are so lately come from a country where it was seldom less than eighty. A swell from southwest. 1769, August 31. Blows fresh this morn with a good deal of sea. About seven in the morn a heap of seaweed passed the ship. An immense quantity of birds are about her today, albatrosses of both kinds, which are easily distinguished, one from the other by their beaks, which in one is white and in the other black, also large black shearwaters, and a smaller sort with grey backs, pintados, but above all many millions, I may safely say, of the small bird mentioned yesterday, about as large as a dove, greyish on the back, some with dark coloured mark going in a crooked direction on that, and its wings. I tried today to catch some of these numerous attendants with a hook, but after the whole morning spent in the attempt, caught only one pintado, which proved to be Procellaria capensis of Linnaeus. End of section 18. August 1769. Section 19 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August 1768 to 12 July. 1771 by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 19. Manners and Customs of South Sea Islands, 1769. Appeared after 14 August, 1769. Part 1. We have now seen 17 islands in these seas, and been ashore upon five of the most principal ones. Of these, the language, manners, and customs, have agreed almost exactly. I should therefore be tempted to conclude that those of the islands we have not seen differ not material at least from them. The account I shall give of them is taken chiefly from Otahite, where I was well acquainted with their most interior policy, as I found them to be a people so free from deceit that I trusted myself among them almost as freely as I could do in my own country, sleeping continually in their houses in the woods, with not so much as a single companion." Whether or not I am right in judging their manners and customs, to be general throughout these seas, any one who gives himself the trouble of reading this journal through will be as good a judge as myself. All the islands I have seen are very populous, all along the sea coast, 
where are generally large flats covered with a vast many breadfruit and their coconut trees. Here are houses almost every fifty yards, with their little plantations of plantains, the tree that makes their cloth, etc. But the inland parts are totally uninhabited, except in the valleys, where are rivers, and even there are but a small proportion of people to what live upon the flats. They are of a larger size than Europeans, all excellently made, and some handsome, both men and women. The only bad feature they have is their noses, which are in general flat. But to balance this, their teeth are almost without exception even and white to perfection, and the eyes of the women especially are full of expression and fire. In color, they differ very much. Those of inferior rank who are obliged in the exercise of their professions, fishing especially, to be much exposed to the sun and air, are of a dark brown. The superiors, again, who spend most of their time in their houses, under shelter, are seldom browner, the women especially, than that kind of brunette which many in Europe prefer to the finest white and red. Complexion, indeed, they seldom have, though some I have seen show a blush very manifestly. This is perhaps owing to the thickness of their skins, but that fault is in my opinion well compensated by their infinite smoothness, much superior to anything I have met with in Europe. The men, as I have said before, are rather large. I have measured one six feet three and a half. The superior women are also large as Europeans, but the inferior sort generally small, some very small owing possibly to their early amours, which they are much more addicted to than their superiors. Their hair is almost universally black and rather coarse. This the women wear always, cropped short round their ears. The men, on the other hand, wear it in many various ways, sometimes cropping it short, sometimes letting it grow very long and tying it at the top of their heads, or letting it hang loose on their shoulders, etc. Their beards they also wear in many different fashions, always, however, plucking out a large part of them and keeping that that is left very clean and neat. Both sexes eradicate every hair from under their armpits, and they look upon it as a great mark of uncleanliness in us that we do not do the same. During our stay in these islands, I saw some not more than five or six, who were a total exception to all I have said before. They were whiter even than us, but of a dead color, like that of the nose of a white horse. Their eyes, hair, eyebrows, and beards were also white. They were universally short-sighted, and looked almost unwholesome. Their skins scurfy and scaly, and eyes often full of room. As they had no two of them any connections with one another, I conclude that the difference of color, etc., was totally accidental, and did not at all run in families. So much for their persons. I shall now mention their method of painting their bodies, or tattoo, as it is called in their language. This they do by inlaying the color of black under their skins, in such a manner as to be indelible. Everyone is marked thus in different parts of his body, according maybe to his humor, or different circumstances of his life. Some have ill-designed figures of men, birds, or dogs, but they more generally have this figure Z, either simply as the women are generally marked with it, on every joint of their fingers and toes, and often round the outside of their feet, or in different figures of it as square, circles, crescents, etc., which both sexes have on their arms and legs. In short, they have an infinite diversity of figures in which they place this mark, and some of them, we were told, had significations, but this we never learnt to our satisfaction. Their faces are in general left without any marks. I did not see more than one instance to the contrary. Some few old men had the greatest part of their bodies covered with large patches of black, which ended in deep indentations, like coarse imitations of flame. These, we were told, were not natives of Otahite, but came from a low island called Nuuora. Though they are so various in the application of the figures, I have mentioned that both the quantity and situation of them seems to depend entirely upon the humor of each individual. Yet all the islanders I have seen, except those of Ohitaroa, agree in having all their buttocks covered with a deep black. Over this most have arches drawn, one over another, as high as their short ribs, which are often one quarter of an inch broad, and neatly worked on their edges with indentations, etc. These arches are their great pride. Both men and women show them with great pleasure, whether as a beauty or a proof of their perseverance and resolution in bearing pain. I cannot tell. As the pain of doing this is almost intolerable, especially the arches upon the loins, which are so much more susceptible of pain than the fleshy buttocks. Their method of doing it I will now describe. The color they use is lamp black, which they prepare from the smoke of a kind of oily nuts, 
used by them instead of candles. This is kept in coconut shells and mixed with water occasionally for use. Their instruments for pricking this under the skin are made of bone or shell, flat. The lower part of this is cut into sharp teeth, from three to twenty, according to the purposes it is to be used for, and the upper fastened to a handle. These teeth are dipped into the black liquor, and then drove by sharp quick blows, struck upon the handle with a stick for that purpose, into the skin so deep that every stroke is followed by a small quantity of blood, or serum at least and the part so marked remains sore for many days before it heals. I saw this operation performed on the 5th of July on the buttocks of a girl about 14 years of age. For some time she bore it with great resolution, but afterwards began to complain, and in a little time grew so outrageous that all the threats and force her friends could use could hardly oblige her to endure it. I had occasion to remain in an adjoining house an hour at least after this operation began, and yet went away before it was finished, though this was the blacking of only one side of her buttocks, the other having been done some weeks before. It is done between the ages of fourteen and eighteen, and so essential it is that I have never seen one single person of years of maturity without it. What can be a sufficient inducement to suffer so much pain is difficult to say. Not one Indian, though I have asked hundreds, would ever give me the reason for it. Possibly superstition may have something to do with it, Nothing else, in my opinion, could be a sufficient cause for so apparently absurd a custom. As for the smaller marks on the fingers, arms, etc., they may be indented only for beauty. Our European ladies have found the convenience of patches, and something of that kind is more useful here, where the best complexions are much inferior to theirs, and yet whiteness is esteemed the first essential in beauty. They are certainly as cleanly a people as any under the sun, except in their lousiness. Every one of them wash their whole bodies in the running water as soon as they rise in the morn, at noon, and before they sleep at night. And if they have not such water near their houses as often happens, they will go a good way for it. As for the lice, had they the means only, they would certainly be free from them, as any inhabitants of so warm a climate could be. Those to whom combs were given proved this, for those who I was best acquainted with kept themselves very clear while we stayed by the use of them. As for their eating lice, it is a custom which none but children and those of the inferior people can be charged with. Their cloths also, as well as their persons, are kept almost without spot or stain. The superior people spend much of their time in repairing, dyeing, etc., the cloth, which seems to be a genteel amusement for the ladies here, as it is in Europe. Their clothes are either of a kind of cloth, made of the bark of a tree, or mats of several different sorts. Of all these, and their manner of making them, I shall speak in another place. Here I shall only mention their method of covering and adorning their persons, which is, of course, most various, as they never form dresses, or sew any two things together. It must be a piece of cloth, which is generally two yards wide, and eleven long, is sufficient clothing for any one, and this they put on in a thousand different ways, often very genteel. Their dress of form, however, is, in the women, a kind of petticoat, paro, wrapped round their hips, and reaching about the middle of their legs one, two, or three pieces of thick cloth, about two and a half yards long, and one wide, to buta, through a hole in the middle of which they put their heads, and suffer the sides of it to hang before and behind them, the open edges serving to give their arms liberty of moving. Round the ends of this, about as high as their waists, are tied two or three large pieces of thin cloth, and sometimes another or two thrown over their shoulders loosely, for the rich seem to show their greatest pride in wearing a large quantity of cloth. The dress of the men differs but little from this. Their bodies are rather more bare, and instead of the petticoat, they have a piece of cloth passed between their legs and round their waists, maro, which keeps up the strictest rules of decency, and at the same time gives them rather more liberty to use their limbs than the women's dress will allow. Thus much of the richer people, poor sort, have only a small allowance of cloth given them from the tribes or families to which they belong, and must use that to the best advantage. It is reckoned no shame for any part of the body to be exposed to view, except those which all mankind hide. It was no uncommon thing for the richest of the men to come to see us with a large quantity of cloth rolled round their loins, and all the rest of their bodies naked, though the cloth wrapped round them was sufficient to have clothed a dozen people. The women at sunset always bared their bodies down to the navel, which seemed to be a kind of easy undress to them as to our ladies to pull off any finery 
that has been used during the course of the day, and change it for a loose gown and capuchin. Both sexes shade their faces from the sun with little bonnets of coconut leaves, which they make occasionally in a very few minutes. Some have these made of fine matting, but that is less common. Of matting they have several sorts, some very fine, which is used in exactly the same manner as cloth for their dresses, chiefly in rainy weather, as their cloth will not bear the least wet. Ornaments they have very few. They are very fond of earrings, but wear them only in one ear. When we came, they had them of their own, made of shell, stone, berries, red peas, and some small pearls, which they wore three tied together. But our beads very quickly supplied their place. They are also very fond of flowers, especially of the Cape jasmine, of which they have great plenty planted near their houses. These they stick into the holes of their ears and into their hair, if they have enough of them, which is but seldom. The men wear feathers, often the tails of tropic birds, stuck upright in their hair. They have also a kind of wigs, made upon one string of the hair of men, dogs, or coconut strings, which they tie under their hair upon the backs of their heads. I have seen them also wear whimsical garlands made of a variety of flowers, stuck into a piece of the rind of plantain, or of scarlet peas, stuck upon a piece of wood with gum. But these are not common. Their great pride of dress seems to be centered almost in what they call tamu, which is human hair plaited, scarce thicker than common thread. Of this I may easily affirm that I have pieces above a mile in length worked upon an end without a single knot. I have seen five or six of such pieces wound round the head of one woman, the effect of which, if done with taste, was most becoming. Thus much of their common dresses. Their dancing dresses I have described in the island of Ulhiatia, and that of the Haiva I shall when I come to their morning ceremonies. They have also several more suited to particular ceremonies, which I had not the opportunity of seeing though I was very desirous, as the singular taste of those promised much novelty, at least if not something worth imitation, in whatever they take their pains with. I had almost forgot the oil with which they anoint their heads, Manoe it is called in their language, a custom more disagreeable to Europeans than any other among them. This is made of coconut oil in which some sweet woods or flowers are infused. The oil is most commonly very rancid, and consequently the wearers of it smell most disagreeably. At first we found it so, but very little use reconciled me, at least, very completely to it. These people are free from all smells of mortality, and surely rancid as their oil is, it must be preferred to the odoriferous perfume of toes and armpits, so frequent in Europe. The houses, or rather dwellings of these people, are admirably calculated for the continual warmth of their climate. They do not build them in villages or towns, but separate each from the other according to the size of the estate the owner of the house possesses. They are always in the woods, and no more ground is cleared away for each house than is just sufficient to hinder the dropping of the branches from rotting the thatch with which they are covered, so that you step from the house immediately under shade, and that the most beautiful imaginable. No country can boast such delightful walks as this. The whole plains where the people live are covered with groves of breadfruit and coconut trees, without underwood. These are intersected in all directions by paths, which go from one house to the other, so the whole country is a shade than which nothing can be more grateful in a climate where the sun has so powerful an influence. They are built without walls, so that the air cooled by the shade of the trees has free access in whatever direction it happens to blow. I shall describe one of the middle size, which will give you an idea of all the rest, as they differ scarce at all in fashion. Its length was twenty-four feet, breadth eleven, extreme height eight and a half, height of the eaves three and a half. It consisted of nothing more than a thatched roof, of the same form as in England, supported by three rows of posts or pillars, one on each side and one in the middle. The floor was covered some inches deep with soft hay, upon which here and there were laid mats for the convenience of setting down. This is almost the only furniture, as few houses have more than one stool which is the property of the master of the family, and constantly used by him, and most are entirely without. These houses serve them chiefly to sleep in, and make their cloths, etc. They generally eat in the open air under the shade of the next tree, if the weather is not rainy. The mats which serve them to set upon in the daytime are also their beds at night. The cloth which they wear in the day serves for covering, and a little wooden stool, blocks of wood, or a bundle of cloth for a pillow. Their order is generally this, 
Near the middle lay the master of the house and his wife, and with them the rest of the married people, next to them the unmarried women, next to them at some distance the unmarried men. The servants, tutus, as they are called, generally lay in the open air, or if it rains come just within shelter. Thus all privacy is banished, even from those actions which the decency of Europeans keep most secret. This, no doubt, is the reason why both sexes express the most indecent ideas in conversation, without the least emotion. In this their language is very copious, and they delight in such conversation beyond any other. Chastity, indeed, is but little valued, especially among the middling people. If a wife is found guilty of a breach of it, her only punishment is a beating from her husband. Notwithstanding this, some of the eres, or chiefs, are, I believe, perfectly virtuous. They, indeed, though they have no decency in conversation, have privacy. Most or all of them have small houses, which when they move are tied upon their canoes. These have walls made of coconut leaves, etc. In them they constantly sleep, man and wife, generally lifting them off from their canoes and placing them on the ground in any situation they think proper. Besides these, there are another kind of houses much larger. One in our neighborhood measured length 162 feet, breadth 28 and one half, height of one of the middle row of pillars 18. These we conjectured to be common to all the inhabitants of district, and raised and kept up by their joint labor. Of use may be for any meetings or consultations, for the reception of any visitants of consequence, etc. Such we have also seen used as dwelling houses by the very principal people some of them very much larger than this, which I have here described. In the article of food, these happy people may also be said to be exempt from the curse of our forefather. Scarcely can it be said that they earn their bread with the sweat of their brow, when their chiefest sustenance, breadfruit, is procured with no more trouble than that of climbing a tree and pulling it down. Not that the trees grow here spontaneously, but if a man should in the course of his lifetime plant ten such trees, which, if well done, might take the labor of an hour or thereabouts. He would as completely fulfill his duty to his own as well as future generations, as we natives of less temperate climates can do by toiling in the cold of winter to sow, and in the heat of summer to reap, the annual produce of our soil, which when once gathered into the barn must again be re-sowed and re-reaped as often as the colds of winter or the heats of summer return to make such labor disagreeable. O fortunati nimium sua si bona norent, may most truly be applied to these people. Benevolent nature has not only supplied them with necessaries, but with abundance of superfluities. The sea about them in the neighborhood of which they always live supplies them with a vast variety of fish, better than what is generally met with between the tropics, but these they get not without some trouble. Everyone desires to have them, and there is not enough for all though while we remained in these seas we saw, above species, more perhaps than our own island can boast of. I speak now only of what is more properly called fish, but almost everything which comes out of the sea is eat, and esteemed by these people, shellfish, lobsters, crabs, even sea insects, and what the seamen call blubbers of many kinds, conduce to their support. Some of the last, indeed, that are of a very tough nature, are prepared by suffering them to stink. Custom will make almost any meat palatable, and the women especially are very fond of this, though after they eat it, I confess, I was not extremely fond of their company. Besides the breadfruit, the earth almost spontaneously produces coconuts, bananas of thirteen sorts, the best I ever eat, plantains, but indifferent, a fruit not unlike an apple, which when ripe is very pleasant, sweet potatoes, yams, cocos, another kind of arum known in the East Indies by the name of arum, blank, a fruit known there by the name of ug malak, and reckoned most delicious. Sugar cane, which the inhabitants eat raw, a root of the salop kind called by the inhabitants pea, the root also of a plant called ethy, and a fruit in a pod, like a large hull of a kidney bean, which when roasted eats much like chestnuts, and is called ahi, besides a fruit of a tree which they call huara, in appearance like a pineapple, the fruit of a tree called by them nono, the roots and perhaps leaves of a fern, and the roots of a plant called thief, which four eat only by the poorer sort of people in times of scarcity. For tame animals they have hogs, fowls, and dogs, which latter we learned to eat from them, and few were there of the nicest of us but allowed that a South Sea dog was next to an English lamb. This indeed must be said in their favor, that they live entirely upon vegetables. Probably our dogs in England would not eat half as well. 
Their pork is certainly most excellent, though sometimes too fat. Their fowls are not a bit better, rather worse, maybe, than ours at home, often very tough. Though they seem to esteem flesh very highly yet, in all the islands, I have seen the quantity they have of it is very unequal to the number of their people. It is therefore seldom used among them. Even their most principal people have it not every day, or even week, though some of them had pigs that we saw quartered upon different estates as we send cocks to walks in England. When any of these kill a hog, it seems to be divided almost equally among all his dependents, himself taking little more than the rest. Vegetables are their chief food, and of these they eat a large quantity. Cookery seems to have been little studied here. They have only two methods of applying fire, broiling or baking, as we called it, which is done thus. A hole is dug in depth and size, according to what is to be prepared, seldom exceeding a foot in depth. In this a heap is made of wood and stones, alternately laid. Fire is then put to it, which by the time it has consumed the wood has heated the stone sufficiently, just enough to discolor anything which touches them. The heap is then divided. Half is left in the hole, the bottom of which is paved with them. On them any kind of provisions are laid, always neatly wrapped up in leaves. The hole is then covered with leaves, on which are laid the remaining hot stones, then leaves again, three or four inches thick, and over them any ashes, rubbish, or dirt that lays at hand. In this situation it remains about two hours, in which time I have seen a middling hog very well done. Indeed, I am of opinion that victuals dressed this way are more juicy, if not more equably done, than by any of our European methods. Large fish more especially. Breadfruit cooked in this manner becomes soft, and something like a boiled potato, though not quite so farinaceous as a good one, yet more so than the middling sort. Of this, two or three dishes are made by beating it with a stone pestle, till it make a paste, mixing water or coconut liquor with it, and adding ripe plantains, bananas, sour paste, etc. As I have mentioned sour paste, I will proceed to describe what it is. Breadfruit, by what I can find, remains in season only nine or ten of their thirteen months, so that a reserve of food must be made for those months when they are without it. To do this, the fruit is gathered when just upon the point of ripening, and laid in heaps where it undergoes a fermentation, and becomes disagreeably sweet. The core is then taken out, which is easily done, as a small pull at the stalk draws it out entire, and the rest of the fruit thrown into a hole dug for that purpose, generally in their houses, the sides and bottoms of which are neatly lined with grass. The hole is covered with leaves and heavy stones laid upon them. Here it undergoes a second fermentation and becomes sourish, in which condition it will keep, as they told me, many months. Custom has, I suppose, made this agreeable to their palates, though we disliked it extremely. We seldom saw them make a meal without some of it in some shape or another. As the whole making of this mahi, as they call it, depends upon fermentation, I suppose it does not always succeed. It is done at least always by the old women who make a kind of superstitious mystery of it. No one except the people employed by them is allowed to come even into that part of the house where it is. I myself spoiled a large heap of it only by inadvertently touching some leaves that lay upon it as I walked by the outside of the house where it was. The old directress of it told me that from that circumstance it most certainly would fail and immediately pulled it down before my face who did less regret the mischief I had done, as it gave me an opportunity of seeing the preparation, which perhaps I should not otherwise have been allowed to do. To this plain diet, prepared with so much simplicity, salt water is the universal sauce. Those who live at the greatest distance from the sea are never without, keeping it in large bamboos, set up against the sides of their houses. When they eat a coconut shell full of it always stands near to them, into which they dip every morsel, especially of fish, and often leave the whole soaking in it, drinking at intervals large sups out of it with their hands, so that a man may use one half a pint of it at a meal. They also have a sauce made of kernels of coconuts, fermented till they dissolve into a buttery paste, and beat up with salt water. The taste of this is very strong, and at first was to me most abominably nauseous. A very little use, however, reconciled me entirely to it, so much that I should almost prefer it to our sauces with fish." It is not common among them. Possibly it is thought ill-management among them to use coconuts so lavishly, or we were on the islands at the time when they were scarce ripe enough for this purpose. Small fish, they often eat raw and sometimes large ones. I myself, by being much with them, 
learnt to do the same in so much that I have made meals often of raw fish and breadfruit, by which I learnt that with my stomach at least it agreed as well as dressed, and if anything was still easier of digestion, howsoever contrary this may appear to the common opinion of the people at home. Drink they have none but water and coconut juice, nor do they seem to have any method of intoxication among them. Some there were who drank pretty freely of our liquors, and in a few instances became very drunk, but seemed far from pleased with their intoxication, the individuals afterwards shunning a repetition of it, instead of greedily desiring it, as most Indians are said to do. End of section 19